Chapter 35 Alex stopped to unzip and then pull his suit down to the waist. Turning slowly, he saw Kate lagging behind and staring up at the column-like trunk of some sort of huge fungi. She smiled and nodded, and he understood exactly what was captivating her. The place they were in was beautiful, wondrous, and also terrifying. Everything he saw was larger than it should be, or its alien shapes defied being compared to anything that existed on the surface. If someone invented a time machine, and they stepped out in one of the most prehistoric of ages, this is what it would be like. Alex remembered feeling exactly like Kate did now. He too had marveled at this world. But now the only enjoyment he could draw from his time in this subterranean hell was that it had given him the opportunity to first meet Amy. Everything else here was colored dark, as he knew that behind all the wonders lurked monsters, real monsters. He watched Kate smiling and nodding at some other thing she had found. She could be a pain in the ass, but he couldn't help liking her. Strong-willed, intelligent, resourceful, and with a sharp sense of humor. Exactly the attributes that had first drawn him to Amy. He looked up to the cave ceiling, hundreds of feet above them, thinking of her. At least this time you're safe at home, he thought. Looking back to his companion, he noticed that Kate had pulled her wetsuit back up, even though he guessed her body streamed with perspiration like his own. She turned to him and raised an eyebrow. That's some wetsuit. He looked down at his pulled-down suit. The tough-looking material was more than a wetsuit, but also had armor plating woven into its Kevlar fibers. But for all its protective characteristics, it was designed more to retain heat in a cold climate and wasn't ideal for 80-degree heat and humidity. She shook her head. It's a good look, Hercules, but I wouldn't take it off if I was you. Alex shrugged. I'm losing too much fluid through perspiration. Me too, but look. Kate pointed a gloved hand at the weird stump of a plant, then to the stem of another. The growths held spikes, bristles, or reaching tendrils. See the tips of these thorns? That glistening drop on each is probably venom. And given these things and humans have probably never met each other, I've got to assume that it's something we've never had to deal with. Alex grunted and looked at a stump that had four-inch thorns. Big defenses against big eaters. Big herbivores means big predators, Kate replied. You got that right. Alex pulled the suit back up. They walked in silence for many minutes, Kate stopping to investigate a frond here or something crawling in the bracken there. She jogged to catch up to him. Can you slow down a tad? My legs aren't as long as yours, you know. Alex glanced at her. No, sorry. You must try and keep up. Every minute we're down here increases our chances of being detected. He lifted his pace, making her need to trot now. Must be hard, huh? I mean on your loved ones, she said, slightly out of breath. Alex didn't turn. Yeah, hard. Have you any? I mean loved ones back home? Family-like? she asked. Alex stopped and turned. Kate almost crashed into him before taking a step back. He didn't know why, but the question angered him. Maybe it was because he wasn't sure himself. She held up a hand. Forget I asked. I get it. None of my business. It's okay. Alex turned back and continued. I just don't know the answer to that anymore. Yeah, me either. She skipped over a brackish puddle, trying to keep pace. Hey, you said something back there. She walked on, waiting, but when Alex ignored her, she went on. You said every minute we're down here increases our chances of being detected. 
I got the impression you didn't think that was a good thing. She increased her pace to be within one stride of him. Detected by who or what? Alex stopped so suddenly that Kate bounced off him. He spun to stop her falling, but also held up a hand to quiet her protests. He turned his head slowly. She waited, seconds stretching. He had a familiar sensation deep inside, like when you had tried to remember something but couldn't, and then hours later the answer just popped into your head. Except now what had suddenly manifested was his mind telling him that they weren't alone. What is it? she whispered. Someone, Alex said, concentrating. Kate followed his gaze, but probably saw and heard nothing. You heard something? Alex continued to stare. Is it the Chinese team? She breathed out the words. I don't know, but it feels different. Feels different? What does that mean? She looked up into his face. It's in the same direction as the signal, so maybe... He inhaled deeply through his nose. Not good. What? Come on, I'm right here. This is my field. I can help. She tugged at his arm. Alex looked down at her. There are things down here beyond anyone's field, things that have not been studied by anyone, any time. He looked at her. Her expression was a mix of annoyance and frustration. But perhaps we're the ones being studied. She blew air through her lips. Don't treat me like an idiot. Okay, I admit I was wrong back there. I've studied many prehistoric aquatic habitats and should have known better. But we should be safer now that we're well away from the water. That means nothing down here. Alex shook his head, taking a few steps. She folded her arms. You said every minute we're down here increases our chances of being found. You haven't explained that yet, and every second you don't explain it leaves me at a disadvantage. I know you're hiding something. Alex exhaled and turned. What exists down here are not things from some fossil room at the museum. These things are real. These are the things from legend. He had to trust her. He needed her judgment and expertise. Have you ever heard of the Kraken legend? Kate frowned. Psh, sure, who hasn't? The Norse legend of the many-armed beast from the depths, pulled ships under and all that. He nodded. When we first came, we had no idea what was really down here. Had no idea about this creature, the Kraken, or massive cephalopod anomaly, call it whatever you like. The bottom line is I lost a good team mainly because we underestimated our enemy. Enemy? This thing isn't a combatant. If there is something like that down here, it's just an animal working on instinct. He half smiled. It was working on instinct, all right, but it was far smarter than anyone suspected. And something else. He looked into her face. I got the feeling it enjoyed what it did. I could sense it. He stopped and scanned the dark blue jungle around them. Impossible, Kate said quickly. Why not? Killer whales, cats, some primates, they all take great delight in tormenting their prey prior to killing it. Amy, uh, a friend of mine told me how smart these things are. Normal cephalopods are only limited by their short lifespans. But this thing, this thing might be hundreds or even thousands of years old. Kate shook her head. Unlikely. Yeah, well, I thought we killed it. Alex shrugged. Maybe we did and maybe we didn't. And maybe there was more than one. He turned back to the jungle. It gave off an ammonia stink. His face was grim. 
and I can damn well smell it now. You can. Kate sniffed, and then stared off into the gloom for another moment. Hey, you know, thinking about it, there is some recent paleontological evidence that might be a precedent. A few years back, a researcher submitted some findings at a geological society meeting for evidence of the kraken, putting flesh on the bones of the legend, if you like. He had found some strange marks on the fossilized bones of another great creature of the time, called an ichthyosaur, a 45-foot sea dinosaur of the Triassic period. Kate tapped her chin as she seemed to pull the details from her memory. When they arranged the ichthyosaur vertebrae, they noticed an odd patterning on the bones. She stopped tapping and looked up. Sucker marks. The scoring on the bones of the dinosaur resembled the sucker marks that would have been left behind by the tentacle of a giant cephalopod, one that would have been over a hundred feet long. She tilted her head. But not everyone agreed with the report's findings. That researcher was more right than he knew, Alex said. Kate inhaled again, but shook her head. I smell nothing. But okay, I'll keep an open mind. Alex nodded, turning away. Just over the top of the plants, there was a cliff face that ended at the waterline, its base covered by a stand of what looked like huge straight trunks or columns. He looked down at his signal locator, and then back up at the cliffs where they met the water. The signal's coming from over there, he said. The cliffs? She got on her toes. Looks like it, but I think it's more than a cliff. I think it's a structure. As Kate watched, his expression clouded. Strange, he said. I can still sense something familiar. The kraken? Kate frowned. No. Some one. He tilted his head, trying to form an image, not believing what his instincts were telling him. Who? Kate crowded in closer to him. We have to move, fast. Alex started to jog. Chapter 36 Captain Wu Yang and his team had to cross the underground stream again and again. At times it was shallow, the water being of crystal clarity, but other times the stream bed fell away beneath their feet and they needed to paddle, the shadowy, impenetrable depths unknown, perhaps just over their heads, or many fathoms deep. In another hour they came to a broad, dark beach, and Captain Yang called a halt. Han Biao and Liu Yandong sat together, each pulling up rounded stones to perch on, as the black sand seemed to stick to anything metallic. Han Biao had scolded Liu for sipping water from the cave stream, admonishing him for his lack of caution, but the bigger man had just shrugged it off. Tastes fine and better to save what we have, Liu said. Who knows what will be around the bend? Han Biao grunted. Liu was right, but he would neither eat nor drink anything until Captain Yang allowed them to nibble on their rations. He felt the captain had it in for him already, and insubordination would be the last straw. Han Biao scratched at his arms, and Liu pointed. You have a rash on your neck. He reached up and touched his neck. It felt smooth, not painful, but he had a tingling itch. It was nothing compared to his arm, which crawled madly with the irritation. He could feel the lumps there. Must have been something in the water I'm allergic to. Itches, very bad. Urine, Liu said. My grandmother always said that if you have been stung by something to use your urine, pat on, let it dry. He shrugged. Han Biao nodded. It was a good idea, as they had little first aid with them, and he knew that urine had many medicinal properties. Maybe I will. 
He looked around. Okay. It was a home remedy, but right about now the insane itch made him ready to try anything. He got to his feet and wandered a few paces down the bank and then in towards the cave wall. Shadows swallowed him almost immediately as the men sat in groups around a few of the lit flashlights. The small dots were a comforting glow in the utter darkness. He grimaced. The tickling itch on his neck had turned to a crawling sensation, just like on his arm. And now the rest of his body decided it wanted to join in. Even his throat started to burn, and he had a strong desire to cough. A bad idea in the quiet of the caves. Yang would be furious if he made a commotion. Maybe he had caught a cold. What a time to get sick, he thought depressingly. Han Biao stepped further into the shadows and unbuckled his belt. He reached in for his penis, his cold hand shrinking him and needing a tug to pull it free of the zip. He sighed, feeling like crap. He was trained to ignore discomfort. Still, that didn't mean he and his comrade brothers didn't experience it. He started to urinate, and there came a strange sensation. It felt as if lumps were passing along the length of his penis. He reached one hand forward in a cup shape to capture some of the warm liquid in preparation for smearing it on himself in the places where he felt the insane tickling the most. He cupped a handful of urine and raised it to his shirt sleeve. There were already holes and rents in the tough fabric from the cave-in, so getting to his flesh was easy. He splashed it over the largest of his abrasions and then rubbed the liquid up and down in long strokes. It felt like there were grains of rice under his hand. Hi! The tickling on his skin was now amplified by a new sensation. His skin crawled both inside and out now. Han Biao looked quickly over his shoulder. Captain Yang sat with a small group. He had been most specific about there being no use of their lights, but his fear and curiosity was screaming. He would chance a quick look. He lifted the elbow-shaped light from his belt and snapped it on, pointing the beam into his cupped hand to both stifle the flare of the white light and also see what was in his hand. His mouth dropped open in confusion. He hurriedly changed the angle of his light, not caring now who saw his use of the precious batteries. Ack! His lips pulled back in revulsion. The remaining fluid in his hand was pink, tinged with blood. But this was not the main source of his concern. Within the cherry-colored liquid, there wriggled a mass of black, thread-like worms, each thrashing madly like sperm seeking an egg. There was a small scratch on the meat of his palm, and his eyes bulged as he saw that the worms were spearing what he assumed was their heads into the wound and then thrashing ever harder. Yee! He flicked his hand and then had a horrifying thought. He pulled at his shirt, craning to look at his shoulder where he had smeared the mass. The red, oily liquid was covering his body, the worms now coating his torso. What was worse was that the wounds on his arms and shoulders had far too many of the worms to have just come from his urine. They must have already been there, coming from inside. Han Biao felt the tickling now in his belly and even at the back of his mouth. He dropped his hand and turned to the group. Captain! He staggered forward, his arms out. Captain Young, in my wounds! They got into my wounds. The men were all on their feet in a second, guns now up and pointed, seeking an enemy or intruder to defend against. He staggered towards them. Captain, they're inside me. I can feel them. They're eating me. Yang strode quickly towards him, his face twisted in fury. Silence! He had a pistol in his hand, and with the other he held it up flat in front of Biao's face, halting him. With the barrel of his gun, he edged open Biao's shirt. His lips compressed. 
from the water. They got in my wounds, Han Biao said, not being able to help his words turning to a wail. Come quick, Yang said, and turned to walk further up the dark beach and away from the men. Han Biao staggered after him, feeling the insane itch from his ears to his anus. His limbs started to go numb, and suddenly his pants felt loose at his waist. His gut roiled, and he sobbed, grabbing hold of his belt to keep his pants up. He staggered after Yang, just focusing on the man's back. As his rapidly fear-fragmenting mind was beginning to leave him, he fell to his knees. Yang nodded, edging into an alcove. In here, I have something that will help. Han Biao walked forward on his knees. He felt a weakness in his limbs like he had never felt before in his life. He looked down at his pathetic frame, his clothes bagged on him, and holding up a hand he saw that he was nearly shriveled down to bone, but there was furious movement beneath his skin. The remaining meat was literally being eaten from within him right before his eyes. He looked up at his captain and into the muzzle of the gun. The black dot at the end of the barrel flared, and then there was nothing. Liu Yandong's eyes were wide as Captain Yang walked back to the group, holstering his sidearm. Infected, he said, and looked up at his men, arms hung loosely at his side. Is anyone else injured, sick? The men quickly checked themselves, murmuring. Liu did the same, but if he had any injuries, he would not dare share them with the captain. After a minute, the group professed themselves fit, and Yang grunted and went to turn away before stopping and quickly turning back. Or did anyone drink from the stream? Liu Yandong had been staring at the body of his friend, but the question snapped him back. He licked his lips and swallowed feeling a small tickle in his throat. He had some gnawing in his belly, but that was just from hunger. Besides, there was no way he was going to say anything. Yang turned to him. Liu Yandong, lead us out again. Rest time is over. Liu gave a rapid half-bow. Yo! And he jogged out ahead of the men, relieved to be away from Yang's penetrating stare. He gritted his teeth, trying not to look at the body of his colleague as he neared it. But from the corner of his eye he detected movement. Was his comrade still alive? He veered toward the cave wall for a better look. Sure enough, the body was moving. Maybe Yang's shot only wounded him. He wished he could use his light, as Biao now looked tiny, shrunken, lying on the dark sand. Liu slowed. There. There was movement. Han Biao's body jerked and jumped. But the activity was strange, boneless, and not how he would have expected a man to be if he was alive or even writhing in pain. Something wasn't right. Liu stopped walking and stared. He grimaced, his eyes going wide in horror. Han Biao's body suddenly collapsed in on itself, but the clothing was not quite empty. There was a rippling beneath the fabric, as though there were small animals fighting inside. Lai diu de sheng wu, he whispered. It was a line from an ancient story he read as a child. A village fell into a sinkhole, and the villagers had to descend to hell, where on the way demons tormented them, and cursed them with plagues of flies and beetles and worms. Liu momentarily crushed his eyes shut and turned away. He forged on, keeping his head down. That's where we really are, he thought, in hell. They all died in the cave-in, and now they were lost souls making their way down to the underworld. Chapter 37 Amy and Casey knelt at the rim of a hole in the cave floor. There was a warm breeze lifting from the impenetrably dark depths, 
that smelled of salt, moisture, and rotting vegetation. Amy lay down and closed her eyes, straining to hear anything that might indicate movement. After a moment, she sat back. There was nothing, and no hint of the acrid scent that usually heralded the stink of the creature's approach. It's a shoot. Amy got to one knee. And probably the quickest way down. Well, that's where the signal is coming from, so... Casey pulled out a glow stick, bent it, and let it drop. The flaring yellow stick sailed down into the darkness, bouncing a few times against rocky outcrops before disappearing around some sort of bend. Not too bad, and it's rough. Plenty of handholds. She stood and looked around the cave, pointing to a stalagmite rising from the cave floor. Going to have to tie off just the same. Hegel looked from the stalagmite to the hole. Means we'll use the rope up. No one to untie it. One-time deal. Open to alternate suggestions, Dawkins said from the rear. Yeah, like not use the rope, and we just scale down. He glanced at Amy, and then over his shoulder to the non-hawks, his eyes alighting on the slender Sung. You'll be fine. You know what? One of us falls and dies, no problem. Casey's eyes were level. One of us falls and breaks a leg, well now that's a disadvantage I don't want to have to deal with. Unless it's you. The scar on her cheek made it hard to tell whether her expression was just her permanent sneer or something more hopeful. Amy felt that Casey was digging in simply because she was pissed off. I don't need to tell you guys how to manage risk. We've each got rope, but no pitons, cams, or rope locks. So as far as climbing or caving is concerned, the rope is all we got. We need it, Amy said. Long way to go yet. Down and then hopefully back up. Okay, Casey grunted. We use the rope for non-climbers. I'll go first and secure the rope. Have a little look-see down there. She pointed to the huge form of Ranofsky. Rhino, you're last and on gear recovery. Got it, boss. Casey turned to Vince Blake. Tie off your rope, Lieutenant. Blake crossed to the stalagmite and looped his rope, carrying back the loops of soft cord and dropping it down into the hole. It only reached about two-thirds of the way. Good enough, Casey said. I'll go down this length and, if need be, use my own rope. Hopefully the rock will be broken up enough that we don't need it. Good luck, Amy said. The stocky hawk snorted. You bet. Break a leg, huh? She grinned, sneered at Amy, and then her eyes slid to Hagel. She winked. The man looked back at her, deadpan. Casey pushed her rifle up over her shoulder and then pulled a flashlight, its handle split in half and opened into a loop that she pulled over her forehead. She then looped the rope around her groin and ass, turned and stepped back, dropping down quickly, the rope zizzing between her gloved hands, one up and one down. The group crowded around the hole, watching as Casey hopped her way down. At about fifty feet, the rope slackened as she obviously had stepped onto something or reached the end of her rope. Her beam of light illuminated the cave as she continued down. After another few minutes, the light went out or disappeared around a bend. Seconds passed, a minute, then more. Amy got down on her belly again. Okay down there? They waited, silence. The rope stayed slack. Yo, boss! Rhino leaned out. A bobbing light far down appeared. All good, Casey's voice repeated ever softer in an echo. Plenty of ledges on the way down, coming back up. The rope began to jerk, and in another few moments Casey was hefting herself over the side of the hole. 
She sucked in a single deep breath and rolled her shoulders. Amy shook her head. That climb would have near totaled her, but the female hawk barely broke a sweat. Steep to begin with and no handholds, but then it breaks up and gets a lot rougher, lots of boulders and jutting edges, before it bends slightly and the angle eases off. More a scramble over loose debris then. Casey wiped her gloved hands together, dislodging some wet cave slime. It's damper and looks like it keeps going and going, all the way down. She grinned at Amy. Maybe to that underground sea of yours, huh? Casey stepped back from the edge and stared off into the tunnels behind the group for a moment. She snapped back. Okay, people, form up. Let's get this party started. Hank Ranovsky stood back and watched the team descend. Rhino kept one hand on the rope, just monitoring its tension. He continually turned his head, using his scope now to switch between thermal, night vision, and then back to light, intense, as he checked for anything above the grunts and heavy breathing of the team as they vanished into the chute. When it came his turn, Rhino hovered at the lip for a few moments, contemplating his own descent. First, he needed to untie and retrieve the rope. He laid his hand on the soft but extremely strong cord. From away in the darkness, there came a tiny sound from the cave they had just left. He paused, reaching up to switch his scope back to infrared and then thermal. There was nothing. Hey, little tattoo guy, that you? His voice was soft, but still carried in the dark silence. He squinted, trying to remember the word for hello that Blake had taught him. Nin hao? He waited, but there was nothing but a prickling sensation on the back of his neck. Nin hao? This time softer, and again he listened for a response. His hand went quickly to the rope. He knew he was skilled enough to climb down without it, and Franks wanted all the gear recovered. He picked up the knot and then froze. There was a wet sliding noise, and then a soft thumping, like something bouncing. He pulled his huge weapon from over his shoulder. Come on, you motherfucker, he thought, as he braced huge legs. The bouncing continued, and when it started to slow, it then sounded like it was being kicked along, sped up again to bounce some more. He waited, the grip on his gun so hard his knuckles were probably bone white under his armored gloves. From out of the dark cave they'd just exited came what he at first took to be a football. It ricocheted off the walls to bounce several more times, and then it rolled wetly to a stop. Big Hank Ranofsky stared open-mouthed. It was a human head, slightly flattened, and the stump of neck ragged. In the few seconds he stared, time seemed to elongate. He took in every detail, the blood, the Asian features twisted in horror and pain, and on one side of the neck a dragon tattoo, with the reds, greens, and yellows still flaring hotly beneath the blood. Little tattoo guy, that you? His mind yelled. Rhino snapped into action, raising his weapon and firing into the cave. His laser pulse cut into the dark, but hit nothing but stone. There was the smell of hot plasma in the air, and Rhino shut it off. He held his position. He could hear or see nothing, but every sense in his body screamed at him to run. Fuck this, I'm seeing things. He left the rope tied off and grabbed it, dropping down into the chute, jumping and bouncing down to the first landing fifty feet below. He quickly unhooked himself and spun, pointing his gun back up the pipe, using the barrel-mounted light to scan its edges. He stepped back a pace and was about to turn away when beside him... The rope wriggled, and then started to be pulled up. He watched it, 
his mouth open for a few more seconds. You've got to be shitting me. Rhino backed up, his gun ready. The massive hawk was scared of no man, but this, this was something far different. He turned, almost sprinting, as he retreated over the tumbled boulders to catch up to the group. Chapter 38 McMurdo Base, The Surface Sam Reed waited in the snow. It was heavier now, the wind having eased back so it fell in sheets, long curtains of white that piled up, obscuring much of the McMurdo base, and also turning the soft mounds into growing hills around him. Jack Hammerson had kept them up to date on the small boats that had arrived on the Antarctic shoreline, dispatched by the Kunming, to immediately berth a half-dozen high-speed snow skis that had powered furiously over the ice and snow towards them. A few miles out, they had stopped, and Sam knew what that meant. Their visitors had taken to foot. Stealth was their objective now, and therefore the attack was imminent. Sam stretched, growing bored. He flicked ice crystals from his face as he stood waiting, like a colossus in the snow. He was six feet eight inches tall and as wide as two men. He was by far the most powerful hawk in Jack Hammerson's arsenal, bar Alex Hunter. But Sam liked to think his strength and skill was natural, so that put him in front. He rolled massive shoulders, not feeling the bitter cold inside the advanced combat suit's military-grade exoskeleton. On Sam, the synaptic electronics were a molded framework that was built on and into his body. A metal bracing belt fit around his waist and comprised a power pack and supportive base for the banded ribbing up the back, with needle-like nodes pressed into his spinal cord, basically making the suit's mechanics part of his nervous system. The titanium hyperalloy composite exoskeleton framework was enhanced for full combat mode with molded ceramic armor plating that had a density nearly off the Mohs hardness scale. Sam the Hawk was now a mobile heavy weapon. His scanners beeped, letting him know that his visitors were now at the perimeter's line of snow mounds and were probably taking up flanking positions and readying their attack. He deployed the helmet shield, and a full-face mask telescoped up and over his face in an armadillo plating structure, just leaving a clear panel for vision. A digital readout above Sam's brow showed him the time they had left until the two navies were head-to-head. -head. Sixteen hours, twenty-one minutes, and forty-five seconds. Forty-four. Forty-three. Events were accelerating. He grinned ready. What would they make of him? A giant, made more giant by the suit. He turned slowly, switching to thermal. He could see the white-clad bodies flaring red, each easing forward, undoubtedly seeing him but unsure if he was really a man or not. He counted twelve, and detected lots of metal, lots of weapons. Sam spoke calmly. Targets acquired. Status? Ready all grids, came a soft reply. On my word. First, the olive branch, he thought. He held up one huge hand and switched to external speaker. This base is designated territory of the United States of America. You will not advance any further. He translated. Jegi Jidi Pe Jiding Melidan Herjongo Delingtu Nibuhoi Tichu Jenhe Jinibuda. Sam waited, but the men continued to edge towards him. Last chance, he thought. Go home, boys. The first few bullets that struck him came out of the snow line and were noiseless. Standard automatic rifles, each with a sound baffler, and each hit his chest with a dull thud 
that barely marked the armor plating of his suit. The next was something more, a high-velocity slug that hit his face dead center, compressing the armor and punching his head back. Sniper rifle, big caliber, M99 probably, Sam thought, and it fucking hurt. He felt blood on his lips, and he growled through gritted teeth. He roared into his mic, Take him down! Sam lifted his huge arm, and along the forearm a barrel was attached. He pointed at one of the three figures coming at him fast, and immediately a shotgun blast roared from the barrel. Boom after boom, the rubber-nosed slugs found the approaching PLA soldiers and kicked them off their feet. Without body armor, the big rubberized slugs would break bones or render even a big man unconscious. Three men went down, and the approaching soldiers immediately split their attack. Several more men looped rapidly towards Sam, zigzagging, and others peeled off left and right to try and enter the camp from behind him. Okay, three down, three more coming to party. That leaves six trying to gate crash from behind. Take them out, people. The snow moved, and hawks materialized close to the attacking soldiers. Even bigger and faster warriors suddenly confronted the PLA commandos. Very few shots were fired, as hand-to-hand -hand engagement was executed quickly and efficiently. Sam grunted and held his arms wide as the men sprinted at him. Handgun fire pelted into his torso. Finally, Sam moved, the suit's hydraulics moving his muscles at a blistering speed. First, he shot forward, faster than any normal man, to lower a shoulder and strike one of the white-clad PLA commandos square in the chest. The soft flesh and bone was no match for the two-legged truck that ran into him, and the man bounced away to lay still. Sam then spun, finding his next target, and flinging out an arm that caught a second man across the back, smashing him into snowdrift. The third and final soldier put his head down and sprinted hard, ignoring Sam and instead heading towards the line of snow-covered buildings of the McMurdo base. His head was tucked down, and his hands were working furiously on something clutched to his chest. Sam had a sinking feeling and exploded into action, running the man down, grabbing him and lifting him in the air. The man turned and screamed something, and Sam immediately saw the package in his hands. Numbers were already counting down, and he could see the soda can-sized cylinders of different colored fluids. It was a chemical incendiary device, and a large one. Bomb! he screamed, and like a hammer thrower, he began to spin with the man in one arm, and when he had enough centrifugal force, he released the PLA soldier. The ACS suit gave Sam's already phenomenal strength a super-powered boost, and the man was flung into the air to travel fifty feet up and over the rise, falling behind a large snowbank. Fire in the... The immediate explosion that erupted staggered the huge hawk, and even though he raised an arm and planted trunk-like legs, the hydraulic piston struggled to maintain his balance. Sam had crushed his eyes shut, and when he opened them, he was shocked to see that most of the snow around them had melted from the heat. Son of a bitch, he thought, imagining the devastation that it would have inflicted on the base's population. Sound off! His hawk team rose up among the sludge and debris, each counting off, most holding one or more PLA bodies, now looped at the wrists and ankles. In the closest McMurdo cabin, Sergeant Bill Monroe stood in a doorway, grinning and giving Sam a thumbs up. Sam nodded to him, and then sent an information squirt to Jack Hammerson. Storm passed. McMurdo is still ours. Acknowledged. There was no joy, surprise, or even satisfaction in Hammerson's voice. The older warrior was just moving his pieces on the board, and there were more moves yet to come. Proceed to next engagement. Over. On my way. Sam turned back to his team and circled a finger in the air. 
The Hawks began to drag their captors into the McMurdo camp. Sam turned back to the snowdrifts, smiling. Time to pay our Brit friends a little visit. The mountainous hawk, encased in the armored suit, began to plow through the snow to the Ellsworth base, picking up speed as he went. It was premature. General Bangwo's eyes followed Chung Wan Lin as the smaller man paced, his face near purple. Sending a PLA team to McMurdo was premature, obviously anticipated, and now neutralized. The minister stopped and spun, his eyes narrowed. At least I had the courage to act. He grinned, but it was more like a death's head grimace. It is true I am not a soldier. But are you? Banguo smiled and got slowly to his feet. The general was a veteran of border skirmishes and was a formidable man compared to the slight bureaucrat. Be careful you do not leave this room with your expensive teeth in your pocket, dear minister. He came slowly around his desk, his eyes drilling into Wan Lin. Wan Lin started to back towards the door. I will inform the general secretary. The general secretary has been fully briefed by me. Banguo kept the man pinned with his gaze. Your bullishness has forced us into a situation that neither we nor the Americans wish to find ourselves in. Banguo stood over Wan Lin. The cost of a war right now would break us. The cost of a war with America could annihilate us. The general pushed down an urge to beat the man senseless. He inhaled deeply and then let it out slow. But now, if we just turn around and go home, the loss of face in front of our greatest rival and competitor would be unthinkable. Wan Lin straightened slightly. We would never back down. No, no, we cannot. Thanks to you, we have the tiger by the tail and dare not let go. Bang Guo turned to walk to his window. The aircraft carrier will be there soon. He turned. Pray they blink before we do. Chapter 39 Comrade Liu Yandong continued to work his way along the dark riverbank. He silently prayed that there were no more crossings necessary, as he didn't think his nerves could bear it. The pressure, the darkness, and the lack of food, he hoped, were all making his stomach jump and twist. The cave stream had gotten wider, and in turn the shoreline had shrunk. In addition, the water appeared to be slowing. It could only mean one thing, an obstruction. Liu rounded the bend, and his shoulders slumped. It was as he suspected. The river cave ended with a wall of tumbled rocks, totally blocking any further progress. He moved his flashlight over the wall. Some of the boulders were no more than the size of a bread loaf, but others were car-sized. There was no army on earth that could shift them without moving equipment. He approached the stones and looked up. The barrier went all the way to the ceiling, not even leaving a gap at the top, and the rocks were slime-coated and in some places looked welded together from the countless ages they had rested upon one another. This was an ancient fall. He breathed out his frustration and waited, knowing that Captain Yang was a man who often shot the messenger. He grimaced as he felt his stomach roil again, and then felt the pain drop lower to force pressure on his bowels. He needed to shit. Now! Liu looked around quickly. The rest of the squad was still a few hundred feet back. He had time. There were a few small places close to the cave walls, and he strode into one, already loosening his belt. He dug a small hole in the dark sand, switched off his light, and squatted over it. There was no explosive gas, as he expected, but instead a thick stream that fell heavily to the sand. As well, there was little stink, 
more just an odor he had experienced once when he had been on his father's farm. His father had slaughtered a pig, and the air had filled with a hot, coppery, awful smell. His anus itched madly afterwards, and as he had no paper, he had no choice but to pull his pants back up, grimacing at the unpleasant wetness between his cheeks. He looked back down the cave, and only just made out the glow of the approaching group. They'd be around the bend soon. Liu tightened his belt, his gut feeling slightly better, and went to step away when a tiny sound caused him to pause. A sticky wetness, a movement like dying fish flip-flopping in a puddle. He turned back, knowing where the sound was coming from, and with a rising sense of fear he lifted his flashlight and flicked it on, pointing it down at where he had moved his bowels. Ah, oh, no, no, no! Liu backed up, feeling his stomach contents threaten to explode up and over his lips. The brown-red mush puddle was a mass of glossy black threads, some no thicker than hair, but others pencil-thick. The things were shiny, eyeless, but coiling and twisting, sliding through his feces as if searching for the warm flesh that they had just been expelled from. Yeah! He looked back down the cave tunnel and saw the outline of his squad now appearing. His first instinct was to tell his leader, Captain Yang, but he remembered how he had dealt with Han Biao. Infected, was all Yang said, treating the man like a dog and calmly putting a bullet in his brain. His throat tickled now, and the crawling coiled within him from the back of his nose and inner ears right down to feet. Infected, infected, infected! He made a soft mewling in his throat, knowing that he now had limited choices. Getting out was not his concern anymore, but all his life he had abided by a code of honor. He would not go out like a dog. He hated them then, the things inside him that had invaded his body and had won the battle without him even knowing there was a fight. Anger and frustration energized him. He wanted to kill them all and he would. He dropped his pack, quickly searching for the small tin of cooking kerosene. He found it, and then fumbled again in his kit, finding his second item. He straightened. Liu crushed his eyes shut, held an image of his parents standing there, waving, proud of him for attaining his rank in the special forces. No, he would not die like a dog. He would die like a true soldier. He held the image of his parents as he unscrewed the tin's lid and in a single motion brought it to his lips and drained the liquid. He grimaced as the scalding chemical made its way down his throat and into his belly, stripping the lining as it went. Before he lost his nerve, he opened his mouth, held the lighter to his lips, and spun the wheel. Stay back! Young held up a hand. His men stopped their forward rush immediately. All eyes were on the bucking body, flames shooting from the wide-open mouth and nose. The orange and blue tongues had leaked down over the neck and across the head, and the short-cropped hair of Liu Yandong had singed away, adding to the oily smoke rising to collect under the cave ceiling. Young walked forward alone his flashlight in one hand and revolver in the other. He saw the puddle of squirming excrement and also the frying worms that exited the dead man's mouth to curl up on the dark sand. He grunted and holstered his weapon. He clicked his fingers and pointed at two of his soldiers. Bury that. It will suffocate us if it burns much more. He half turned and then looked back. The men rushed forward to kick the black sand over the body, extinguishing the flames within a dark mound. Yang sauntered toward the cave wall of tumbled boulders, Liu Yandong already forgotten. He put his hands on his hips, surveying the blockage before turning. Professor! That man! 
Shen Zhong looked panicked. Those men, something infected them from the water. It must be avoided. And how do we do that? Fly across it? Yang's gaze turned quizzical. Are you sick? Huh? I am not, Shen Zhong replied, feeling his torso. Yang shrugged. No, you're not, and neither am I. Han Biao died because his wounds got infected. Liu because he drank from the stream when he was warned not to. Liu committed suicide. Horrible. Horrible? Yang exhaled evenly through his nose. No. Brave. He was a true PLA warrior in his soul. We never surrender. We fight on. Past fear, past pain, past all adversity. He half turned, raising his voice. Liu chose to fight his inner demons to the end. He raised a fist, lifting his voice. When we face adversity, when we come to a barrier, we do not tremble or wail. We show them that we are harder, stronger, even than stone. Yang had his fist still in the air and held his smile. In the darkest corners of his mind, he wondered if he became infected, whether he would end himself like Liu, or whether he would run screaming into the darkness. In that instant, he resolved that his men would never know. While he remained brave, or at least looked it, then they would hold together as well. A demonstration of his resolve, then. He looked from the men to the tumble of huge boulders, and then pointed. Blow it up! What? No! Shen Zhong Ching waved his hands. This is not a good idea. The blast could bring the entire cave down on us. There was silence as the soldiers' eyes slid from the scientist back to their captain. Yang stayed calm. And what would you have us do, Professor? Go back to where? Maybe wait here until we all have a belly full of worms? Or perhaps simply sit down here and wait until the wall erodes away by itself? He scoffed. There must be another way. The risks, Shen Zhong pleaded. Yes, the risks. There are always risks. And men like us are not afraid to face them, so men like you can sleep safe at night. He turned and clicked his fingers. Proceed. Yang started to walk quickly back down the dark cave. When he and Shen Zhong were a hundred paces back, he stopped and turned. His soldiers scrambled over the tumbled boulders, planting fragmentation grenades into crevices at a strategic position of the wall. They turned, waiting. Yang nodded, and the men danced from grenade to grenade, pulling the pins and then scrambling down, having mere seconds to try and get to safety. Yang backed everyone around the corner. The explosion was near deafening in the enclosed space, and the shockwave thumped past the men who were crowded in close to the wall of the tunnel. The monstrous echo was like a titanic drumbeat pulsing away down the cave. They waited, no one moving. Seconds passed, and the echoes had now fallen away to silence. Yang was first out, waving a hand in front of himself to try and dispel the floating rock dust. He coughed. There was the sound of rocks falling into water, but the air was so choked with dust that visibility was down to a few feet. Hold. Yang knew the dust would settle soon. He turned to the stream and lifted his flashlight. Through the gritty mist he could see its black, sinuous surface was no more like an oily sheet of glass, but was now moving and fast. He smiled. Open. I win, he thought. He was about to order the men forward when he paused. There was a creaking sound like the splintering of wooden boards. He stepped out, holding up his light. The air was clearing, but he still couldn't make out the end of the tunnel. He turned, sighted on one of his men, 
and then motioned with his head. Go and look. The young soldier nodded once and sprinted forward. He was soon swallowed in the foggy dust. Yang waited. Clear, the voice floated back. More tunnel, sir. Yang looked at Shen Jung, feeling both relieved and vindicated. The professor was frowning as he looked at the stream. The water sizzled, popped, and jumped, and he stared hard at its surface. At first he assumed it was something underneath pushing upwards, but the more the air cleared, the more he saw that instead it was something dropping down from above. He lifted his flashlight beam to the ceiling of the cave, a dark crack had opened, no, was still opening, and unzipping down the length of the tunnel. Shen Jung pointed at the ceiling, and Yang screamed a single word, Run! He turned and sprinted towards the newly cleared cave end, with Shen Jung and his men following him instantly. They clambered over the broken stones, and the water now free jumped and swirled as it kept pace with them. There came a huge splash from behind them, and some of his men yelled with fear. Yang didn't turn, knowing it was probably a rock falling from the ceiling. There came more pounding splashes, then the roar of a giant, and the sound of boiling, rushing liquid. Yang leapt over another boulder, sprinting hard. There must have been another cave stream directly over this one. The explosion had ruptured its bottom, and the streams were about to merge, right on top of them. He put his head down and ran harder. The growing roar was a living thing that shook the cave around them. The water was an oncoming train, and its speed was about the same. They never had any hope of outrunning it. Seconds later, Yang and his men were like rats in a drain, snatched up and flushed away in the current. They tumbled down a dark pipe towards a destination that was out of their control. The water boiled around Yang, pummeling him, throwing him from cave wall to ceiling and then to floor. He tried to keep his eyes and mouth jammed tight, praying that none of the horrifying worms would find their way inside him. In the inky black water, he struck another body, hard. He went to snatch at it, but it was already gone, and in the next instant a massive surge threw him so violently into a cave wall that he was momentarily stunned. His lungs were going into spasms, and involuntarily he opened his mouth wide to drag in a huge breath of air, but instead the gritty coldness that surged down his throat and into his lungs brought him back instantly. He screamed out the last air in his lungs and spewed the bile in his gut along with the water. The next thing he knew, he was falling through space. Falling. Falling. It is over, he thought, just before the impact. Chapter 40 The thumping explosion was felt milliseconds before it was heard. Grenades, Casey thought, reacting first, yelling out to her team and diving. She took Amy and Sung with her as she crashed to the wall of the cave chute they were descending in. Dust and debris rained down on them as the shockwaves pulsed through the stone and then raced past them. They stayed down, hugging the rock for a second or two more, before Casey lifted her head. Give me a source, big guy. She spat and blinked away grit, and then shined her light up at the ceiling. Rinofsky held up the scanner, first one way and then the next. Speed of the tremor wave and echo duration gives us a source of about two clicks southeast, with a downward inclination of 25 degrees. Rhino pointed. Down and that way. He looked at Casey. Got to be our Chinese friends. Casey stood slowly. Looks like they decided to clear some blockage, huh? Great idea under freaking miles of stone. Dawkins coughed and wiped his mouth, spitting and grinning, and displaying his chipped tooth again. He got to his feet. 
Maybe they ran into something they could only fight with explosives. Well, Casey said, and dragged Soong to her feet. Whatever it was, I wonder if they achieved little more than a free burial. She must have noticed Soong's disapproving expression and shrugged. Ah, whatever. Amy dragged a sleeve across her eyes. We're probably moving parallel to them. Maybe we can intersect if we find a conjoining tunnel, provided they made it through. Casey held her flashlight in the air. Interesting, look. She nudged Amy. The dust. It's moving. Amy watched the floating specks within her own beam. The tiny motes should have been settling straight down to the cave floor, but instead they gently floated towards the dark end of the cave tunnel. Air movement, Amy said. Gotta be a good thing, right? Casey's brows were up. Better than the dead end, boss, Bernofsky said, smacking Hegel on the shoulder and raising a puff of chalky dust. Got that right. Let's move him out. Casey turned to Hegel. Lieutenant, take point, fifty paces out. Hegel hesitated for a moment and then spun and jogged off into the dark. Amy grimaced. We shouldn't split up. Casey half grinned. Nah, he enjoys his own company. They eased around through a narrowing in the cave, and Amy saw the glow from Hegel's light. The man stood silently, pointing his beam to the floor. He lifted an arm and pointed to their flashlights. I don't think you'll need those anymore. He switched his own off and then stood aside, holding out an arm and half bowing, like a maitre d' showing guests to their table. Casey kept her light on and moved past the young hawk. Holy fucking hell! She immediately pushed her gun up over her shoulder and stood with hands on her hips, grinning. It's all true. Their cave ended, and they found themselves high up on a cliff wall. The hint of light that Hegel had first seen gradually turned to a twilight blue from the ceiling, a ceiling that traveled away for as far as their eyes could make out. Glowworms, Amy said. Permanent twilight, but be careful with loud noises or they shut down. Renofsky snorted elbowing Ben Jackson in the ribs. I didn't believe it could be real. I mean, I read it, but never thought... He shook his head. It's so goddamned huge. This ain't no cave, he grinned. It's a world. A world beneath the world, Jackson said softly. Amy pointed. That's the sea in the distance. Before the colossal cave curved away with its own horizon dipping from view, there was the glint on a flat surface that hinted at water. Amy stepped forward to peer over the edge. We weren't here before. I don't remember there being a jungle. We never traveled over the other side of the sea. I guess this is what was over there. Well, it sure wasn't in Hunter's report, Hegel said sourly. Casey used a scope to look out over the landscape. Nothing on visual. Blake, where's our signal source? Blake read from his scanner. Got it, loud and clear. Five miles due east. He looked up and frowned. But that would put it near the water at that far rock face, or maybe in the rock face. Casey exhaled through compressed lips. Must be on the shoreline, then, still hidden. She turned. What, you thought it was going to be easy? She lifted her scope again, moving it over the jungle. If our Chinese friends survived, I'm betting that's where they're going to end up. Renofsky also waved a small box over the edge. Hoo-wee! I've got so many life signs, I might as well be pointing this at the San Diego Zoo. Great. Casey turned to Amy. Good to be home? Amy shook her head, 
Her eyes focused on the water in the distance. Casey leaned out over the edge and then whistled. That is one hell of a long way down. Hegel stood beside her, also leaning out. Stuck up on a cliff wall. Franks looked up. Make that in a cliff wall. They were about half the way up the sheer wall of granite, with about a thousand feet to the jungle below. Further along the wall, waterfalls fell slowly, most turning to mist before they ever struck the ground. Some had huge torrents pouring out and turning into rivers that wound their way towards the sea in the distance. Grab my belt. Franks began to lean out even further, and Hegel hung on so she could gain an extra few feet. Amy watched as Hegel's lips curled just a fraction and saw Ranofsky look hard at him from under lowered brows. Okay, Casey said, and Hegel pulled her back. Going to be tough, but doable. She walked a few feet into the cave mouth and into the center of the group. This wall is Swiss cheese. It's riddled with holes and caves. It's a sheer cliff, but with all the pockmarks in it, I reckon we can lower someone down to the next cave. Some places we can scale down. She bobbed her head. I'm sure we can ease the non-climbers down a bit. Jennifer Hardigan briefly stepped forward before quickly stepping back. I don't think I can do that. Hegel nodded and confected a concerned look. Good idea. You wait here for rescue team. He lifted his brows in surprise. Hey, I just remembered. We are the rescue team. You can do it, Amy told her. I'm scared witless of heights, but I'd be more worried about staying behind if I was you. She turned to Casey. Have we got enough rope? Big Ben Jackson shook his head. I got nothing. Dawks? Jennifer? Both Dawkins and Jennifer shrugged. We've got a hundred feet from each of us, Casey said. That gives us four hundred, maybe just enough. Uh, boss, make that three hundred. Ranofsky grimaced. I never recovered mine. What? Casey's brows went up. You can fucking climb like a mountain goat. How the hell did you not recover that loop? Ranofsky hiked massive shoulders, looking pained. Amy could tell he was concealing something. Franks ground her teeth. I ought to make you go back and get it. Why didn't you climb back up like you were ordered? And why the fuck didn't you even tell me? Ah, shit. Ranofsky stared off into the dark momentarily. There was... He grimaced. There was something... Ah, uh, there was something that had hold of it. And I saw... In two paces, Casey was in front of him, grabbing his arm and turning the huge man around, her eyes blazing. She grabbed his suit front and dragged him further into the cave and away from the others. She hung on, pulling him close, near nose to nose. Listen, mister, you came back from the chute white as a fucking sheet. What the fuck happened back there? Rhino shook his head. Bad shit. Casey grabbed him with both hands and shook. Soldier, what did you fucking see? Rhino yanked himself from Casey's hands and held fists up on each side of his head. I don't know, I don't know what I saw. Something, nothing. He looked up, his expression pained. When I got to the bottom of the chute, I think there was someone still up at the rim. He shook his head again. They were just fucking with me. Someone? Someone was just fucking with you? What the hell does that mean? Her voice seethed with fury. Jesus, he grimaced. They pulled the rope up slow-like, and he grinned confused. And they rolled a freaking head down at me. There was a snigger from out of the dark. Did you just say they rolled a head at you? Hegel, now listening, brayed with laughter. 
God damn, now I've heard everything. Casey ignored Hegel to stare for several more seconds into Rhino's face. Ah, for fuck's sake, you big moose. You thought this was best kept to yourself? Casey's teeth were bared as she stared up into the face nearly a foot above her. Someone is jerking you around, and you run like a school kid? I ought to make you... She walked off a few paces before coming back and glaring up at him. The big hawk's face was twisted in agitation. At last, she just shook her head. Fuck it, we're out of here. She looked at each member. We need to be down and fast. Amy took another peek over the edge and blanched. Casey half smiled. Now's the time to stomach some risks. She showed her teeth. Because we don't really have a fucking choice. She turned to walk back to the edge and then leaned out. Unfortunately, the first part looks like it's a real kicker with few handholds, then a straight drop for about 80 feet down to the next cave. Means we're going to lose a third of our rope straight up. Casey eased back. Blake, she turned. Find me a tie-off. Blake quickly removed a rope from his pack and found a jagged tooth of granite jutting from the cave floor. He tied it off and then tossed the end over the cliff edge. He then stripped off his backpack and placed it on the cave edge, just under the rope. Casey looked down, judging distances for a few seconds. She picked up the rope and yanked it a few times. She didn't bother tying herself off, but instead turned and gripped the rope tightly, her heels now over the edge. Rhino, make sure people who need to be secured are secured. The big man nodded. Got it. Casey eased out. Give me five to check the next cave and make sure there are no surprises. She grinned. And if there are, well, you all try another route. She winked at Jennifer and began to walk backwards. The group surged forward, and some of them got down on their bellies to watch Casey descend. Amy crushed her eyes shut, feeling her stomach flip and her head spin. Heights. She hated them. She blinked again and tried to focus just on Casey and not the hundreds of feet drop that she'd also be expected to scale down any minute. Amy brought one arm up to wipe her forehead. In another few seconds, Casey was already close to the end of the rope and started to use her legs to push herself one way and then the other until she began to swing and run across the face of the wall. Just watching it made Amy feel ill. But in another moment, the female hawk stretched out and caught hold of the side of a new cave and then pulled herself in. Casey reappeared to lean out and give them a thumbs up. Bronowski stepped forward and then turned to Ben Jackson, the equally big McMurdo soldier. That means you're up next, big guy. We'll need your long arms down there. Jackson simply nodded and walked to the edge, picking up the rope, turning, and then walking backwards. The rope popped and strained, and Ronofsky laid a hand on it, feeling the tension. All good. He sized up the remaining team members. Still to go was the wiry Dawkins, Blake, Sung, Amy, and Jennifer, and... Hey! Rhino yelled as Hagel leaned out, and then disappeared around the outside of their cave. Amy looked across to see the young hawk just using his fingers and toes to scale the sheer face. He looked back and grinned. Haven't got all day, losers. See you down there. Break a leg, Dawkins whispered, his mouth turned down, his chipped tooth resting on his bottom lip. They watched Hagel clamber out and across, as if he was only a few feet from his back lawn. Rhino gave him a minute, and then motioned to Jennifer. The woman grimaced, and Rhino removed a length of material from his pack and tied one end of the material around the rope in a looping knot. This is an arbor knot. 
He tied the other end around Jennifer's wrist. You should be able to climb down by yourself, but if you slip... He tugged on the material, and it immediately tightened and gripped the rope. Then this will catch you. You can't fall. You'll be fine, okay? She nodded jerkily. Rhino grabbed her and looked into her face. Just concentrate on the rope, the rock wall, and Lieutenant Franks, and nothing else. Got it? Jennifer nodded, and he pushed her out. It took ages, but she eventually made it level with Casey. Then it was Sung's turn, and then Amy's. You're up, Doc. Rhino held out one big hand. Amy exhaled and got to her feet, but felt her legs wobble. Bronofsky looped the slipknot over her wrist. He placed large hands on her shoulders and looked into her face. Just on the rope, just on the wall, and just on me. Nothing else. And then she was over the edge, one hand after the other, concentrating on the rock face. She noticed the fine grain in the rock, the spots of lichen and mosses like tiny corals embedded in tiny cracks. In a damp pocket there was something that looked like lice that scurried in and out of the moisture. She focused on the rock wall as she descended, one hand after the other, over and over. There was a piece of crystal embedded in the rock, or maybe it was diamond. A crazy thought of stopping to dig it out entered her head. Forget it. Keep going and don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, she kept repeating. Her shoulders screamed, and her hands were becoming slick. Amy chanced to look back up. Rhino was just a dot above her now, but he had started to swing her. Her stomach flipped as she yawed against the cliff face. Reach out, nearly got you. Huh? Amy spun her head. Casey was only a few feet away, reaching out. Amy pushed with her legs, one way and then the next, until Casey grabbed her and dragged her in. Casey slapped her on the back, and Amy staggered away from the edge to sit down. Jennifer held out a water bottle that she took gratefully. In another few minutes, Blake swung in, followed by Rhino. Ben Jackson stuck his head out. Yo, Dawkins, hustle it up. John Dawkins, the smallest, was the last to go. He nimbly started down the rope. Jackson grinned as he continued to watch his smaller friend. Hurry up, Docs, no time for sightseeing. Still fifty feet up from the new cave mouth, the McMurdo soldier just seemed to hang for a moment, his head tilted upwards as if watching something. Then, while they watched, he lifted back up a few feet. What the hell? Casey leaned out further. What's he think he's doing? Big Ben Jackson turned to the group and then leaned out past Casey. Dawkins! John! You okay up there, buddy? The man just hung on, his neck craned as he stared up the rope. Jackson shook his head. Something's up. He wouldn't freeze. He knows how to climb, and he ain't scared of heights. Amy hung on to Jackson's arm and peered around him. Unbelievably, Dawkins started to rise. Is he climbing back up? Jennifer rose up on her toes, trying her best to see. Fuck no, not again, Ranofsky said softly. Casey Franks turned to glare at him for a second, before watching the McMurdo soldier rise slowly on the rope. Is it the Chinese? Jennifer asked. Casey edged out further, lifting an arm and looking like she planned to try and make a leap for the tip of the rope. Don't! Blake grabbed her and held on. Dawkins suddenly seemed jolted into action and began to climb down as fast as the rope was being reeled in. But in a few moments he came to the end and hung on, looking across at the sheer granite wall, searching for something to grab onto. There was nothing, and no choice but to let himself be pulled to the upper cave mouth. Dawkins soon reached the lip and stuck there, staring for several seconds, 
seeming to look deep into the cave, and then he simply pushed backwards into space and just fell. The soldier didn't make a sound, but as his body passed them, gathering speed, the split-second glimpse of his face showed wide eyes and teeth grit in a rictus of pure terror. They watched his body plummet to the ground. Casey blinked several times, her mouth open. He fucking jumped? She shook her head. Why the fuck would he jump? She backed up, her fists bold. Amy saw that Hank Ronofsky had turned away, one fist held up to his mouth. She looked back down at the jungle that had swallowed Dawkins's body. There was no trace. After another moment, she turned away. He jumped because he decided it was better than facing what he saw in the cave. Amy felt ill. The cold knot was in her stomach again. God help us. Dox is no coward, Ben Jackson grimaced as he stared down into the vegetation hundreds of feet below. No way would he kill himself. Yes, he would. Anyone would. Anyone. Amy folded her arms tight against her body and shut her eyes. You guys read the report, but didn't actually learn a damned thing, did you? She turned to look at Casey. This is no dumb animal. It's playing with us. It's probably known mankind for years, maybe hundreds or thousands of years. The people who used to live here had a name for it. They called it the Quoto Awan. I think I heard it that, Hegel said. We need to wake up real quick, Amy said, looking at each of them. Because this thing is big, smart, and we're right in its home. Jesus Christ, Hegel glared at Casey Franks. We're fucked. Shut the hell up, Casey glared right back. Oh, okay, we're all fine then. Hegel's face twisted as he walked away, shaking his head. Casey's face was furious, but it relaxed and she exhaled long and loud. So, this is our job. This is what we do. We've had to deal with worst-case scenarios before. She looked along their faces. And this is one of them. I must have missed that briefing, Ben Jackson said. He sighed and shook his head. Fuck it, we're all in the same boat now. The group, bar Hagel, crowded in tight, all eyes focused on Casey Franks. Amy looked over their heads and into the cave depths. There was no light and no end to its impenetrable darkness. For all she knew, there was something back in there, edging forward, sliding silently, its leviathan strength compressed, coiled, and waiting to flex out and then snatch them up. Let's get out of here, she said softly. Casey looked from the group to Amy and then into the tunnel depths. She nodded. Blake, tie us off again. This time I go last. Chapter 41 Stinks down here. Blake had his gun up, scanning the dense undergrowth. Creepy as hell, Hagel added, sighting along his rifle in the other direction. I heard that, brother. Blake said. He'd been in plenty of jungles before, from Colombia to the Congo, but this was like nothing he'd ever seen. Strange boughs gnarled and twisted, dripping with slick mosses, all looked less like trees and more like some sort of elongated mold growths. Others were just hairy trunks rising three stories in the air, with bulbous pads like tongues on their ends. The only real characteristic they shared was that where they touched the ground, they all looked like they were trying to break free, lift their roots out, and then go marching, triffid-like, off on their own. But the thing that bothered Blake the most was the silence. Jungles weren't quiet, unless something made them go quiet. 
He sensed life all around them, but nothing chirped, croaked, or whistled. It was like a dead forest, but not. His gut told him that the predator knew they were there and was watching them. He hated it. Blake half turned. You know, a lot of civilizations, old and new, think that hell is under our feet. Looks like they were right, Blake said, his gun moving along another quadrant of the jungle. No way, man. This is home from now on. Get used to it. Cause we ain't got enough rope to climb out anymore, Hegel added. Blake shook his head, keeping his eyes on the silent jungle. We needed it to get everyone down. What would you have done, smartass? Hegel put his gun on his shoulder and turned. We were given a job by Hammerson. Find that sub. That's our priority. We could have scaled down without the rope. He bobbed his head. I'd have left the sieves behind. Send a rescue party back for them later. Yeah, right. What rescue party? You mean leave them to die? Blake knew Hegel meant every word he said. Look, Blake, all I'm saying is Butchie Boy is burning through our resources far too quick. He shrugged. We could also track down the PLA, take their resources, improve our chances. Blake scoffed. We're doing okay so far. I suggest you lighten up as you're starting to piss me off. Blake looked squarely at the younger hawk. Hey, why don't you share your views with Franks? I'm sure she'll enjoy having a chat, just the two of you. I'm not scared of Franks. She's just... Rhino appeared out of the undergrowth. Can't find Dawkins. Huh? I don't get it. Blake's brows went up. That kid fell straight down. We all saw it. He looked up, calculating. Should be around here. And as he was no Superman, I don't see him walking away. Rhino shrugged. I'm telling you, there's nothing. Not even an impact mark. Guy never hit the ground. He tilted his head to the towering tops of the growths that had odd stubby heads, looking like massive undersea tube worms. Maybe he's caught up in the canopy of one of those suckers. Maybe, Blake said, unconvinced. Yeah, maybe, Hegel grinned. And maybe we only imagined he fell. Maybe we're all asleep and this is a dream, he chuckled. Assholes. He pushed his rifle up over his shoulder and walked off to rejoin the group. Rhino watched Hegel for a moment before turning back to Blake. I'm telling you, it's like he never hit the ground. He grimaced. This place is all fucked up. You think? Blake exhaled. Hold it together, big guy. We'll all be fine if we all just keep clear heads. Clear heads. Rhino pushed his weapon up over his shoulder. Yeah, sure. Amy was lost in her own thoughts. How did I get here again? She wondered as she pushed aside stubby fronds. Some people are just programmed to make bad decisions, she answered. She looked up towards the roof of the giant cavern. Tiny blue lights twinkled like stars, bioluminescent glowworms. Attached to the ceiling, huge multi-branched trees of lichens hung down hundreds of feet, almost looking like a mirror image of the ground. Things flew in and out of the lichens. Some looked like mere dots, but others she knew were probably the size of small airplanes. Up there it's another world, in yet another world. She smiled at the paradox. She sighed. Another few miles or so above that clinging ceiling was another world again, her world, frozen, and perhaps now engaged in a tense nuclear standoff, or worse. A sudden image of Joshua screaming as he was caught in a nuclear inferno ripped across her mind, and she shook her head to clear it away. Idiot, she whispered with enough venom to lash her own conscience. 
Jack Hammerson had said he wanted a scientific negotiator with experience, someone who could be their guide. She had been vain enough to suck up his flattery, but now thought that if she was the best they had, they were all doomed. She ground her teeth. Some people will continue to make stupid decisions until one eventually kills them. Amy stumbled from fatigue and tried to remember when it was she last really rested. Too long ago. She exhaled long and slow, looking over her shoulder to the cliffs they had just scaled down. The thing she feared the most was in there, a thing that could squeeze its monstrous, boneless bulk down and then spring at them from any crevasse, cave, or dark space. It could mimic their form, seeming to be like one of them, until it was close enough for you to realize you had made a horrible mistake, and by then it was too late, as it was in reach and able to grab you and steal you away to... She grimaced, not wanting to finish the thought. They were leaving the caves behind. But in the open, are we any better off, she wondered. She slowed and watched as Hegel remonstrated with Casey. She was half a head shorter than Hegel, but Amy bet the female hawk was a dozen times more deadly. She caught up to Ben Jackson and the equally big rhino, who was looking over his shoulder at the small device he had in his hands. He pointed at the screen, showing the McMurdo soldier what he was looking at. Amy craned to see. Signal here is long and strong, and about 4.4 clicks. Rhino turned and recalibrated the device, and pointed it into the distance. This cave is too big for a signal bounce, has its own horizon and beyond. Blake and Casey also joined them, Blake holding out a different small box. He whistled softly. What is it? Amy asked, looking down at the small screen as a wave pulsed out and showed up a smattering of dots, some large and some pinpricks. Standard movement tracker, Blake said, looking up and then along at the walls of jungle around them. This place is near tomb silent, but there's a hell of a lot of movement out there. Too much for the tracker to fully untangle but basically we're surrounded by things as small as a mouse and as big as a freaking bus. He pointed. About a hundred feet that way, there's something the size of a truck right now. Casey leaned back. Moving away from us, thank Christ. Sung peered down at the screen and walked off a few paces with Blake and Rhino, just as Jennifer came into the group, her arms wrapped around herself. Casey tilted her head towards the dark-haired medic. How you holding up, Jen? Jennifer shrugged. I'd rather be back in the rec room with a cold beer, getting ready to shoot some pool. Casey grinned and reached out to grasp one of her shoulders. I heard that. Maybe when this is over, you and I can catch up, share a beer and rack up a few. Jennifer's cheek dimpled. I'd like that. Amy smiled as the two walked off. You go, girl, she thought with a half-smile. Within an hour, they came to a small depression, like a fifty-foot bowl in the soft lichen mats. Casey held up a hand. Rest. Thirty minutes. Sleep if you can. Might be the last opportunity we get. We should keep going, Hegel said, continuing to walk. We could continue, but the group needs rest, Casey said, turning away. Hegel paused, his eyes going from Casey to each of the hawks, trying to gain support. He got nothing. Casey turned back to him. I'll do first watch, then seeing you've got so much energy, you can take over in thirty minutes. Happy now? Hegel smiled, but there was little humor in the lift of his lips. He turned and muttered all the way over to a pile of rocks where he sat down, back against it, and covered his eyes. Wake me in thirty, Mommy. The group collapsed, 
the hawks lifting the belts and straps of packs and weapons off their shoulders and laying prone. Amy lay down and Sung lay close to her. This is not a good place, Sung said. No. Amy had few words of comfort for her, so she just smiled and reached out to squeeze her arm. Rest now. Amy turned away and shut her eyes. What seemed like seconds later, she was being shaken awake. She sat up and saw Hegel talking rapidly to Casey and pointing off into the undergrowth. He stood over her, giving her grief. The man, as usual, not amused by something out in the jungle. Give it a rest, twerp, she thought, and went to sit forward. She groaned, sore all over. Hey, who's fucking around? Rhino was on his feet, walking in a circle, kicking plants and debris out of his way. Where the fuck is my cannon? Casey Franks turned away from Hagel to glare. You better find that weapon, mister. Rhino looked at each of them, trying to detect someone stifling a laugh. He turned his attention to Hagel. What the fuck happened to it? Hagel waved him away. I was scouting and didn't see nothing. When did you last have it? The caves? Betting that's where it still is. No, asshole, I had it right here. Rhino pointed at the ground. Blake also spun one way and the next. Holy shit, where's mine? Oh, for fuck's sake. Casey marched over and looked from Blake to Rhino and then to Hagel. You were on watch. What the hell happened? Like I said, Hegel spoke slowly. I saw nothing. He shrugged. I just went to scout for a few minutes, is all. But there was no sound, no movement, nothing. Amy pointed at the lichen matting behind Rhino. Look. There was a small, flattened path in the plants, its edges glistened like a snail trail, and Amy bent closer and sniffed. Ammonia. She straightened. We had a visit. What? Casey's eyes bulged. Here? It came in here? Bullshit, said Blake. Why didn't it grab us all when we were out cold? He pointed with his thumb. And all while this jackass was off the reservation. Amy wrapped her arms around herself, thinking, Because it didn't want to. Huh? Blake's lip curled in confusion. It didn't want to. She looked up. It's having too much fun. You asked me what I meant by us educating it. Well, it learned real quick that these things, she pointed at the hawk's remaining guns, cause it pain. So it's taking them from us, Ben Jackson said, running a hand through his hair. She grimaced, looking around. It's here, somewhere, probably watching us right now. The silence stretched as they turned, looking over their shoulders. Sung instinctively edged in closer to the group. That's bullshit, Casey finally said her face red and furious. Nah, it's not. Hagel had his gun now cradled in his arms. It's what I was trying to tell you, Franks. You better come take a look at this. He turned and waved them on, heading into the jungle. Gear up, we're out of here, Casey said, following. Remember our young scout who did the high dive? Hagel looked slightly amused. You found Dawkins? Casey's brows shot up. Maybe. Hagel shrugged, a touch of a sneer in his smile. You be the judge. He came to a fallen bough and crouched behind it. Casey did the same beside him. Hagel looked to Casey, grinning. Ten o'clock, five up. She turned to the small clearing ahead. In amongst the twisted branches and oversized vines, there was a tree stump as thick as her waist. 
Five feet up, its top was near flat, creating a small tabletop. On it, there was a smaller object. From the distance, it gleamed wetly. She put a scope to her eye. Jesus Christ! Her teeth came together, and her lips curled in a snarl. It was a skull, wet, streaked red, and also white where bone showed through the last vestiges of flesh. Casey quickly turned to speak over her shoulder. Keep him back, Rhino. The big hawk held out massive arms to push the remaining McMurdo soldiers, plus Sung and Amy, back a pace. Casey turned towards the grisly trophy and grimaced. The skull had a chipped front tooth. Could be Dawkins. Got that same boyish smile, Hagel sniggered. I'm not thinking the fall did that to him. What do you think? That's him. Casey tried to keep her breathing calm, but a range of emotions washed over her. Anger gave way to frustration, and then settled in as confusion. Who or whatever it was, it was dogging them, one step ahead all the time. She had never felt more out of her depth. Fuck that Dempsey, she thought getting himself killed. He was supposed to be making the decisions. She licked dry lips. What would Alex or Sam do, she wondered. Hey, you still here? Hegel whispered. Yeah, she said, and knew exactly what Alex would say. He'd tell her to fight her adversary at a time and place of her choosing, not its. She pulled back. In the caves, Rhino had been right about one thing. Someone or something sure was fucking with them. You think it's the Chinese, or like the doc says, it's that fucking monster thing playing with us? He leaned closer. What do you think? Can't fight what we can't see. What I think is from now on, we need eyes in the back of our heads. She got to her feet, staying low. We detour around it and keep permanent watch. You're still on point. Nice time to be losing weapons, huh, boss? Hagel grinned as he pulled back. Chapter 42 Time, 12 hours, 5 minutes, 12 seconds, until fleet convergence. Sam Reed slowed as he topped the rise, gazing down onto the Ellsworth base. It was much like he expected, a few prefabricated igloos joined by some boxes. Not much shelter for the coming cold, but the occupants were here to do science, not enjoy a winter holiday, he guessed. Just out to the side, there stood the mini-submersible's launch silo, snow-covered and empty now. Sam shook his head. Only Alex Hunter would try something so crazy, he thought. He powered down the slope, heading for the main building. Just as he reached for the handle, it was pulled inward by a small, bearded man. He first looked straight ahead, directly into Sam's armored chest. Then his eyes moved slowly up, towards Sam's head. Sam telescoped the facial shielding back into his collar and leaned forward. You ordered pizza? Hey! The man's eyes rolled and he fell back. Sam shot out an arm to grab him. I got you. He helped him upright again. I'm Sam Reed, and I'm here to help. The still speechless man led him inside, and at the main room, Sam had to duck down and turn sideways to enter. The Ellsworth group of scientists sat in a circle, their backs to multiple consoles and control panels. They all sat mute with folded arms or tugging at straggly beards. For the most part, their gazes were firmly fixed on the ground, each man lost in his own thoughts. The sudden appearance of Sam had every mouth dropping open. They seemed in shock. Only one man stayed at his console with his back turned as he typed away. He was furiously shaking his head. I told you, 
I told all of you that letting that yank hijack our probe would crash Orca. He banged at more keys, continuing to mutter. Uh, Bentley. One of the team members still had his eyes on Sam, but reached out an arm to tug the mutterer's sleeve. The man ignored it and kept up his cursing complaints. Did anyone back me up? No. Bentley straightened in his seat. I'm not one to say I told you so, but I bleeding well told you so. He threw his hands up and spun. Worst day of my fucking life. He froze, staring. Sam in the mech suit probably stood close to seven feet tall. In the warmth of the cabin, the snow had melted on him, and the liquid runoff on his external armor carried with it some blood. One of the scientists cleared his throat. Hello. We are from Earth. Please don't kill us. Sam grinned and held up one huge hand. Me too. I'm First Lieutenant Samuel Reed, Special Forces. I'm here to help and for your protection. No thanks, Bentley said, wiping a long, thin nose. We're not a military base, and certainly not a U.S. one. We're not obligated to work with you. Sam smiled, knowing that their major funder, GBR, was owned by the U.S. military. He'd hold that revelation back for now. You already did by sending one of our operatives under the ice. He pointed over his shoulder with a thumb. From out there. I'm here for an update. The man who had let him in edged around in front of him. I'm Dr. Sully, and from left to right are Doctors Timms, Schmidt, and Bentley. The scientists nodded cautiously, and only Bentley's mouth remained turned down. Like I said, worst day of my life, and it's not getting any better. Sully scoffed. Give it a rest, Bent. You're still young. I'm sure you'll have plenty worse days to come. He chuckled softly but held up a hand when Bentley shot a volcanic glare on him. Bentley turned back to Sam, folding his arms. I'd introduce you to our team leader, but the Yank, your friend, took her down in the probe. Sam's brows rose near imperceptibly. He doubted this would have been Alex's choice. Where are they now? Schmidt frowned. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. What did you mean you were here for our protection? What does that mean? Sam hesitated for only a second. Look, time is short, and what I tell you now is classified. Less than an hour ago, the McMurdo base was attacked by Chinese special forces. We successfully subdued them. There is also a Chinese destroyer off the Antarctic coast, and more warships on the way. Theirs and ours. He looked at each man. There is a possibility they may come here next. Gentlemen, things are getting real hot down on the ice. What? Why? Tim's got to his feet. What did we miss? Actually, it was what you didn't miss that started all this. Sam smiled and tried to radiate calm to the men. That tiny signal you first detected coming from under the ice, well, it's a missing submarine, ours. The Chinese want it, but we don't intend to let them get it. Tim scoffed. Oh, fuck off. That underlying signal we thought was just a background distortion. Are you telling us it was a submarine under the ice? He put his hands to his temples. Boom. Head explosion. Sully's lips had been pressed tight. Hey, Lieutenant Reed, uh, why would the Chinese come here? Sam grinned and pointed to the wall in front of the probe launcher. Seems we are now in a partnership to get down there first. He laughed at the looks they gave each other. Bentley rubbed his hands up through his hair and muttered curses. So, where are they now? Sam asked. We don't have much time. Bentley sat back and then turned around to his console. 
dead, most likely. Sam felt the first flame of anger, but swallowed it down. That's not what I asked you. Sully grimaced. Sorry, but it's probably true, Lieutenant. Orca, the probe, was never designed to carry passengers. Our data showed us that the drop to the water's surface was 220 feet. The impact force would have been like a car crash. Orca survived and launched, but we doubt anything biological would have survived. Sam tilted his head. But the probe survived and was sending his signals. Sure, signals, environmental and visual data, Sully said. Show me, show me everything. Sam came closer. Sure. Sully spun, his hands flying over the keyboards, twisting dials and then retrieving video and other data from the submersible short voyage. Orca was designed to see, hear, and taste the subterranean environment. Sully spoke over his shoulder as he called up the probe's images. You know, he has the same amount of inbuilt capabilities as an orbiting satellite, probably more. He turned and grinned. We did that. Sam nodded. And the probe was undamaged? Well, mostly, Sully said. It didn't operate as expected. Maneuverability went a bit wonky, and then we lost it at the end. He sighed. Lost it, or had it taken more like it? There was something else down there, something very big and very pissed off. He reran the footage, and Sam watched closely. The film started in near total blackness as the probe launched into the subterranean sea. The resolution was adjusted and then improved to show specks of light floating around them. At the periphery, Sam could see larger shapes pass in and out of the cone of light. Goes on like this for a while. Sully sped it up, the duration counter at the bottom of the screen spinning numbers. Here. He slowed it to normal speed again. In another second or two, the submersible seemed to slide sideways in the water. And this is where it gets freaky, Tim said, standing behind Sully. Orca suddenly changed direction, nose up, rushing to the surface. It breached, and Sam's brows went up. The cavern was enormous and bathed in a soft blue twilight. Sully leaned around in front of him, pointing to the floor at their feet. That's 2.55 miles right below us. Incredible, huh? Incredible, Sam repeated, his eyes glued to the small screen. And enter the Leviathan, Bentley said ominously. A few dozen feet out from Orca, a striped island appeared and then glided closer. The underwater shot showed a massive head turning side on, and a gigantic round eye that studied them intently for a second or two before the thing glided off to the right. Holy shit, Sam leaned back. What the hell was that? Don't know, Bentley said. Big predator. Our computer estimated it to be about sixty feet in length. He chuckled. Guess you just can't plan for everything. The probe then dived, sharply, suddenly speeding up and continuing on down into the dark depths, until a darker cave, lined with conical teeth, rushed up to meet it. The film blacked out. Jesus! Sam exhaled. That's it? Yes and no. Orca is pretty tough and he's still operational. But we think it's busted up pretty bad, and maybe, just maybe, it has beached itself somewhere. My instincts tell me that Orca can hear us, but doesn't have the power to respond. Bentley eased back in his chair. Sam sat staring at the dark screen for several more seconds. Sully, show me the thing again where it came to the surface. Sully's fingers rippled over the keyboard as he rapidly skipped the footage backwards until the twilight blue surface was in frame. Here we go. Slow it down. 
Sam leaned in close, watching as the thing glided in front of the camera. Its huge orb of an eye hung in frame. Freeze that. He squinted. Can you increase magnification and tidy it up? Sure. Sully enlarged the image. The eye filled the screen, but was now blurry. The scientist then tapped keys, using a resolution algorithm in the software to sharpen the focus. His mouth dropped open. Oh, my God. He leaned back. Hey, you guys, check this out. Sam folded his arms. What's a mere 220-foot drop to a hawk? He grinned at the screen. In the center of the massive eye, in its soulless black pupil, was a reflection. It showed the glow of Orca's nose cone light, and just visible behind it were two diver-masked heads, one looking directly at them and another facing away. They're alive. Tims clapped his hands. Hey, Bentley, best day of your life, right? He whooped. Bentley gave him a brief, tight-lipped smile. That doesn't really mean anything now. Orca was wrecked by that thing. If Kate and the Yank were hanging on to it, what do you think happened to them? You're not really a glass-half-full kind of guy, are you? Sam got to his feet filling the room. He hated hearing Bentley's snide tone, but hated even more that the man was probably right. Whatever that thing was, being in the water with it was a death sentence, even for someone like the Arcadian. He drew in a deep breath and pushed the morbid thoughts away, staring down at the man. You know who one of my favorite military leaders is, Dr. Bentley? It's this funny-looking little Brit guy called Winston Churchill. Gave a rousing little speech one day about never surrendering. Tim saluted and put on a mock voice. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Sam leaned forward, Bentley shrinking back. I'd like to see a little of that fighting spirit now, he straightened. Alex Hunter wouldn't surrender, doesn't know how. It's not in his DNA. To him, it's fight or die. His eyes bored into Bentley's. Tell me, why can't that probe operate? Maybe it can in parts, Schmidt answered quickly. Probably busted up real bad, and the battery is only 10% strength. That's bad. But we still have contact, so that's good. Sam folded massive arms, thinking. He began to pace for a moment, the floor creaking underneath him. He stopped and turned. You're running all of the applications and processes concurrently, aren't you? Sully nodded. Yeah, most of them. Some we rest, but others are constant background apps. We need them to be that way, so shut them down, Sam said evenly. There were confused looks, and Schmidt sat stroking his beard for a second or two. He suddenly spun to do some quick calculations on his screen. He turned back, eyebrows raised. You know, we haven't tried that. I mean, chemical analysis alone used about 10% of the battery. Shutting down all non-essentials might, just might, give us enough kick to get vision back and also pull us into the water. Nods and murmurs from Tims and Sully. Bentley folded his arms tight. Great. If we can shut down anything of scientific value, we just might have the world's most expensive underwater camera. Better than nothing. What have you got now? Sam waited. Schmidt looked across to Tim's. Do it. Tim's nodded, his fingers dancing over his console. Shutting down magnetic resonance imaging, shutting down gyroscope. Panels went from green to red on his screen. 
shutting down environmental sampling, biological sampling, chemical analysis, depth telemetry, sonar. No, leave that one for now, Schmidt said. We'll also need ears once we're in the water. He shrugged. Got to see and hear what's coming. Thames continued switching off applications for a few more seconds before sitting back. Batteries now up at 40%, good as it's going to get. Schmidt turned to Sully. Okay, Sal, punch it. Sully eased back on a joystick. Reverse propulsion at one quarter. They waited. Tim shook his head. Nothing. Sully eased it back some more. Reverse at one-third power. He turned to Tim's, who shook his head, his eyes on his own screen. Now at fifty percent. Tim's grimaced. Nada, but the battery drain is beginning to hurt us. Schmidt nodded to the screen. Do it. Might as well be dead where it is now. Sully frowned as he pulled back on the small stick. RP at 70%, 75%, 80%. His teeth were bared, as if he were bearing the physical strain of the submersible himself. The visual feed screen suddenly showed a sliver of light as the thing jerked back a quarter inch. Whoa, gentlemen, we have movement. Tim's clapped once, and then there was suddenly a rush of a twilight blue glow filling the screen. Sully exhaled, grinning. He turned to Sam. And we are now in open water. Hegel froze just letting his eyes move over the foliage. Did he just hear something, or was his mind just fucking with him again in this weird-ass place? He was sure he'd heard something soft and heavy, like someone dragging a sack over wet grass. He turned slowly. Maybe he was just spooking himself? There was nothing now. No cricket chirrup, no bird call, or even the rustle of a breeze in this fucked-up ghost jungle. If not for the odd drip of water and his own breathing, he might have thought he'd gone deaf. Hegel was following a trail of sorts, but the ground was squashy soft, covered in thick moss and lichen. There were soupy-looking puddles everywhere, and everything stunk like bad mushrooms. He continued on, carefully placing one foot in front of the other. He could just make out the others about fifty feet back. Franks was keeping them relatively silent, but still the sound of their movement carried. Hegel came to a bend in the trail at an enormous fallen tree, its trunk easily five feet around. He paused, listening. There was more dripping. He pulled his scope down over his eyes, switching from light enhance in the twilight atmosphere to thermal. There was a ton of background heat, but mostly everything was cold as the grave. He scanned slowly, stopping as something just off to the left showed a flare of warmth. He approached and noticed a spattering on the ground. Closer now, he saw more spattering on the trunks of the trees. He let his eyes travel upwards, higher to the broad fronds towering overhead, and then switched his scope to distance enhance. Fuck me. He gritted his teeth and began to back up when he paused, turning to the line of the jungle. He frowned, seeing a natural tunnel formation within the undergrowth. There was something in there. Oh, you gotta be shitting me. He retreated silently and quickly. He soon found Franks and held up a hand flat. The group halted. He motioned for just Franks to follow, and then the pair burrowed back through the undergrowth. Hegel worked along the trail again cautiously and then found the huge tree which he leaned against. Franks eased in beside him. I think we just found the rest of Dawkins. He motioned with his head towards the treetops. 
Casey Franks used her hand scope to scan the canopy. About 50 feet up, there was a body, or rather, a torso, stripped naked, no head or arms, but still dripping blood. Hegel watched her as she gazed at the body. A low growl started deep in her throat. It's dogging us, she said. Yep, that's what I figure. He nudged her. And that's not all. Look in there. He pointed one grimy, gloved finger to the tunnel in the undergrowth. Casey moved her scope, flicking it to light in hands to improve the illumination within the dark space. Hanging just inside was one of their laser rifles. Blake's, she said. Suicide trap. This is too fucked up, Hegel said. Gotta be the Chinese. No fucking animal is going to do this. Yeah, maybe. She pulled back. Hegel watched her go and then turned back to the jungle. His scalp prickled. He had the feeling something was watching, waiting, just past the first line of ferns, willing him to enter the undergrowth cave. Not today, motherfucker. He backed away, gun up. Chapter 43 Shen Jung Ching felt himself grabbed and dragged through warm water. He blinked, his eyes gritty and stinging, but still not focusing properly. His stomach convulsed, and coughing, he emptied about two pints of water from his gut before he was cast up onto an embankment. Good, get it all out. Captain Yang stood over him. Shen Jung moaned and rubbed at his eyes, wiping out grit. He blinked, restoring his sight this time. Where? He sat up and saw some of the soldiers nearby. There were ten, about half of Yang's original squad. Only one other was on his feet, the giant Mungoi. Yang turned to sit beside him, picked up a twig, and looked out over the river as it wended its way out of sight. My men are gone. He nodded, still watching the water. The flow is strong, and if they were unconscious, they would have been swept away. He flicked the twig into the water. More food for the worms. Shen Jung suddenly remembered and turned over, jamming fingers down his throat and gagging up more water and bile. Yang laughed. Too late now, doctor. He slapped Shen Jung's back. But I think we are okay. The water was moving too fast for them to get to us. Shen Jung flopped onto his back, wiping one hand over his sticky mouth. Where are we? Did we make it out? Out of the caves, yes. But out, out. Yang motioned to the cliff wall, towering a half mile behind them, which then kept rising to touch a ceiling. No. We are still in a cave. We fell, washed from up there. He motioned upwards. Shen Jung followed his hand. A hundred feet up from the ground, a torrent of water poured forth, slowing now that the deluge was being exhausted. The missing men. Will we look for them? Shen Jung asked. Yang glanced again at the surging water. No. He got to his feet and reached into a pouch to pull out his signal tracker. Each man has a device like this one. If they are alive, they'll know where we are going and they will join us. We cannot spend any more time down here. And if they are hurt? Shen Jung asked. Then they have a new home. Yang checked his tracker. Shen Jung pushed wet hair back off his face. He knew there was nothing he could say which would change the PLA captain's mind. He got unsteadily to his feet, wiped his face, and then looked around. So big, so fantastic. It's a forest under the earth. He turned slowly. 
And now all Chinese territory, Yang said. The Antarctic Treaty covers the continent's surface, but down here is no one's territory, so it all belongs to us. Yang lifted his head high. I claim this land in the name of the People's Republic of China. He saluted and then turned to grin at him. Good day's work, huh? Maybe you can be king, Shen Zhong turned away. Yang leaned back, looking skyward. Yes, and my new kingdom even has light. Shen Zhong looked up at the twinkling stars in the dark blue heavens above them. No, this is an illusion, he said softly. We're still trapped in a cave, just a bigger one. I wish to see the light, real sunlight, one more time, Captain. Yang grunted. Enough dreaming. He read from his tracker. We're not far from the source of the signal. He looked up again briefly. At least we can preserve our batteries on our way to the sub. Small gifts, Shen Zhong responded. Yang turned to bark at his men. They got to their feet, some slowly. Their suits were sodden and ripped. Many were hunched with fatigue. Mungoi will lead us out. He pointed to where the far cave wall stopped at an endless dark sea. That way. Shen Zhong looked skyward one more time. Sunlight, fresh air, and my sung. Please be up there safe and waiting for me, he silently prayed, and then followed the soldiers. Something. Yang nodded to his scout and turned to wave his remaining men down. He drew his revolver and followed. Hung Ba Lin was his latest scout. He was a good soldier, solid, trustworthy, even if not so brilliant. Already one of the previous scouts had gone missing. Perhaps he'd wandered too far ahead and got lost in the chaotic tangle of weird plants, some with poisonous-looking barbs, stinging sap, or vines that refused to let go. Though the jungle around them was deathly silent, Yang couldn't escape the feeling that they were being watched, followed by something that was always close by, sliding silently and just out of sight. Hung, what did you see? Yang eased up closer to the man, crouching now and slowing as his soldier did. The soldier turned, but there was a hint of confusion in his eyes. I saw something. I couldn't see clearly at first, but then it became a person, one of the engineers, I think. Yang frowned. Impossible. One of those we left in the higher caves. How did they get down here so quickly? Hung shook his head and continued to burrow through the undergrowth as Yang followed. It started to make sense. This is who had been following them, the engineers. They had been too scared to join them, but also too scared to be by themselves. Yang's chin jutted. They'd certainly feel his wrath when he caught them, he thought. Hung led him to an opening in the undergrowth, with a small muddy pond at its center. The place was no more than twenty feet around, and almost totally overgrown, to give the appearance of a dark green cave. The soldier turned and placed a finger to his lips. He waved Yang on and crept forward. A man was standing perfectly still on the other side of the pond. He wore the familiar gray coveralls of the engineers and was in the water. Yang frowned. No, not in the water. It looked like he was on top of the water. One of our engineers, but he doesn't move or acknowledge me. Maybe he is in shock, Hung said softly. Yang snorted. Go and get him. Bring him back for questioning. I want to know how he got here and where the others are. Hung nodded sharply, his expression brightening 
as if he were happy to have some concrete orders to carry out. He got to his feet as Yang started to ease backwards. Captain Yang turned away and only took a few paces when he heard a grunt and the thud of an impact. Looking back quickly, he saw Hung and the engineer in some sort of embrace. He groaned, thinking that either his soldier was overreaching in his orders to bring the man in, or perhaps the befuddled engineer was fighting back out of fear. While he watched, he saw Hung, who outweighed the smaller engineer by at least fifty pounds, struggle for a moment more. There came a tiny sound that could have been a whimper of pain or fear, and then the larger PLA soldier was yanked from his feet to disappear into the thick foliage. Huh? Yang blinked, not understanding what he was seeing. How could that little fart of a man overpower and drag away the bigger Hung? He spat in disgust and crawled forward quickly, following both men into the deeper undergrowth. The stink was the first thing that assailed him. The stink, the slime that covered everything, and the fresh path through the foliage. He followed quickly, and then when it opened out, he stood. His soldier, Hung, was there, or what was left of him. He also guessed he might have found his other missing scout, as there were too many body parts for just one man. Hanging in the trees like some sort of macabre decorations were strips of flesh, arms, legs, and the trunk of a torso impaled on a sharp branch. Blood dripped down onto the ground, where it mixed with the mud to create a bubbling red-brown soup. Yang felt his testicles shrivel, and he tightened his fingers around his gun. What had that little freak done to his men? The stench in the small clearing made his eyes water. It smelled of ammonia, blood, bowel contents, and crushed plants. He lifted an arm across his mouth and nose. A flicker of movement in the corner of his eye caused him to spin, his gun up and heart hammering. The engineer stood silently in the shadow of a huge tree trunk. His expression was totally devoid of emotion, as if the mutilation laid out before him didn't exist. What have you done? Yang whispered. The figure edged forward, strangely in a gliding manner like that of a ghost. The engineer looked wet, glistening, his eyes unfocused. He glided another few inches closer. Yang took a step back. Oh, no, you don't. He took another step. This is a trick. He eased back another few paces and then turned and ran. Chapter 44 Alex Hunter lifted his pace, forgetting about Kate, forgetting about anything that might have been lurking in the blue-lit undergrowth. He now knew that the Chinese were in the cave system. They'd be going for the sea shadow. He must get there first. He also felt a growing awareness of something far more familiar. He had sensed the presence of a hawk team for hours. He should have known that Hammerson wouldn't just send him in alone. Strangely, he sensed another connection that both exhilarated and confused him. It couldn't be, he thought. She wouldn't. He wouldn't. Alex pummeled the undergrowth. Hammerson wouldn't dare send her. Anger flared, and he swung out an arm, smashing a tree trunk from his path. She wouldn't come. She wouldn't leave Joshua by himself. It was impossible. He's not by himself. You know she has someone else with her now. The whispered voice in his head sounded amused at his torment. Alex gritted his teeth, accelerating. Another trunk bared his way, and he lowered a shoulder, striking it hard, making the stump splinter away into the undergrowth. He tried to shut out the voice, its words, not wanting to acknowledge the truth. Maybe now he even calls him 
Father. A corrosive laugh. Joshua doesn't need you, doesn't even know you. No one does anymore. You've been a ghost for years. Alex ricocheted off another huge tree trunk, not concentrating on his track. He placed a hand to his bloody face, wiping the stinging liquid from his eyes, blinded for a moment, and not seeing the sinuous, scaled head rising up in the undergrowth. The giant snake shot forward, striking Alex from the side and gripping his body in its alligator-sized mouth around the torso and one arm. The massive, diamond-shaped head was two feet across and was attached to a dark, scaled body that still trailed forty feet into the foliage. Alex was carried backwards from the impact to slam hard into one of the hairy prototaxite trunks, dropping polypy fronds down on top of him. Though the ancient snake was incredibly powerful, its inwardly curved teeth were relatively small and used for gripping rather than venom delivery. Alex's suit stopped the fangs from penetrating his flesh, but the danger was from the enormous body now piling in the undergrowth. If it managed to coil around his chest, the muscular body would easily crush the air from his lungs. Easily distracted means easily killed. The voice was contemptuous this time. Alex felt an enormous pressure building from the creature's mouth, but also inside his own head. Frustration, impatience, and raw fury. He had no time for this. He reached up with his free arm and grabbed one side of the huge mouth, lifting and opening the huge jaws, and then ripped his other arm free. The black, glass-like eye displayed no surprise, nor fear, or even concern. It only reflected back Alex's own twisted features in those soulless depths. Alex pulled back one arm, his teeth bared, and then punched down with all the strength he could gather. His fist exploded through the snake's eye and on into its skull to then embed in the brain. Its mouth immediately sprung open, and the huge body and tail thrashed behind it as Alex held the head aloft to momentarily snarl into its dying face before throwing it aside and charging on again. Faster. He needed to move faster. He reached out, his senses ballooning forward in a wave. He felt the multiple bodies, their hearts racing, the tangy smells of sweat and blood mixed with fear. The Chinese, they were far ahead, beating him to the submarine. Kill them all. They were your orders. Kill them all, he repeated. His anger was boiling within him, his body now so hot. Even in the humid air, the moisture on his suit was rising from him as steam. He pushed his senses out again, but before he could get a lock on any one person, he detected something else. A huge presence, a monstrosity with a malevolent intelligence, moving quickly and silently, rolling and tumbling, and flowing like liquid. He sensed its hunger, but also something more. Its enjoyment. Your old friend is still here. It's been waiting for you. The voice became caustic. Don't run away this time. Wait! He barely heard Kate as she yelled after him. She was a long way back now, sprinting hard, but never hoping to keep up with him. She at least had the benefit of being able to move along the tunnel he was bullocking through the growth. Alex put his head down. He was a dark blur smashing through the jungle, one monster pursuing another. Captain Yang moved his men into the stand of gnarled and ancient-looking trees. He pointed to each man and then had them positioned where he wanted. Some in the canopy, some concealed in among low foliage, and some even pulling mats of lichen up over themselves. He grunted his satisfaction. His PLA were masters of natural camouflage. His rear scouts had picked up the approach of the Americans a while back, 
and he eagerly awaited their arrival. He and his men seethed with hatred and a desire for vengeance. He had told them of the taken scouts and of their bodies found mutilated, portions of them hung like grisly trophies in trees or impaled on low branches. The Americans were playing a gruesome trick on them. They were evil, and he would treat them accordingly. We should talk to them. I know Americans, and they would not have done this. Shen Jung tugged at his sleeve, but Yang pulled his arm free. You know nothing. American war games are both physical and psychological. War games? Shen Jung shook his head. No, you are the one making war. I must warn you, I will be compelled to report any crimes. Yang studied the man for several seconds, seeing the waver of fear in his eyes. He leaned in close to his face. Comrade Shen Jung, you are not at home in your comfortable office any more. Down here, all authority resides with me. Down here, I am both law and punishment. For them and you. Conceal yourself. That is an order. He pushed the man into the undergrowth. Yang then walked to stand in the center of a flattened area of the jungle with his back turned to the trail. He would be the bait at the end of a fifty-foot killing zone. He concentrated. The silence in this strange world was unnerving, but now it meant the slightest sound was magnified. The Americans were coming, close now. He smiled, unholstered his gun, stuck it in his belt, and then unzipped his fly. He waited a few moments until they were there, and began to urinate slowly, making the stream last. He began to sing softly. Ronofsky saw that Hegel had stopped, holding up a fist. He and the group halted and waited as Hegel then turned to lift a single finger and then waved them down. The group crouched low, and only Casey Franks eased up to join him. Hegel remained silent, just using two fingers to point at his eyes and then into the jungle at about ten o'clock. Casey followed his prompt and then nodded and then turned to point at Big Ben Jackson and Rhino and then out to two o'clock. She then sent Hegel and Blake out to nine. Rhino and Jackson were first into position, staring at the PLA soldier ahead. Jackson leaned in close to Rhino. That's horrible, he whispered. Keep it down. Ranofsky scowled, but then spoke out of the side of his mouth, leaving his eyes on the target. So where have you been pissing? In your water bottle? Jackson grinned. I meant his voice. It's horrible. Ranofsky groaned and put a finger to his lips. At the end of a small clearing, the Chinese soldier was standing by himself, taking a casual piss as if he was in his own bathroom. A soft tune lifted from him as he seemed to be enjoying his ablutions. Stay here and stay alert. Rhino moved along the brush line and then waited. Across from him he saw Blake appear and nod to him and then hold up a hand. Blake pointed to the other end of the clearing. Casey Franks had stepped out, gun cradled in her arms, as she watched the soldier finish up. Casey stood slightly side on, legs planted. Hey, she said. The man kept singing, and then jiggled a bit as if he was hiking up his zipper. Hey, water boy. Casey kept her eyes directly on him. Turn around, real slow. The man did neither. Casey half turned. Blake, tell this guy to drop his cock and turn around. Tell him that we're friends or some other bullshit. Blake talked softly, his voice carrying easily in the stillness. 
He was halfway through speaking when the soldier began to turn. In his hand was something other than his penis. The small gun spat twice, and then the trees started to rain soldiers. From the canopy overhead, PLA special forces dropped down around them. Big Ben Jackson turned, and though he was a formidable soldier, he faced a man even taller than he. The big broad face creased in a gap-toothed grin, and then a leg as thick as a tree trunk shot out in a pile-driver blow to strike him in the chest and fling him back into the trees. Rhino moved to engage. The big hawk and the bigger Chinese soldier traded rapid blows, and each blocked many. The huge hawk was far superior to Jackson, and let fly with a single lunge punch that sounded like a mallet on clay. The Chinese giant staggered, but shook a head the size of a watermelon, and then Gap grinned again. He came at Rhino in a spin, a person that big having no right to be so quick and nimble. Rhino blocked the first kick, but a backhanded blow was already rounding on him. The fist that connected with his temple was the size of a dinner plate, and his oversized hands had calluses that were rock-hard across the knuckles and palm edges. Rhino went down on one knee, his head swimming. No one had ever hit him that hard in his life. He knew he was as good as dead. Once he lost focus in combat for even a split second, the killing blow soon came. In the seconds between consciousness and oblivion, he remembered what Hammerson had said to him when he was recruited. Hawks didn't die of old age. Rhino now knew. Hawks died like this. Chapter 45 The first bullet punched into Casey's right pectoral, spinning her and making the second one miss. In her armored suit, she knew only a headshot could have been counted on to take her down for good. As it was, the impact would deaden her shoulder, but she ignored it as she had long learned to live with pain. She rolled and came up fast, seeing Blake and Rhino engaging in combat, and the big McMurdo soldier Jackson already on the ground and struggling to breathe. The PLA seemed to be appearing from everywhere and she had walked them right into it. Fucking amateur hour, she thought. Her hawks she wasn't worried about, but she knew she had left Amy and Sung without cover. The pissing soldier who had shot her was coming at her fast. He was big, with eyes that were black as coal. There was no hint of anything other than determination to finish her off. Fuck you, she spun, sweeping one of her legs around, taking him off his feet and sending his gun flying. A punch to her ear suddenly told her that she wasn't fighting just one man. She dived and rolled and came up in front of the first PLA soldier, who was now back on his feet. He was half a head taller and trained to solid muscle. She backed to the side, trying to keep both of her attackers in view. Casey excelled at unarmed combat, and in a number of different disciplines, all blended into a style created just for the Hawks, termed RADET, Rapid Debilitation Technique. Most maneuvers were lethal, and she had been trained for fighting multiple opponents. But for each kick or punch she and her combatants threw, the other would block it, and would in turn direct ever more furious punches, strikes, and kicks back towards the other. Casey gritted her teeth, becoming ever more infuriated. Unwaveringly, the two soldiers betrayed nothing. No surprise, fear, pain. They never grunted, made a noise, or changed their expression. It was like she fought robots. Seems they've picked up their training, she thought. Though her focus was supreme, she became aware of a whistle, and then it was like the combat changed up a level. The PLA to her left kicked out, pushing her back. She blocked it, but immediately felt a jarring impact to her spine. The blow wasn't meant to do anything other than knock her forward again into the flying boot of the first guy. Casey saw stars, 
her head swimming for a few seconds, before she came up with a blade in her hand, blinking away watering eyes and a streaming bloody nose. When her world cleared, she found she was alone. Her opponents had left the field. Jackson was rubbing his neck and helping a groggy rhino to his feet. Blake was walking back towards her, also wiping blood from his lip. They're gone. There was a whistle and they just vanished. Casey grimaced from the pain and felt her nose and eye socket. It was raw and hurt like a bitch, but the eye orbital wasn't shattered. A signal. Something changed, or they... She spun. Shit! She sprinted back to where they had left Amy, Sung, and Jennifer. Jennifer was face down on the boggy ground. Casey knelt and flipped her over. Thankfully, the woman was breathing, and her eyes opened slowly. Wah! <sighs> the others crowded around. Easy, you okay? Casey sat her up, ripping her canteen from her pouch and tipping it into the McMurdo woman's mouth. Jennifer nodded. They came from the jungle. She looked up, her mind seeming to clear. Where are they? She spun one way and then the other. Amy and Sung, they took them. Casey gritted her teeth. Hagel jogged back in. They're gone. Casey looked up at him. He didn't have a scratch. Her eyes blazed, but she kept her mouth shut for now. She turned. Rhino! She turned to the big man, who still looked groggy. Get your head back in the game. We're going after them now. No, we're not. Hagel stood his ground, looking down on Casey as she held Jennifer's shoulder. He shook his head. You just made bad decision number 110. As far as I'm concerned, you're done. He leaned his rifle against a trunk. You fucking walked us right into it. Hagel looked up at Rhino and then to Blake. They could have mowed us all down. Just as well they decided to pull back or we'd be food for whatever goddamn thing it is that's ghosting us down here. Casey rose slowly to her feet, feeling her adrenaline start to pump. Rhino winced. Hagel, come on, man. This is not the time. Not the time to be ambushed, Hagel snorted. We're fucking hawks. No one, but no one, gets the jump on us. He grinned, turning to Rhino. Unless we have an incompetent leading us. Ah, oh, fuck. Rhino looked skyward. You want to be the daddy now? That it, Hagel? Casey sneered, but her brow dropped. Maybe I should be, he said evenly. Before anyone could blink, Casey had her glock pointed between the man's eyes. Insubordination in field. Only one way to deal with that. Boss, Rhino grimaced. All mouth. Just what I thought. Hagel didn't blink as he stared back into the gun's muzzle. Takes more than a gun to be a leader. He leaned forward slightly. Certainly not a job for a coward. He grinned. Casey chuckled. Oh, boy. She stared down at the ground for a moment before letting her gun drop. She then lifted her rifle from her shoulders and let that drop beside it. Next went her knives. Time for some education. Ben Jackson put one large hand to his head. Now? You're going to do this now? Hagel turned back, a grim smile on his face. He started to pull and drop his own weapons. No weapons, no rank, no report. Just you, me, and your big fucking mouth... It's going to be full of broken teeth in about ten seconds, Casey said, keeping her gaze leveled at the young hawk. I'm going to enjoy this, you little freak. Casey got into a crouch and began to circle. Hagel did the same. Are you too mad? 
Jennifer Hartigan was on her feet. She turned to Ranofsky. Stop them. Make them stop. He shook his head. Bad blood. Gotta be sorted. Hegel came in fast. He fainted one way and then threw two flat-handed strikes at Casey's face. She blocked them both and returned her own, her fist flicking out, and Hegel just pulling back by fractions. Both swung, dodged, and kicked out. But this was only the prelude, the sizing up, and it soon ended. They engaged. The two hawks came together in an explosion of furious blows. Every part of their body, every hard or sharp edge, was a formidable weapon. Each hawk warrior was trained to be an ultimate combatant, fearless in attack and near impervious to pain. The sound of reinforced knuckles against armor plates was as loud as the punches were hard. Both fighters knew that a full strike of that force to a vulnerable area would be devastating or even lethal. Regardless, neither of them pulled their punches. The pair broke apart momentarily. Both were now streaming perspiration and blood. They sucked in the humid air of the jungle. Casey's scar lifted her face into its usual sneer. She knew that both of them were fast, well-trained, and could give and take a killer punch. But she felt calm, her heartbeat barely rising over resting normal. She knew she could withstand whatever Hegel dished out. Her heart was like iron, and so was her jaw. She looked Hegel up and down, assessing him again. He was younger, bigger at just on 6'2", and weighing in at around 220 pounds. His physique was iron hard through training and a tough special forces existence. Casey was four inches shorter and many pounds lighter. But anyone who had seen her stripped down attested to a body that had obviously navigated years of pain. She had bullet holes, a zipper stitching of old scars, burns, and flaring tattoos, all over muscles that bulged without an ounce of fat. Pain was her friend and fighting was an equation. When facing a skilled opponent, for her it came down to two elements of that equation. Who could take the most pain and who had the most experience? She smiled because that would be her. She decided on her next move. Hegel's reach was longer, so she needed to be behind that reach. To do that meant taking a risk, and she took it. Casey lunged straight at Hegel. He threw his arms up, but then flicked out one fist to lash across her jaw. It connected, hard. A lesser opponent would have been rocked back on their heels, or maybe even felled. Casey expected it, planned for it, and took the impact on her jaw. As Hegel's arm continued on its swing, she had what she wanted. She was close to her goal and under his reach. In a lightning-fast strike, she struck out at his throat. Her hand was open, and she caught his larynx between her thumb and forefingers. His windpipe collapsed, the cartilage closing off. The bigger man coughed and staggered back. Only his training kept him focused, as his hands never dropped. But Casey knew now his oxygen was cut off. In seconds, his overstrained body would burn through his reserves, and first his head would begin to pound, and then his vision would swim. Once that occurred, no matter how hyper-trained you were, oxygen panic would start to short-circuit the system. Casey nodded into the man's eyes, letting him know it was over. Either he surrendered, or she would enjoy putting him down. Hegel made his choice and came at her, his teeth showing through split lips, his eyes manic and white, framed by slick, bloody features. Such was the depths of the man's hatred for her. He staggered as he came. Casey dodged his clumsy attack and used his own body weight to throw him over one of her legs. Hegel landed on the ground with Casey immediately on top of him. She started to pound down, blow after blow, her reinforced knuckle plates smashing bone and shredding flesh. Enough! Rhino tried to drag her off, but she wasn't done, her bloodlust not yet sated. 
The two gunshots were loud in the near tomb silence of the jungle. The bioluminescent light overhead immediately went out. Casey froze. The seconds ticked by, and then gradually the bioluminescent creatures on the roof of the massive cave overcame their timidity and started to glow once again. The twilight gloom returned. Jennifer stood holding Casey's Glock, the barrel pointed in the air. Underneath Casey, Hegel gasped like a fish out of water. She quickly reached down and gripped his throat at the area of the compression, squeezed, and then tugged hard, pulling the cartilage back into place. It had hurt like a bitch and would swell back up, but at least he'd be able to breathe. Hegel dragged in two huge breaths and then groaned. Oh, shit, Rhino said. Around them, it was as if the jungle had fallen into a vacuum. Casey slowly stood up from the man's chest, wiping the blood and gore from her hands on her pants. She waited. Renofsky's face was lit by a small box he had pulled from his belt. He held it up and turned slowly. He frowned down at the small tracker. Boss, what have you got? Casey asked evenly. Movement, boss, plenty of it. Rhino said without looking up. Blake led Jennifer in closer, and Jackson joined them, looking at the small device in Rhino's hand. Incoming? Casey walked away from Hagel's prone form and took the gun from Jennifer's hand. As she holstered the weapon, she noticed that the McMurdo medic had blanched at her frightful appearance. Casey half smiled and turned away to collect her knives and rifle from the ground. I'm right here, Rhino. Talk to me. Multiple signatures, too many to fully register. They're big and small, but get this, they're all moving away, disappearing off the grid. Casey grunted. They're going to ground. She turned slowly and scanned the dark, dripping growth surrounding them. Making noise down here... You might as well have just rung the dinner bell. She growled. Fucking distraction. She turned back to where Hegel lay. I should have just shot you, you bag of... The man was gone. What the fuck? Casey spun. Where'd that asshole go? Jennifer put a hand over her nose. That smell is back, just like in the caves. She started to back up, looking like she was going to bolt. Grab her! Casey pointed, and Blake lunged at the woman, gripping her arm. Casey quickly went to where Hegel had been laying. The mosses and lichen mats were flattened, and so was a glistening path leading into the underbrush. Hegel! Jennifer screamed. Hegel! She strained against Blake's hands, her eyes wide. We have to go after him. That's just what it wants, Casey said softly scanning the jungle with her gun up. I don't like this, Ben Jackson backed in towards them. Casey looked from the grass to the shrinking group. He's gone. He wouldn't walk out and leave his rifle. She nodded towards it. Rhino, get that weapon. We're out of here. I heard that, Rhino said, picking up the gun, his eyes on the jungle. Go after Dr. Weir, boss? No, we head for the signal, she pointed. It's where the Chinese will be going. Maybe we can get the jump on them. We stay fast and stay tight. She turned and vanished into the jungle, the others at her heels. Chapter 46 Time, 8 hours, 7 minutes, 12 seconds, until fleet convergence. I'm sorry, Sung whispered to Amy, whose hands were tied together in front of her. A length of rope tethered her to the giant Chinese soldier in front. Amy snorted. I don't exactly remember, but when was it that we had you tied up? She scoffed. Must be a cultural thing, huh? Sung shook her head. 
I trust you, but they do not. I told Captain Yang that you didn't take their men, that it was something else, something down here already, and that you know what it is. She stared hard at Amy. They could have killed all of you. I stopped them. Amy snorted. Do you have any idea what they're triggering by going after the American submarine? Do you really think that they're going to be allowed to walk out of here with the technology? She shook her head. Not that any of us is going to walk out of here. Sung sped up slightly, leaving Amy behind. There could be war, Amy said forcefully to Sung's hunched shoulders. The Chinese woman half turned. You can talk to my friend. Shen Jung Ching. Damn right I'll talk to him. That's why I'm here, Amy said. But Sung had threaded her way around the giant Mungoi, who turned to grin and tug a little harder on her rope. Yang led them towards a small camp, or rather an area of flattened foliage in among the tangled jungle. Sung ran to Shen Jung Ching. Amy recognized the scientist immediately from Hammerson's profile picture. The pair embraced warmly. Shen Jung reached up to tenderly brush strands of hair from her face, and Amy now knew why Sung had so eagerly wanted to come with them. Sung spoke rapidly, and Shen Jung's face creased into a frown. His eyes lifted to Amy. Untie her! He spoke loudly, but Yang ignored him. Mungoi continued to stand like a colossus, hanging on to Amy's leash like she was a pet dog. Amy held up her bound wrists. Do you mind? She spoke directly to Yang. I'm not going to run off into the jungle by myself, and I think you know why. Yang shook his head and turned back to his conversation with one of his men. Amy let her breath hiss out from between clenched teeth. She turned to Shen Jung. You know what? We came down here for you, to warn you that there is a potential global conflict happening over our heads. I was sent as a diplomat, a spokesperson. If you ever manage to find your way out, which is unlikely, you'll find something a lot different than diplomats waiting for you. Yang, overhearing, finally turned, his lips a thin line. We are not afraid of you. This century belongs to China, Dr. Weir. He looked Amy up and down for a second or two and smirked. And we cannot go back, because Dr. Sung Chin Ling has informed us that you blew up our base. His face was like stone. She also tells me that you may know another way out. I agreed not to kill your people, because she convinced me that you would help us find that path back out. But if you won't, then I am more than happy to finish my job. Amy stared for a moment. Listen, that wasn't us. That was your own people that set your base to self-destruct. And by the way, one of your men ambushed and killed our captain. Yang's lips pursed. Only your captain? Shame. Amy growled under her breath. She turned back to Shen Jung. You fools, you're in danger. I know your soldiers are going missing. So are ours. You sense it out there. I know you do. It's the other thing I needed to warn you about. What really lives down here? Lives down here? Shen Jung looked from Amy to Sung. Behind them, Yang edged closer. There's a reason this place is off limits. It's unsafe. Amy waited. Yang's eyes narrowed, but they slid to Sung. Sung's brows were knitted. There is something in the caves. And now, maybe down here with us. No maybe about it. Amy tugged on her rope. It's big, smart, and hungry, and we're right in its goddamn backyard. 
She nodded to their weapons. And you guys might as well have pea shooters for all the good they'll do. We are not that easily tricked, Yang said evenly. We have seen nothing. He looked away quickly. Shen Zhong's head snapped around to Yang. But you did. The scouts went missing to turn up massacred. And then just hours back, I saw nothing! Yang's voice boomed. He pointed a fist at Amy. Nothing but what the Americans wanted me to see. Oh, bullshit! Amy spat the words back at him and tugged angrily on the rope. You're going to walk everyone right into the jaws of death, literally. Yang's lip curled. An American trick, denied by an American spy, sent to divert us. Yang held up a hand. We will complete our mission, secure the site of the derelict submarine, and then Dr. Weir will show us the way out. Anger began to burn within Amy and it blew apart any diplomacy she had planned. Your mission? Her jaw jutted and she lifted her head. You think you can take ownership of American property? She smiled at the way his head turned to her a fraction. That's right. That derelict submarine is the sea shadow. You try and even set foot on it, and there'll be war, and one you can't win. Yang sauntered closer. You still think you can win a war with us? He threw his head back and barked out a single laugh. Our cyber technologists will shut down your launch programs before they even start. He leered at her. By the time you figure out what went wrong, your country will be ash. Amy lunged at him. You fucking... Yang's backhand knocked her down. Shen Zhong and Sung rushed to her, shielding her, but Amy pushed them away and wiped her mouth. You weak son of a bitch. You're as good as dead and don't even know it. One by one, either in the next few minutes or hours, the thing down here will catch you, rip you to shreds, and you won't be able to do anything about it. You can't even hide because it will find you, dig you out, and rip walls apart to get at you. She felt exhausted, beaten. Forget the submarine. We need to be gone from here, and we need much better defenses. At least combine your forces with the Hawks. That way we might, just might, be able to make it. Yang tilted his head. So it's our supplies, ammunition, and protection you need. If you think we will assist your team, you are wrong. Amy's head dropped for a moment. We're all going to die. She looked up slowly, turning to Sung. Make sure you stay in the center of the group. Don't lag behind. Predators always pick off the stragglers first. Amy exhaled in exasperation. She suddenly realized that she had failed. She followed the thought. If she failed, then there was no turning the Chinese back from trying to get to the submarine. The future was set, and there would be justification for conflict. War. Millions would die, and she was here, and Joshua up there. She felt a cramp in her stomach at the thought of him being alone. Ho! Yang pointed, and the team marched on. The gunshots jerked Alex back to his senses. They were close, and he recognized the sound of the handgun. A Glock 22, plastic casing, feather light with a lot of punch, and an excellent weapon for wet environments. It was a jungle weapon, and also part of the Hawk arsenal. He slowed as he burst into a clearing and skidded to a stop. The trees were flattened, some of them with trunks a half dozen feet across, and others sunk deep into the soft ground as if something heavy had pushed into the jungle and rested there. 
There was a coating of ammoniac slime over everything that hung in the air like a stinging mist. Alex eased back into the tree line, wary. He knew that the nightmare predator that stalked and probably attacked his people was the most successful and inventive monstrosity that he had ever faced. His best chance of survival, everyone's best chance of survival, was to simply avoid it. Alex let the vines fall in front of him and remained motionless. Amy had once told him that cephalopods had acute vision that was triggered by movement. He just let his eyes travel over the foliage of the hundred feet of crushed plants and the canopy and edges, looking for anything, no matter how camouflaged, that might have hinted at its presence. Alex's enhanced vision could pick up details at a granular level and also allowed perfect sight in night-black environments that was well beyond normal human vision. He could also see thermal variations. If something was warmer or colder than its surroundings, he would know it. After another moment, he stepped out and walked a few paces into the clearing. There was something black and glistening red, incongruous among the mud browns and drab greens. He quickly moved to it, snatching it up. He recognized it. He wore the same thing. It was an armored hawk suit, its ceramic plating and Kevlar weave tough enough to withstand a shotgun blast. But here it was torn apart like paper. It was coated with streaks of blood and gore. The creature had taken at least one of the hawks, had peeled them out of the suit, and he could guess what happened after that. He dropped the armor, its obliterated remnants making it impossible to even guess who it had belonged to. Alex wiped his hands. They were sticky, as the blood hadn't fully coagulated. It was minutes fresh. Both his team and the thing were close by. Come on, guys. Hammerson would have made you read the reports, he whispered. You know what you're up against. Alex reached out again. He could still sense the huge presence, but it was further out now and moving away. He grabbed for his signal finder, quickly checking the readout and then cursing. The predator was headed in the same direction he needed to go and the direction he bet his hawks had gone. Damn it, it's tracking them. Alex! He turned at Kate's voice and stepped in front of the bloody debris. Stay there. She froze, wheezing, her face beat red. What is it? She gasped. I can smell, phew, cat pee. Ammonia, it exudes it, allows it to leave the water without drying out. This thing, is it your kraken? My kraken? Alex turned to face the cliffs. Yeah, my kraken, he whispered. He imagined the beast pursuing the hawks, or maybe traveling parallel to their position, staying just out of sight, its huge, boneless body keeping compressed and low, flowing around and over the trees and foliage, like a slimy, muscular wave, as it kept them in sight, staying close to its food or its new toys. Kate looked from the massive depression in the foliage and then up at him, her eyes round. This big? There's nothing like this in the fossil record. Yes, there is. According to one of the scientists who was with us, it was called an orthocone. Kate frowned, looking around again. Camerocirrus, orthoconic cephalopods, I know them. They were the apex predator of their time. But that was during the Ordovician period, hundreds of millions of years ago. And they only grew to about thirty feet max. She waved an arm around at the flattened trees. This thing must have been... Her lips compressed. Hundreds of feet. 
her brow creased even further. And it had a large conical shell, like some sort of mollusk. Alex kept his eyes on the jungle. Seems it had plenty of time to evolve. It's still the apex predator, but it's developed a whole bunch of new skills. He looked around. It only used the shell in the water and could leave it behind when it wanted to pursue us into the caves. It was able to flatten its body, get into the smallest of crevices, flowing almost like liquid. And it was a mimic, a very good mimic. He looked at her. She was frowning as she listened, but nodded. Many creatures, and certainly many cephalopods, can mimic their surroundings, or even other animal shapes, in a fashion. Not like this thing, Alex responded. It could create near-perfect images of our people. Once it had ingested them, it could become them. That's impossible. She turned away, arms folded. That's what I would have said, before. He sighed and looked past her towards the dark sea. Maybe it felt it only needed the shell in the water. Maybe your leviathan friends out there caused it to retain its armor. Got a weakness, after all. He wondered how he could use this, but quickly gave up. We've got to hurry. There were gunshots. Alex looked down at her, wishing he could leave her behind, but knowing that would spell her death. Urgency now coiled within him. Kate, we need to try and catch up with my team. Kate nodded, and her mouth curled down. Boy, oh boy, what I wouldn't give to catch a glimpse of this thing. No, Alex said softly. If it was close enough for us to see, we'd be dead or just become part of its cat-and-mouse torture game. We're going to stay as far away from this thing as we can. He grabbed hold of her shoulders. But if we do see it, I'm just hoping it's long before it sees us. Warm bodies, with plenty of non-biological elements. Gotta be our PLA friends. Rhino held up the reader, turning slightly. Multiple signatures, all about the same size and all stationary. Jackson grunted. Not gonna let these guys get the jump on me again. Rhino leaned back. Don't feel too bad. These guys are robots, trained to be lethal since they were kids. We can take them, but that might mean permanent takedown. Not a great option while they've got Dr. Weir. He exhaled. And the last thing we want to be doing is starting a war that we were sent to stop in the first place. Casey came back in and crouched. Blake and Jennifer joined them. Fifty feet, directly in front. They're not moving. Ambush? Jackson asked. If it's an ambush, it's a strange one. Casey's lip curled. Nah, unlikely. We've seen the concealment techniques these guys have used. They wouldn't just be hanging it out there in the open. She looked around. Better scan for claymores, or anything else they could use for booby traps. I don't think so, boss, Rhino said. That big guy could have taken me out clean. He didn't. I don't think that's what they wanted. Maybe they want to talk, Blake said. Let me go in. Not a fucking chance, Casey spat back. Attention, Hawk Special Forces Operative Casey Franks. What the fuck? Casey's head jerked around. Hawk Special Forces Operative Casey Franks. Operative Hank Rinofsky. Operative Vincent Blake. Soldiers Jennifer Hartigan and Benjamin Jackson. Come forward. We will not harm you. Casey turned to the group, her teeth clamped tight. No secrets in hell, huh? Rhino said to Blake. The voice drifted back to them again. You are outgunned, outnumbered, and we have your chief scientist. Lower your weapons. 
We just wish to talk. All eyes were on Casey. She got to her feet. Jackson, you come with me. Jennifer, stay put. Rhino, Blake, left and right flank. She looked up at Jackson. Stay on my shoulder and stay cool. Rhino grinned at the big McMurdo soldier. You just got a promotion, big fella, cause you're expendable. Jackson grinned back. That's the nicest thing anyone ever said to me. Casey cradled her gun and pushed through the broad fronds and hair-like foliage of the blue-tinged jungle. Chapter 47 Casey stood just inside the line of hanging vines, watching the two men in the clearing. Rising up behind them, nearly invisible in the gloom, was the cliff wall and the source of the signal. Somewhere at its base, or even inside, their goal resided. So close, she thought. She looked back at the men. There was the brutal black-eyed soldier, their leader, she assumed, one of the men she had briefly fought only just before. Behind him was the giant she had seen take down Jackson and Rinovsky. The massive soldier didn't look human, and she assumed he was afflicted by something like acromegaly, the gigantism syndrome. His features were big and broad to the point of being ogreish, but instead of the lumbering gait she would have expected from someone like that, he moved fluidly, athletically. She knew he'd be a problem. Peeking out behind him was Amy Weir. By the way Amy held her shoulders, she guessed her hands were tied. Showtime. Casey grit her teeth and stepped forward. She knew that though Amy wasn't being used as a shield, her proximity meant going in shooting was not an option. She also bet that the other PLA soldiers were close by, and a single word from their leader would bring them from the trees and trap doors. The soldier in front of her stood at ease, his hands clasped behind his back. He brought a hand around, making Casey brace, but it was empty. He motioned her forward. Hawk Casey Franks! Casey waited, watching. What now? Jackson whispered. Now? Now we join the party. Casey continued in, her gun cradled. The soldier smiled, but the lift of his lips never reached his blank eyes. I am Captain Wu Yang of the PLA Special Forces, Dragon Brigade. You are Casey Franks of the American Special Forces, Hawks. He half turned. Your chief scientist speaks very highly of you. She tells me we need you and your team's expertise to survive. He chuckled and looked around. In this strange and savage place. You bet you do, Casey said. I think I do, he nodded. But I do not think I need you, though I do think we need your armaments. However... I am generous. Hand over your weapons and join us. It makes sense for us to combine under my leadership. I outrank you, Lieutenant. Not in my army, pal. Casey didn't flinch. Yang smiled grimly. We could have killed you all, many times. Please don't make me regret that decision. We're just going to find what we came here to find, and we'll take Dr. Weir back. No one gets hurt, no one wastes time, energy, or ammunition. Then we all go home. Go home? His expression hardened. I believe you shut that door and killed our people. His arms dropped to his sides. He spoke a few words in Chinese, and the giant turned to put a large hand on Amy's shoulder and pull her forward. Yang took hold of Amy and looked into her face for a few seconds. I know you Americans very well, 
You value the individual, where we in China have learned to value the whole. One life is worth nothing. He gripped Amy by the hair, dragging her head to one side. Amy grimaced, but never made a sound. I won't ask you again. His eyes slid back to Casey. Casey's jaws clenched briefly. We all know where this is going. Let's just get to it. Yang turned. Last time. Casey didn't want a firefight, not while Amy was so close. She needed to make some space. I could have kicked your ass. Still might. She needed more time. Her eyes traveled to the giant. How about I chop Dumbo down to size first? Yang stared for a moment, perhaps not believing what he was hearing from the woman. His face broke into a grin, and then he started to laugh. He half turned to speak a few words to the giant. In return, the big man's eyes widened momentarily, before he too started to laugh, the sound like two buzzsaw blades grating together. Jackson leaned forward. Maybe I should take that guy on, you know, because... Casey half turned, snarling. Because you're a man, huh? Listen, Boy Scout, he already handed you your ass once. I can take him. You haven't got a chance. The huge PLA soldier leaned down towards Yang and spoke in a deep, slow voice. Yang listened, grunted, and then nodded. His name is Mungoi. Maybe if you defeat him in unarmed combat, I might let you live. If not, he grinned, you won't be here to know about it. Yang let Amy's hair go and clapped his hands once. Trial by combat. Yes, this is appropriate for warriors. You have my permission to kill him, if you can. He turned and spoke rapidly to Mungoi, and the huge man grinned, his eyes sliding to Casey. And he has my permission to kill you. Yang clicked his fingers, and his men came from the trees. Several escorted Blake, Renovsky, and Jennifer. Ah, fuck! Casey felt her spirit sink. Yang ordered them tied up, the same with Jackson. All their weapons and provisions were taken and piled before them. You really must update your concealment techniques. He smiled without humor. Good. Now we are all here as witnesses. If at any time, Casey Franks, you wish to retire before you are beaten, I'm sure Mungoi will be happy to fight your replacement. He chortled and spoke again to the giant PLA soldier. Mungoi nodded vigorously. Yang turned back to Casey. Perhaps he could fight you all at once if you're feeling a bit nervous. Casey bowled her fists. Never had she wanted to break someone in half so bad. She wanted to rip through the big dummy and then wipe the floor with Yang. Her problem was her people were unarmed and Yang's soldiers were fully armed. She doubted that she would be spared even if she were victorious. She had no choice, and deep inside she didn't want one. She just wanted to fight. Alex could sense the huge presence close by, but couldn't get a fix on where it was. It felt like it was in front of him, behind him, and all around him. Maybe it was just the terrain. Maybe this might have been the killing field or foraging ground for the creature before, and that's what made its presence loom so large. He also sensed the bodies up ahead. People, and he knew now it was his team, as there was one he could feel more strongly than all others. His heart rate kicked up a notch, not from any sort of adrenaline kick, but from the thought of seeing her again. Amy. Amy Weir. It could only be her. 
Alex was torn between his excitement at her being so close and also his outrage at her decision to leave Joshua behind. He needed to understand why she had abandoned their son. For this. Alex bulldozed through some clinging vines. For the first time in years, he felt something strange, a nervousness that he found both worrying and exhilarating. There was a grunt from behind, and Kate called out. He ground his teeth and spun, indecision momentarily racking him. He needed speed, but with the thing lurking somewhere close by, leaving Kate behind was out of the question. Alex sprinted back to her and lifted her. Keep your head down. It's here. Kate looked shocked, and then tucked her head into the crook of his neck. Alex turned and accelerated, holding one elbow up in front of them and smashing through the foliage, faster and then faster again. His neck tingled. Just out of sight, something heavy slid through the undergrowth. Plants were pushed aside or flattened as it kept pace, or perhaps only part of it needed to follow them. Alex felt like they were small prey, being hunted down. Or worse, they were being herded exactly where it wanted. Bring the pain. Casey advanced. Mungoy made fists and brought one trunk-like leg forward and stamped it down hard. He then went through a few karate katas, a detailed pattern of combat movements. For a big man, he was fluid and controlled, not what Casey wanted to see. She knew how to fight bigger opponents. She was tall for a woman, but in her game, some of the players were more than a head taller. This guy happened to be twice that, but the basic rules still applied. Big guys were blind to overhand bomb punches. They never expected to be hit down upon. She would leap in the air and punch down at him. She would also go to his body, use front kicks, and try and get inside his huge reach. But it was a risk. His arms were as thick as her thighs. If he got hold of her, it'd be all over. Finally, if possible, she would need to get him on the ground. Once there, everything was even. Casey knew her training was superior, and she would be much faster. It'd have to be enough. She sucked in a huge breath and breathed out evenly through her nose. She felt calm. She felt good. She attacked. She darted in and immediately ducked under a swinging arm that created a breeze over her head. She punched out twice, hard and fast, into his kidneys. Mungoy didn't flinch. The man had a layer of fat and slab-like muscle running around his torso. She came back again, this time fainting one way and then coming back lightning quick to shoot out a kick with her armored boot straight at his knee. His legs might have been able to support thousands of pounds, but the kneecap, if forced back on itself, was surprisingly weak. Her leg flicked out, but before she could complete her full motion, Mungoy braced himself, her boot bouncing off the bent forward limb, and then a backhand blow caught her on the ear. She staggered. The huge PLA soldier's fist was half as big as her head and had raised knuckles like knobs of rock. Her head rang like a bell, and her ear immediately felt wet. She shook her head to clear it, and was relieved to feel she hadn't lost balance and could still hear. That meant the eardrum wasn't perforated, and it was probably just the cartilage and flesh that had been smashed. Mungoy advanced, and Casey backed up. She edged to one side, then the next. But every time she shifted, so did he. The bigger man was boxing her in. Fuck it, Casey thought. The big asshole is trying to reduce my field of movement. Can't let him corner me, or I've had it. She then saw her opening. Mungoy kept his arms low, exposing his head and neck. She needed to come in over the top. 
She mentally went through her movements. Spring forward, jink left, then leap high and bring the two large knuckles of her right fist down hard against his temple, where the skull bone was thinnest. Casey looked into the giant's eyes, grinned, and then flew at him. She sidestepped left, away from his lunging blow, and then leapt high. Everything went to plan, except for the lightning-fast blow that knocked her from the air, and also the wind from her lungs. Casey landed hard, but rolled fast, and just as she sprung back to her feet, a massive boot flew in a back kick to strike her spine. She felt the impact from her kidneys to her fingertips, and then he was on her. Mungoy lifted Casey up a few feet by the rear collar of her armored suit and punched the back of her head. She thumped down onto the ground. He kicked her ribs, cracking several, and then reached down to lift her again, punching her in the gut. The breath whooshed from her lungs, and her shocked diaphragm refused to draw another breath in. She was winded and becoming dizzy. Blake and Ranofsky strained at their ropes, yelling in fury. Jennifer had stopped watching, her face turned away, while Jackson worked furiously at his bonds. Amy simply watched, her fists balled. Mungoy held on to the shattered hawk and briefly grinned at the bound Americans. Casey felt him change his grip, holding her now by the neck and lifting, her feet coming free of the ground. He turned her one way, then the other, studying her like a shooter looks at a downed partridge, examining his future meal. The huge PLA soldier then looked down at the ground, searching for a few seconds. He found what he sought, and threw Casey to the dirt like an old sack. He said a few words to Yang, and then waited for his captain's response. Last chance, Lieutenant Casey Franks, Yang said. Casey turned and tried to sit up, but couldn't. The pain in her body was near unbearable, and she could only manage to turn her bloody face towards the PLA captain and rasp out a few hoarse words. Fuck you! Yang shrugged and nodded to Mungoy, a small smile on his lips. Mungoy reached down and picked up a damp log. It was big, six feet long and about two wide. The big man strained under its weight grunting as he lifted it. He turned it around, holding the stump end over Casey's face. He lifted it pile-driver style, holding it momentarily. Do it! Casey screamed the words up at the giant. The log came down. Chapter 48 Alex launched himself from the tree line to appear before the colossal soldier, so fast it probably seemed he simply materialized. He caught the huge stump in mid-drop and stood, legs spread over Casey. Yeah! Ranofsky yelled, straining at his bonds. Alex had never seen a human being so large, and the strength in the giant's arms was insanely strong. Casey groaned underneath him, and the giant tried to wrench the log free, obviously wanting to continue the job of crushing the downed soldier. Alex took it all in. His captured hawks, Casey broken at his feet, and Amy pale and bound. He looked back at the giant. The man's wide-spaced eyes moved from surprise to glaring with anger. He bared huge yellow teeth, and then jerked hard on the log, trying to tear it from Alex's grip. Casey groaned beneath him, and Alex felt the urge to do more than just disarm the man, and there was nothing now constraining him. He wrenched the log from the soldier's hands and smashed it into the large head, once, twice, and then three times, the third blow splitting his face from brow to chin. The giant blinked in confusion as the gash ran red. Alex held the log in one hand and grabbed the huge soldier's collar, pulling his face down and close to his own. 
He stared into the wide-spaced eyes, almost nose to nose, and Alex had no words for him, just a low growl. Alex could see something deep in the man's black eyes, pain, confusion, and fear. Behind Alex, someone was yelling orders, and one of the other PLA ran at them. Alex heard the sound of a blade coming free of a sheath, and Alex spun, throwing the log at the man with enough force to knock him backwards. The sound of cracking and splintering came from inside the man's body, not the wood. Alex then turned back to the giant, his hands gripping the front of his uniform. The soldier had reached up to encircle Alex's neck with hands that fully wrapped around his throat. His forearms bulged with the pressure he exerted, and his gap-toothed grin appeared once again, but this time his huge mouth was full of blood from his facial wounds. The huge man's powerful arms and hands strained as he dragged Alex closer. His bloody mouth began to open, and Alex guessed he planned to take a piece from his face, probably his nose. In close quarters combat, debilitating the bridge of the nose around the upper septum made the eyes water uncontrollably. It would blind him. The bloody mouth opened wider as the giant dragged Alex closer. Alex straightened his arms, pushing the big man back. One inch, two, a foot and then he paused momentarily to grin into the broad face before yanking him forward fast, headbutting him so hard the huge soldier fell back like a tree trunk, out cold before he even hit the ground. Alex looked down at Casey. The female hawk was barely conscious. On your feet, soldier! Panicked orders were screamed from all around him, and he turned to see a senior officer looking bewildered, and Amy, Amy Weir, staring and sinking down to be in a sitting position on the ground, her face white. The senior Chinese officer reacted fast, pulling his revolver and firing. The bullet struck Alex's shoulder, knocking him to the ground. The PLA captain then moved quickly, dragging Amy to her feet, and grinding the muzzle of his gun into her temple. But instead of rising, Alex stayed down, and he turned to the near impenetrable mad tangle of plant life. He stared just beyond the hanging foliage, beyond the physical wall of the jungle, and he knew it was too late. It was coming. He could sense its approach like the feeling of static in the air when a huge storm front is building. He couldn't see it yet, but he followed his instincts until he came to a darker alcove among the hanging fronds. A figure silently appeared. Blake also stared for several seconds. I don't fucking believe it. His voice sounded incredulous. Hegel. Fucking Hegel. That's impossible. To the group, it looked like the young hawk. Same uniform, height, and features. Just a hint of a wet sheen glistened over his face and body. But Alex saw past the camouflage. He saw the deadness emanating from it. There was no mammalian warmth, just the coldness of a creature that belonged deep in an ocean trench or even deeper in his nightmares. Alex spoke without turning. Franks, when I give the word, get the others free. For now, don't move a muscle. Casey nodded slowly, her eyes fixed on Hegel. Blood covered her face, and her wounds probably stung like a bitch, but she remained calm and immobile. Alex just hoped the bindings of his team would also keep them in place, because he knew the one sure thing to trigger an attack was movement. The PLA captain let go of Amy and began to scream orders to his giant soldier, Mungoy. The huge man got groggily to his feet as guns came up, but it was like the silence of the strange jungle became more intense, building energy, as if they had all been dropped into the eye of a cyclone. 
Oh, God, no. Amy started to back away from the figure that stood motionless in the dark. Sung reached out to grab her and used a small knife to slit the bonds at her wrists. The Chinese captain raised his gun again and fired twice into the Hegel figure. There was no response or even any apparent wounds. To the senior soldier, he couldn't have been sure if he missed or whether the greasy-looking hawk had body armor. He turned and yelled at his huge warrior and urged the man on. Mungoi spat blood and then wiped one arm up and down over his split face. His glare went momentarily to Alex, who he really wanted to rain hell on, and then back to Hegel. He grunted, his unnaturally large jaw jutting. He staggered forward, his bear-like arms outstretched and fingers flexing. When he had only taken a few steps, Hegel shot forward, not leaping forward or running or diving, but instead it was as if he were on a spring, a projectile being fired at the huge soldier. Hegel smacked into Mungoy, knocking him back a few feet. The dull, wet thud was loud in the small clearing. The huge soldier didn't go down. Alex knew he couldn't have if he tried. He seemed glued to the figure. Mungoy brought one arm up and put it between himself and Hegel and pushed. His split face went from shock to horror, as up close he must have realized what he was really attached to. Mungoy strained with all his colossal strength, but sticky strands of the substance the creature exuded engulfed his arm as well. The pretense of the Hegel figure was dropped as the creature's attacking club revealed itself. The human shape dissolved into a six-foot pad covered in baseball-sized suckers. Mungoy struggled even harder, his expression bordering on madness, but then his face went momentarily slack before he began to howl in pain. Alex knew exactly what was happening. The second part of the snare was now being used. Hook-like tusks emerged from the center of the suckers that appeared over the front of the pad. Mungoy thrashed in agony as the eight-inch daggers entered his body, and the curved hook held his flesh tight. Now that he was locked tight to the pad, he began to move forward. Mungoy braced his colossal legs, but Alex could now see the fleshy column trailing from the back of the once Hegel-like figure and into the jungle behind them. This appendage was one of two tentacle clubs of a monstrous creature. Its long tentacles now flexed impossible muscle that the insignificant Mungoy had no hope of resisting. In the next second, the huge Chinese PLA soldier was yanked off his feet and into the foliage. There was silence for a few seconds, and the group stared in disbelief and horror. Then Hegel reappeared. As before, his form was perfect as that of the silent, motionless soldier standing just inside the jungle's edge. The Chinese officer reacted, screaming orders, his face blood-red from fury. His men attacked the figure, charging and firing with everything they had. But as soon as they got within half-dozen feet, more tentacles emerged from the slimy jungle. These were not the mimic clubs, but the tips of the other appendages, these ones just used for fighting, grasping, and feeding. They lifted and coiled, swatted and crushed the small human bodies like insects. The captain's face drained of color, and he started to back up. Alex turned to Casey Franks. Now, move it. Untie them and then head to the cliff wall. He was up and sprinting, snatching up Amy, quickly going to Jennifer Hartigan and ripping her bonds from her wrists. He pushed them both towards the far side of the jungle. To the cliff wall, he then spun. Kate! Kate Canning! He yelled over the fury and chaos in the clearing, the sound of the screaming soldiers either fighting to the death, dying in agony, or worse, 
being hauled away like netted fish to be consumed alive. Kate appeared from the jungle line. Alex pointed, Go around that way! Kate looked from Alex to the maelstrom of madness in the clearing. Her mouth dropped open and her eyes glassed over. She was transfixed, as surely as if she was captured by the creature herself. Kate! Alex roared her name. She jumped and turned, shocked into action. She then nodded and threaded her way through the far side of the jungle. Fuck me. Jackson's hands were now freed, but he stood transfixed too, his expression blank. He began to back up, looking above their heads. There was a sensation of coldness against Alex's spine. He didn't need to turn to know that the creature, the monstrous orthocone mimic, was rising up as he and Casey finished ripping rope from the last bound men. Run! He herded them to the jungle and then turned to witness his nemesis. He felt a thrill of horror run through his body like an electric current. A mottled green and black mountain was rising up over the jungle. At its top was a huge pulsating sack with unblinking goat-like eyes the size of train tunnels. Beside it, tentacles rose and fell, undulating and almost graceful in their sinuous movements. In some of them, small human bodies screamed and wriggled, but were soon handed down beneath the mountain to where Alex knew the giant mouth resided, the massive maw behind a horned beak that would crush and render flesh and bone down to pulp. Alex backed away, careful now not to make too many darting movements. Though his instinct was to sprint and propel himself far from this place, he knew he might have been able to outrun it. Certainly he would outpace his team. But then they would be overtaken by the questing tentacles that could unfurl a hundred feet or pursue them through and over the jungle, using its boneless form to flow like a river of pure hunger. Alex eased back into the jungle where Amy was standing, waiting, refusing to leave, her expression a mix of anger, confusion, and a thousand questions. Alex grabbed her hand, dragging her. Not now, soon. They were out of the clearing and running. His team and some of the Chinese sprinted beside him, bashing soft, wet fronds out of the way and sidestepping fallen trunks and hairy, column-like boughs. Behind them they could hear its approach. It was fast, crushing everything before it as it flowed over or through any obstacles. There was no need for stealth now, just a need for furious running. The cave wall loomed up before them, its top now lost in the dark blue gloom above them, and its far edge just touching the edge of the vast underground sea. There! Alex pointed as he let go of Amy. He half turned. Stay away from the water! He accelerated, leaving the others behind. There was an opening in the cave wall, multiple openings, but one in particular demanded his attention. It wasn't created by geology or erosion. It was a carved entrance. Alex sprinted inside, quickly checking for danger, and then came back to urge them on, grabbing people and pulling them through. He felt the hair on his neck rise as the glistening mountain surged toward them. Don't look back! Get inside! Faster! Faster! Alex watched the thing bear down on them, fascinated and repelled at the same time. Its mottled hide now pulsated with color as its excitement grew. In one of its tentacles, Mungoy thrashed and struggled pounding against a monstrous, muscular limb he had no hope of escaping. Get back! Everyone away from the cave mouth, now! Alex backed up, holding his arms wide like a barrier. Outside, the blue-tinged light from the glowworms was shut off, and he spun. Blake, Rhino, take the lead and scout ahead. We need to get as far from this opening as we can. Won't make any difference, Amy said. This thing will either tear the cave wall open or just squeeze in. 
All we can do is stay ahead of it. Alex knew she was right, and thankfully she was one of the few keeping a clear head. Move! Alex pushed Shen Jung, Sung, and Kate, urging them further in. The few remaining flashlights came on, and the group moved deeper into the smaller tunnel, staying calm, even though apprehension came off them in waves. Faster! They ran along some flat and even ground, too flat for natural geology. Alex could see the remains of tiles beneath his feet. They rounded a corner and found themselves in an alcove, and they slowed to a halt. From behind them there came an enormous thump as something hit the mouth of the cave. Dust rained down, and Alex alone edged out to look back at the opening. The weak light that had been seeping in had now been totally extinguished, but even in the blackness, Alex could make out the tip of a questing tentacle as it silently eased its way in. Alex knew the power of the thing, and Amy was right. The creature had the ability to stretch and flatten itself, to be able to squeeze into impossibly small places. Down here it had grown large, but it had also evolved an ability to hunt within the narrow, twisting labyrinths of the cave systems. He half turned, still backing up. It's coming in! Alex looked around at the cave structure, noting its areas of strength and weakness, and wasn't happy with what he saw. The powerfully long tentacles could tear the side of the cave open, inching in, and then flexing with a striated muscular strength that could rip apart iron sheets like paper. A rock wall would be like clay to it. They needed to be further. The scream jerked his head around. He saw Shen Jung and Sung engaged in a tug of war. One of the tentacles had stretched out, rope thin now, and the tip had snagged Shen Jung's sleeve. While Alex watched, the coil started to wrap around his forearm and then thicken. Shen Jung dug his heels in, his eyes wider than seemed humanly possible. Sung held on to him, but already his feet began to slip. Alex had seconds. When the hooks in the tentacles engaged, then the man would be jerked from the cave like a cork from a bottle. Alex sprinted and dived, grabbing Shen Jung around the waist. But the tentacle didn't break or release its grip. Instead, it simply stretched. Alex turned and gripped the now wrist-thick limb and yanked hard. Too easily it released the Chinese scientist, but then, like a writhing viper, the thing whipped back to coil around Alex's arm. Alex pushed the Chinese couple away, and then used his enormous strength to pull back. The elasticized flesh refused to break. There came a burning pain as the suckers engaged, and then the first sensation of sharpness. Amy ran towards him, but he held up a hand. Get back! Alex drew a small knife and hacked at the limb, but when he pressed down, the flesh would give a bit and not allow the blade to bite. He felt the thing begin to pull at him. He needed to brace himself, and he turned and tried to walk back further into the cave. Each step was impossibly hard, and the thing simply brought more and more power to bear on him, cancelling out his effort. He knew it had been playing with him. The force on his arm increased, and he began to slide backwards. The tusk began to dig through his cave suit. The game was obviously over. Then a sharp pain ripped through Alex's head, and suddenly the pressure on his arm was gone. He brought his hands up to his ears, grimacing. Amy was beside him in a second. What is it? Something. A sound. Alex moaned. It felt like an ice pick being jammed into the center of his brain. He went to his knees and then buried his forehead to the ground, groaning. Amy followed him down. She looked up, then around. I can't hear anything. Ultrasonic. He lifted his head, his eyes streaming, and blood at his nostrils. Behind him, the questing tentacles had begun to quickly withdraw. 
After another few seconds they were gone. The sound shut off, and with it went the pain. Alex eased back up and took his hands away, blinking. The sound. It's gone. He looked around. And so is the creature. Amy helped him to his feet. This is no ordinary cave, she turned. And maybe whatever that sound was scared the orthocone away. Maybe. Alex looked down at his arm. There was a ring cut from the tough material of his suit, and his skin was raised and raw. He lifted his head. And maybe it just knows another way in. Chapter 49 Amy let go of Alex and looked up at his face. He hadn't changed. He had the same brutally handsome features, the same eyes that saw deep inside her. He returned the gaze, his expression suddenly hardening. You shouldn't damn well be here, he said. Her mouth momentarily dropped open. You're right, I shouldn't. She folded her arms, her jaw set. And neither should you. After all, you're dead, remember? She pushed him hard in the chest. Or at least that's what you wanted me to think. That wasn't in my control. Alex rounded on her. You have bigger priorities than this. He waved an arm around. Or me. You dare... Her teeth clamped. You have no idea what I have done to be here. He leaned towards her, lowering his voice. You left Joshua unguarded. That's what you've done. She felt the anger boil over. I left Joshua. You goddamn left us both. She couldn't help her voice rising and could feel the stares of the group. You left us both when we needed you most. No, I didn't. Alex pulled back. And you had someone. He knew, she thought. How? Amy tilted her head, stepping in closer. You've been watching us. Or did that Jack Hammerson run tabs on me and keep you in the loop? He began to turn away, but she grabbed his arm and tugged him around. Peter looked after us when I needed support. He was a father figure to Joshua, but never his true father. Where were you? She stepped right up to him. Where were you? Alex put a hand out and eased her back a step. You should have married him. Joshua needs that permanency. So do you. That was it. Amy swung at him. You son of a bitch! The blow caught Alex on the shoulder and bounced off. Amy felt her hand throb with pain, but her anger wouldn't subside. She wanted to hit him again, hurt him. Yo! Casey Frank sauntered over, followed by Rhino and Blake. What kept you, boss? Her bloodied face was pulled up into its usual sneer. Her eyes went from Amy to Alex as she stepped in between them. Alex shrugged, looking relieved at the distraction. A mile or so of ice and rock, a sea serpent or two, miles of jungle. He smiled flatly. The usual... Alex held out a fist to her. All in a day's work. Casey bumped knuckles. Good to see you. Alex did the same to his other hawks, who grinned like they'd just been given a reprieve from death row. He looked down again at the hawk woman's battered face. How you doing? Casey grinned back. Me? Fine. I was ugly to start with. Rhino put a large hand on her shoulder. But it's what's inside that counts, right, Franks? Alex laughed. For most people. He nodded towards the group standing in the dark. Let's see what we've got. He took a few paces towards them, 
but paused to look back at Amy. We'll finish this later. You bet we will, she thought. Come forward, Alex said, his voice echoing in the smaller cavern. All eyes shifted from Alex to Captain Wu Yang. He and his remaining men stayed in the shadows. Around them, the cavern was heavily overgrown with hanging lichen and mosses, things that had grown over many millennia to obscure walls that seemed unnaturally flat. Beneath their feet, a layer of dirt couldn't conceal ancient tiles. Unlike most of the caves leading down, this one smelled damp, earthen, and of something Alex could only just detect, the hint of metal rusting somewhere far away in the dark. Now, Alex said. Captain Wu Yang was the first to step from the shadows, his gaze unflinching. Alex noticed his gun was still in his holster. He had two remaining soldiers with him. The captain squared his shoulders and folded his arms. There would be no apology from this man, nor would Alex have expected one. As far as he was concerned, he was just doing the job ordered by his country. Young made no move for his gun, but his soldiers still had their rifles cradled. Alex's team now had no armaments other than knives. Lower your weapons. Alex had his hawks spread to either side of him, and he could feel the waves of fury radiating from them. The power imbalance would not be tolerated for long. Yang didn't flinch, and his men didn't move. Alex knew they understood him. Hey, assholes, you heard the man. Casey walked forward, eyes blazing. She looked like she wanted to settle a few scores right here, right now. Alex grabbed her shoulder and pulled her back. He turned again to Yang. Lower them, or I'll take them from you. He stared from under lowered brows. And I will hurt you. Alex looked over his shoulder to the cave entrance. Then I think I'll throw you all outside to play with our new friend. Yang's eyes remained fixed on Alex, but he could almost hear his mind ticking over, perhaps remembering what he had seen this new American soldier do to his giant, Mungoi. He turned and spoke a few words. His men didn't hesitate to comply. They placed their weapons on the ground, rifles, handguns, and knives. Alex looked each of them in the eyes. If you want to live, you will take orders from me. He waited until there came a near imperceptible nod from Wu Yang. Alex continued to hold the man's gaze. Now I'll take the grenades. The soldiers looked to Yang, who frowned and shrugged. Alex chuckled, but with zero humor. I know PLA each have a Type 86 grenade. They're mini frags full of nice ball bearings and with a wide burst radius. Hand them over, now. Alex curled his fingers. Quickly! He tilted his head, seeing the walkie-talkies on their belts. And take those off. I'll have them as well. Who are you? Yang asked. The Arcadian. Casey's smile sneered at the Chinese captain. And unless you want your head ripped off, I'd do as he says. Arcadian? Captain Alex Hunter. Familiarity momentarily crossed the captain's features, his eyes going from Alex to Amy before closing down. You know me. Alex stepped closer to the man. He could sense that Yang knew both him and Amy. He was holding something back from them. Yang smirked, but turned to speak softly to his men, and then they each pulled the rounded explosives from their pouches and walked forward to drop them into Alex's hand. The same for the walkie-talkies. Alex quickly checked the grenades and then slid them all into his own pockets and pouches. He looked at the three walkie-talkies. 
Yun Tan modeled H-280s. They'll do. Alex turned to give one to Amy. He gave one back to Yang and kept the other himself. Now we're all one big, happy, connected family. Yang took the single device, his expression implacable. Alex stared back hard for a moment. Good choice. He turned away. Everyone, fall in. The Hawks and McMurdo soldiers approached. Alex looked over their heads and pointed at Yang, also to Sung and Shen Jung. You too, this affects us all. The group crowded around. There was a sense of relief and optimistic anticipation, probably just because of his arrival. At this point, Alex knew it was probably misplaced. Equipment and weapons check. What have we got left? The soldiers checked pockets and pouches. Yang and his team stood waiting. Casey spoke first. Got a flashlight and one small K-bar. She turned to stab a finger at Yang. The rest is fucking piled out in the clearing where these guys stripped it from us. She glared. Same, said Ranofsky, then Blake. Nothing left, said Ben Jackson and Jennifer Hardigan. Amy also shook her head. Kate had a knife, a small flashlight, and some water. Worse than I thought. Alex looked to Young's weapon pile. You've got a handgun and two rifles. Keep the handgun, but hand over the rifles. Young's eyes bulged. You leave us with nothing. You have a handgun, knives, and your experience. Now pick up your weapons. We will all need to fight before this day is done. Cursing, the Chinese soldiers snatched up their knives. Alex turned away. Franks, Ranovsky, take the rest. His two hawks eagerly grabbed the Chinese weapons and then checked them. Okay, me, I've got knives, a signal locator, and now grenades. He tossed one of the grenades to Casey and the signal locator to Rhino. We have flashlights, which is good, but we'll need to conserve battery life. We don't have food and water, but if need be, we can find that in the jungle if we have to go back outside. He motioned to the rifles. But this is not enough to survive down here for long. Boss. Rhino shook his head, his face lit by the small screen of the locator. Just fired this thing up. That signal is right around here. He looked up. I mean, it's here. Right in here somewhere. Alex nodded, looking around. And there's something else in here. I don't think we're alone. That creature was either scared of or called off by something or someone. Silence stretched as the group looked around in the dark, cave-like tunnel. Every crack or corner now took on more menace. Alex held up a hand, raising his voice only slightly. Listen, right now we have some urgent priorities if we're to survive. Two scouting teams. Jackson, Rhino, Yang are Team One. Blake, take the two PLA soldiers. Scout ahead, see what we've got coming up. Keep your eyes open. He turned. Frank's on rear guard. The rest, gather your strength before we follow them in. Alex edged to the corner and looked back to the entrance. The blue glow had returned, and the creature was gone for now. Chapter 50 Amy lifted her flashlight to examine their surroundings, joining the other small, glowing circles that danced around within the tunnel. The tiles beneath her feet were worn, but at the edges were hints of the original colors. Blue, green, and flashing reflective mica sparkled in their flashlights. The walls had magnificent carved frescoes leaning out at them, with smiling, leering, and tongue-lolling faces in the broad style Amy recognized too well. Above her, corbelled archways of fierce creatures interspaced with large oval stone heads with benevolent stares watched over them. 
She let her beam momentarily trail towards Alex, before quickly moving it away. But her eyes remained. The man made anger burn inside her. After all these years, the first thing he did was to scold her? How dare he? She bristled the more she dwelled on it. She continued to watch him. Her head held on to the indignation, but in her core there was still a feeling of attraction and familiarity that was as intoxicating as it had ever been. She wanted to scream at him, curse him, and make him say sorry for lying to her, and all that sat uneasily beside a deep desire to rekindle something she had only felt in her dreams for many years. She pushed her thoughts away and focused on the tiles. This is unbelievable. Jesus! Amy jerked her light around, directly onto the woman's face. The woman squinted, smiled, and held out her hand. Hi, Kate Canning, Dr. Kate Canning, evolutionary biologist and team leader on Project Ellsworth. It's a, a government-funded study of the buried lake. She pointed at the ceiling. From somewhere way up there. I hitched a ride. She half smiled, shrugging. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Dr. Amy Weir, petrobiologist and suicidal fool. She shook Kate's hand. Still think it was a good idea? Ask me again when we're topside, Kate said, panning her light over the flooring and then raising it higher. She turned to smile again at Amy. If, I mean if we get out. We'll get out. Amy projected more confidence than she felt. Kate turned her light towards Alex, who noticed them looking and nodded. Well, if anyone can get us out, it'll be that guy. Her eyes slid to Amy. Saw you watching him before. You should see him with his shirt off. Amy turned a little too quickly. What? Kate momentarily pulled back at Amy's reaction, and Amy immediately regretted it. Uh-oh. You two know each other, huh? No, yes, forget it. Long time ago. Amy waved it away. Good. Kate's eyebrows flicked up momentarily, and she grinned. Amy sighed, feeling a twinge of something inside that she hated. You are not jealous, she told herself. Kate wandered further into the dark tunnel, and Amy followed her. Amazing, Kate said, her light moving up and down. Just damned amazing. Amy knew what she was experiencing. She had felt the same sense of wonder when they first found the buried city. And here, even after countless centuries, the architecture was still striking. Interspaced Doric columns and large trapezoidal stones fitted together without a hair's breadth between them. Vestiges of color clung to some of the images, and even the mosses and mineralized waters, now staining them in all manner of rainbow hues, couldn't fully mask their magnificence. It's just like Tikal, the Mayan temple ruins. And just as old, I'd say. Kate turned. I've been there. It's called the Temple of the Two-Headed Snake, built by King Yakskin Khan Shak in 470 A.D. No, it's older than that, said Amy. Much, much older. This place was a memory before Tikal was even a dream. She turned to find Alex coming up behind them, and she pointed to the carvings. Just like Astlan. He nodded. So maybe some of them did make it down here after all, Alex said softly. We always wondered. Astlan? What the hell is Astlan? Kate asked, stepping in closer to the pair. Something much older than the Mayans, Amy said, shining her light onto the glyphic images. 
These guys predated the Aztecs, Egyptians, Mayans, and even the Sumerians by thousands of years. In fact, as they were originally a seafaring people, they may have created those other races, seeded them. Buried beneath the Antarctic ice, Kate scoffed. I know what you're inferring. Aztlan is Atlantis, right? She looked at Amy from under her brows. Please tell me you're not really saying that. I'm not, Amy said. This down here is nothing like Atlantis. This is just the remnants of that. Its real name is, was, Aztlan. And that great city, perhaps the first great city on the planet, is above us, buried just under snow and ice. A civilization that flourished when this continent was mostly ice-free. She walked to the wall, placing a hand on one of the moss-covered images. When the final ice age took hold, many escaped, perhaps becoming one or all of the world's first great races. But others stayed behind and became trapped in the dark. Some obviously came down here and... She shrugged. And then I don't know. Amy moved her light to the next image. It was of a coiling mass with a huge eye at its center. But I can guess. Yo, boss! Rhino led Jackson and Yang back to the group. Alex noticed that Shen Jung and Sung didn't move to welcome Yang, but stayed with Kate and Jennifer Hartigan, who talked quietly with Casey Franks. What have you got? he asked when they stopped before him. Multiple caves and more. This place is enormous. Buildings, rooms, a freaking city, or what's left of it. Rhino stopped, the equally huge Jackson beside him. Something bad happened here. Maybe an earthquake. A lot of damage. Seems long deserted, but... He shrugged. You kind of get the feeling that, I don't know, there's someone still here. Impossible. Kate said. More like improbable, Amy said. These guys were born survivors. Well, we found more of the weird markings on the walls that we saw in the upper caves. Rhino pointed at one of the ancient carvings of a warrior. Not like these, they were more recent, but they were rougher, crude, like they were done by someone a lot less skilled. Like what Hegel said he found with a bunch of skeletons in a dead-end cave that was higher up. He said it was as if they were trying to tunnel towards the surface. They never made it. They went in both directions, Alex said. Some tried for the light, maybe others for the eternal twilight of this place. Well, down here worked out well, didn't it? Casey said, joining them. It did for a while, Amy said. About 12,000 years ago, when the land iced over and trapped them, enough of them came down to be able to create all this. Amy waved an arm around. They reestablished, but then something happened, and their civilization collapsed. She looked towards the mouth of the cave. No sunlight and no hope with that thing out there. Why didn't they just head back up? Jackson asked. Because this would be preferable, Kate said. They make it to the surface, and all they're going to find is a frozen desert. Imagine what they would have thought of that blinding white and freezing world after thousands of years in the warmth and dark. They'd see it as hell. Yeah, well, with that thing down here, I'd take that over this place any day. Rhino frowned. But Amy's right. These guys must have survived just fine for a while, before slipping back or something. Slipping back to the Stone Age, Kate said. There is something called the Olduvai theory. It postulates civilization always sliding backwards, regressing after a certain period. She shrugged. It's inevitable. War, disease, natural disaster... Using up resources, all can lead to great powers simply collapsing, fragmenting, and the people scattering, 
leaving the great cities deserted or in ruins, like this place. She looked around. And I can tell you, as an evolutionary biologist, 12,000 years is about 50,000 generations. More than enough time to force adaptations, evolutionary adaptations. She smiled. Maybe they flourished again, but didn't need the things that the first arrivals did. Rhino raised his eyebrows. Like what, no roof over their heads? Seriously? Kate gave him a look. Look up, soldier. Here, everywhere you go, there's a roof over your head. Jackson sniggered. Boom, she wins that round, big fella. Rhino grinned. Well, let's see what... That's enough, Ranofsky, Alex said. Any other observations? He looked from Rhino to Jackson, and then to Yang, who stood brooding a few paces back. Well, yeah. You couldn't help feeling that someone was there, just out of sight, Jackson said. Spooky. We were being watched. Yang lifted his head, and Rhino nodded. I could feel it. Alex looked at the men, knowing they were probably right. He felt it himself. He could sense there was more in the tunnels than lichen-covered statues. Even now he could feel that somewhere in the dark there were eyes upon them. We need to move. He turned slowly, trying to see into every crevice and dark corner. Being in here is no guarantee of our safety. Got that right, Rhino said. We lost Parcellus in a freaking crack in the wall, no bigger than... He stopped when he saw Alex's expression. We all know what we're up against, Alex looked to the group, who were now all watching him. We need to fully investigate this place. If there's a way out, we need to find it. He looked hard at Yang. And we need to find our submarine. A way out? Yeah, works for me, Jackson said. There was no bioluminescence in the tunnels, and without the flashlights, the darkness would have been absolute. Alex turned slowly, concentrating. The silence was so thick, it was as if it was suspended in the humidity. But there was something. He sensed activity or furtive movement all around them. He turned back to Rhino. Where's Blake? He should have been back by now. Rhino frowned. Yeah, damn right. He was ahead of us. Should have been back first. Yang bullocked his way past the taller Jackson. And where are my men? How would we know? Rhino put his hand on the Chinese captain's chest. Yang knocked it away and glowered at Alex. So I agree for you to lead and we immediately lose people. This is leadership, American style? Get a load of this guy, would you? Rhino shook his head. That's enough, Alex said. He turned to Yang. Listen, our man is missing as well. I get the feeling this place is huge, but we'll find them. Probably just exploring further than they expected. Or my men are dead. Killed by one of your assassins. Yang's features were set hard. Rhino chuckled. Assassin? Blake's gonna love that one. He leaned over Yang, putting a large, blunt finger in his chest. Then where's our assassin? Why hasn't he returned either? Hiding, Yang said, turning to stand square on to Rhino. Someone cracking under pressure, are they? Casey muscled in, getting between Yang and Rhino. Lighten up, all of you! Alex pulled them apart. We're all wire tight right now, but we've got to stick together. He stared hard in the direction the men had disappeared, straining to hear or get a sense of them. His neck tingled from a feeling of imminent danger that refused to materialize. We stay alive, find the sub. But first, we look for our missing men. Everyone stay close, he said, 
looking toward Jennifer and the two Chinese scientists. Rhino, you and I will take point, Jackson at rear. He looked at Casey and then nodded at Yang. She understood immediately and got close to him. Alex waved them on. Let's go. I'm also at front, Amy said quickly. So am I, said Kate, pushing past the others. Hey! Casey grabbed for her, but Alex waved her back. He wanted Franks on Yang. He had a feeling that taking orders from an American hadn't been in the man's job description. And if he got a chance, he might take the opportunity to rebalance the power dynamics by putting a bullet in the back of Alex's head. Chapter 51 Yang felt the female hawk at his shoulder. She was of no threat to him. He knew he could disable or kill her whenever he wished. His primary threat was the leader of this special forces group. But he was also his biggest opportunity. He bristled at the thought of his missing men and now needed to rely on Sung Chin Ling and Shen Jung Ching for support. He had reservations about their patriotism, but he knew a quiet word reminding the pair of what lay in store for them back home if they failed to remember where their true allegiances lay would bring them back into line. Yang inhaled the humid air of the tunnel and watched the back of Alex Hunter. Following close to him was Dr. Amy Weir. Perhaps this was why Yang had been chosen to lead the mission, it was payback, or an opportunity for redemption, for the failed mission to procure the child, Joshua Weir. Their own top-secret advanced soldier program had stalled, stuck in a cul-de-sac of producing giants like Mungoi, but not being able to complement their strength with intellect. Their soldiers were little more than two-legged battering rams, and what they needed was something better. Yang continued to watch Alex Hunter. Where they were stalled, the Americans had succeeded with this man who was known as the Arcadian. With his own eyes, Yang had witnessed the ease with which Hunter had defeated Mungoi, making the big PLA soldier, their most advanced breed, seem like an outdated model within seconds. He felt his spirits lift. If this was an opportunity for redemption, he would seize it with both hands. He would secure the submarine for his country and also the body of the Arcadian. He turned again and smiled at the stocky female hawk. She sneered in return. His smile broadened. He was right where he needed to be, on his way to the submarine and now embedded within the enemy camp. He sped up as he remembered an ancient proverb, patience is power. He could wait, and he would be ready to act. Sung and Shen Jung followed next, just in front of Jennifer, and Yang trolled behind them with Casey on his shoulder. This way. Rhino led them up a mound of broken rock that suddenly turned into age-worn steps. Even now it was clear that these had not been rough-hewn risers, but once were carved of something shining and smooth. The stumps of broken balustrades were of a dark stone that was ebony black and could have been the finest polished marble. The stairs themselves were soft, carpeted by thick mosses that squelched as they stepped up on them. They next crossed a wide balcony and then entered a curved tunnel. Overhead there were once polished lintel stones, each with their own intricate carving of a face with a different expression, now all with beards of lichen that they needed to duck beneath. Alex stopped before one wall, looking along its length, feeling the sense of misery and dismay in the images portrayed. He exhaled slowly and then waited for Amy to catch up. He motioned with a nod. Amy followed his gaze and shined her flashlight along the carved relief, exhaling softly. 
An old friend, she said. More like the ancient enemy, Alex responded. The coiled mass with an unblinking eye at its center dominated the wall. The Aztlantic carving style was a mix of raised glyphs, faces, but now the once benevolent visages were twisted in horror, fear, or pain. Alex tilted his head back, staring upwards, feeling like he was seeing through the miles of stone to the ancient city he knew was buried just below the snow and dark ice. Many years ago, he had encountered a similar tableau to the one on the wall, but the scenes then were of the land, sunlight, and happier times. Now, down here, a darkness had not only permeated the lives of these forgotten people, but had even influenced their art. Wow! Kate joined them, her mouth hanging open as she stared at the glyphs. Amazing, isn't it? It's like the pre-Columbian stone artisan work, but different somehow. Not more primitive, just different. Kate walked quickly to the wall, laying her hands on some of the images. I wish I could understand them. Possibly the most ancient formal language ever known. A linguist who was with us, Professor Matt Kearns, said the Estlantian words might even be the skeleton key the root language for all languages. And those who stayed in the city above just sat there and froze in the dark. Kate exhaled through compressed lips. No. Amy turned to Kate. We found evidence in the city above where the orthocone managed to find its way in, snaking in through cracks and holes and snatching the remaining inhabitants in the dark. It would have been a nightmare. Rhino grimaced. Like with Parcellus, this thing can get in anywhere, and it's smart. Been fucking with us the whole time. He lifted his light to the coiling mass. I bet that's what happened to them. We don't know that for sure, Alex said. The creatures, these kraken species, have made a home here for countless millions of years, and the Estlantians must have been here for centuries as well. These structures take time to plan and build. They could never have created them if they were being constantly attacked. Somehow they learned to coexist. Maybe you're right on that part. Kate stepped back from the wall, shining her light along its entire length. Everything, every image, it's all about the beast. Amy sighed. The mighty Aztlan people, rulers of the world, before even the Egyptians lifted their pyramids or the Persians built Persepolis, who worshipped the sun and the wind and the sea and were suddenly forced to believe in only one god, this thing, this monster in the dark. Not just their god, it became their everything. Alex hurried them on. Amy wandered along the wall, shining her light up and down. Maybe they struck a bargain. Rhino grunted. Striking a bargain usually means they had something to offer each other. Safety for the people down here, sure. But what would the monster get out of it? Other than free food, I mean. Let's keep moving. Alex led them along the tomb-dark corridor. The air was thick with damp and other than their breathing, there was near total silence. Look, Rhino shined his light at the ground. At the edge of a puddle of murky water, there were boot marks in the moss. Hawk boot, Blake's heading this way. Alex nodded. All going in one direction, and no one coming back, means if they're anywhere, it's still up ahead. He turned to his hawks. Be ready. They may have walked into a trap. Alex slowed the pace, wary now, and reached out with his senses. He could feel the void long before he saw it. It's opening out. How can you tell? Jackson asked. We lost all the sensors. Alex kept staring directly ahead. The echo isn't as compressed as it was only a moment ago and it's taking longer to bounce back to us, 
In here, its bounce is muted by the low ceiling. Not anymore. Got it. Jackson didn't sound convinced. Wait here. Alex switched off his flashlight and vanished into the darkness. He moved lightly along the corridor, his flashlight off, as his eyes were perfectly dark adapted, another side effect of the Arcadian treatment. He stopped when he was around a bend and away from the group. He stood silently, listening and waiting, trying to draw forth a sense of his surroundings. The heavy stones blocked many of his senses, but he was sure that he could detect life, and not that of the monstrous creature that waited outside for them. He hoped it was Blake. The man was a good hawk, and not one to easily walk into an ambush. Alex moved on, quickly now, further along the corridor, until a soft light started to permeate the darkness. He exited the tunnel and found himself in a huge room like a cathedral, many hundreds of feet across. The ceiling was high enough overhead that it had its own bioluminescent biology fixed to it. Along all four walls there were small alcoves, like window-sized pigeonholes. He guessed there might have been more levels higher up. He closed his eyes and slowed his breathing, concentrating. There was the essence of life again, but nothing close by. He turned to the passage he had just exited. Yo, come on in. Amy was first in, followed by Kate, and then the rest of the group. Amy wandered out towards the center. She saw that Shen Jung and Sung remained joined at the hip, as though frightened one or the other was going to be snatched away. Oh, my God, Kate said. Amy followed her gaze with her own light. There was a giant carving in the far wall, more than a carving, instead a mighty statue that seemed to be breaking out from the very rock. It was a human figure, in a dress-like tunic, holding a huge stone sword. The long ages had colored it green with many varieties of moss and lichen. Only two spots remained clear of the mossy covering the eyes. Both gleamed in the beams of light. Is that gold? Jennifer asked. Probably, said Amy. Antarctica is a very old continent and has rich deposits of the metal. Makes sense for them to mine it. Many ancient races found it something they could work quite readily, Kate said. A treasure, said Young lifting a small pair of field glasses to his eyes. Casey's lip curled. That's all you're taking away from this? Maybe you can lug some home. I heard it's not that heavy. Yang lowered the glasses and turned front on to her. Idiot. You see, but do not understand. It is a sign of an advanced civilization. They were able to mine the metal, smelt it, and then work it into such an ornate design. He waved a hand up at the huge being. This statue alone would have taken decades to create. If something catastrophic happened to them, it either happened very slowly or very quickly. We need to learn from this. Casey sneered. Yeah, you've seen what's outside, right? He's right, Amy said softly. Everything we learn is important now. Keep your eyes and minds open. Whatever. Casey turned away. Kate craned her neck, shining her light above them. This room is like a church. The roof is arched and looks carved. This civilization must have been monumental for centuries. She turned. Was it like this in the city above? No said Amy. It was well beyond this. It was magnificent and would have rivaled anything in Egypt or ancient Persia. But the creature found them, or they found it while digging in their basements. They broke through into the caves while excavating, found the labyrinths leading down to the sea. The creature rose up and pursued them into their most private places. 
They tried to appease it for a while, feed it, but it grew ever more hungry and eventually stopped waiting to be fed and decided to feed itself. Amy sighed. From what we were able to translate, we found out that finally they decided to fight, sent an army down to make war on it, led by two brave warrior brothers. They were sent to hell to make war on the devil, Alex said. Of the two thousand warriors that went down, only one man returned. Amy sighed. And then the climate changed, and the cold and dark set in for good. They had two monsters to contend with, the never-ending cold and the monster from the depths. She shivered. They came down to where the monster lived then? Jackson asked. No choice, Alex turned. They were buried alive. A hundred feet of ice and snow eventually covered the city. No sun means no food. We found evidence of cannibalism. Those that stayed were going mad or were getting picked off in the dark. Ugh, makes me sick just thinking of it, Kate grimaced. Being alone in the dark and having this thing snake its way in, silent, invisible, its cold touch meaning a horrible death, eaten alive. Amy nodded. Some got out, others didn't. Looks like many chose to risk coming here, taking a slim chance at life or dying in the darkness. She turned back to the massive statue. Looks like it worked out fine, at least for a while. Shen Jung and Sung edged closer. The Chinese engineer cleared his throat. It may not have been the creature, he said. Consider what causes civilizations to collapse. War, but there was no competing clan down here, unless they split into factions, which is unlikely. Climate, again unlikely, as this environment has been static for millions of years. Interbreeding, causing genetic weaknesses, is a possibility. Maybe even mutation. That's a great thought. Evolution or devolution? Jackson grimaced. Let's find our people and then search for a way out, Alex said. Spread out, look for traces, two by twos, and stay in sight of each other. Chapter 52 Do you think we will ever see the sunlight again? Sung asked softly. Shen Jung smiled down at her. I can see it now. She tilted her head and laughed. Now you become romantic? She grabbed his hand. Why not? Down here in this dark place, it is exactly what we need. He squeezed her hand back, becoming serious. I hope we will see the sunlight again. But what I hope and what I believe might be two different things. He turned, seeing Yang watching them. He doesn't trust us. I don't think he ever did, Sung replied, and I do not trust Yang either. She looked up at him. All our team, we left in the upper tunnels, do you think? Shen Jung shook his head. Do not dwell on it. We must stay strong, survive together, and be prepared for anything. He saw that Yang still stared and steered Sung a little further away. And that means, if it comes down to a choice, I trust the Americans more than I do Yang. Sung peeked over his shoulder at the PLA captain. Yes, and I believe soon he will want us to choose sides. I will not choose his. He sighed. And if we do not, then even if we find a way out, we will never be able to go home. Are you prepared for that? Amy and Kate broke off, walking towards a far wall, deep in conversation. Alex pointed to Franks and motioned with his head for her to follow them. She nodded. 
He watched as the team spread out, and then turned to peer up at the huge statue. He walked to its base and began to climb. In only a few minutes, he had reached one of the shoulders and stood upright. The ceiling was still another fifty or so feet above his head, and he looked across to the face. The golden eyes glowed with hints of blue, reflecting the weak bioluminescent light from above. The statue's expression was frozen in a permanent stare. He followed its gaze. At the far end of the room, about fifty feet up, there was another carving in the wall, the tentacled horror he had become used to. Maybe that's how it started for them, the warriors fighting the creature, he thought, and this was a monument to them. Alex noticed that at the center of the coiling mass there was another opening. As soon as his eyes alighted on it, something moved inside, darted back into the shadows. He had an impression of a humanoid shape and colorless flesh, but with dangling appendages. So, he thought, you are watching. Boss, got something here. Rhino waved an arm up at him over near one of the huge walls. Alex climbed down and jogged towards him. Jackson and Yang were leaning over a spot on the ground. Rhino crouched. Ground's all messed up. Something violent happened here. He turned about. No prints leading away and no doorways that I can see. He stood and turned to the wall, giving it a push. Can't see any pivot points. Alex leaned in close to the stone, running his fingers along the edges of some of the blocks. They had sat for so long that they had fused together. I think it's solid now. Don't think they went through here. They didn't fly away, Jackson said. Alex looked to the huge McMurdo soldier and then up. He remembered the small, darting figure he had seen above them. He spun to the group. Everyone, back from the walls! His voice boomed in the large room. As soon as the words left his mouth, there came a gagging sound, and they turned to see Jennifer Hartigan rising up, a rope around her neck and under one arm. More ropes came down, lassoing towards Yang, and then Kate. Ben Jackson caught a tether as it tried to loop over his large head. He grabbed it and yanked hard. In turn, it was yanked back even harder, and the loop slid tight around his wrist. Ah, oh, fuck! He started to rise up. A little help here! Rhino rushed to him and grabbed the cord. Immediately, another dropped down and also circled Jackson's neck. Fuck! Was all the big man could rasp out. Use your knives! Get to the center! Alex yelled instructions, but there was nothing but the chaos of flickering lights and shouting people. He saw in an instant what the alcoves were now used for. They were staging portals for capturing prey. Whether this was their original purpose or something later adapted by the descendants of the once great race, he would never know. In each of the window-sized alcoves, Multiple figures hauled on the ropes they had dropped down. Alex frowned as he tried to make sense of what he was seeing. They were smaller than normal and were bone-white humanoids, but their faces were like nothing he could recognize. They seemed smooth-skinned, and there were dangling tendrils starting from halfway down the face. Their eyes were just vertical slits, like those of a goat or octopus. Yang easily stepped back, avoiding the tethers, not helping or hindering, just standing and watching. Alex was furious at his lack of support, but ignored the man and pulled free his smallest K-bar blade. He spun it in his hand until he held the dark steel and then launched it towards one of the humanoids dragging on Jackson's rope. The blade flew through the air so fast it was near invisible and then embedded in the center of one of the hideous faces. The figure disappeared soundlessly, and Jackson dropped a few feet. The figure was soon replaced by another, 
and the big soldier began to be pulled up once again. Alex took a step towards Jackson, but spun back at the sound of Amy yelling. She had her arms wrapped around Kate's waist as the woman was also lifted, kicking into the air. He was momentarily torn, but in another second both women were several feet up. He decided, then put his head down and sprinted. He pulled his last blade from its sheath, holding it backwards and then leaping. In one powerful movement, he grabbed and slashed the rope at Kate's neck, dropping her and Amy to the ground. He landed on his feet and called to Casey Franks, who was there to grab both women and drag them backwards, not bothering to check on their health until they were out of danger. Boss! Rhino now had hold of Jackson, whose eyes bulged as his oxygen was cut off. Above them, a large group of the humanoids tugged on the ropes, and both men were being lifted. Too many of them, Alex thought. Must be how Blake and the two PLA soldiers were overwhelmed. He ran again, jumping up and catching hold of Rhino around the waist. The big hawk still had hold of Jackson, who now had Alex clinging to his legs. The added weight made the soldier's eyes bulge ever more furiously from his head as his neck was being crushed. Alex began to quickly clamber up Rhino, but stopped when Jennifer's scream dragged his head around. She was already halfway up the wall, twisting and struggling like a fish on a line. He knew if he went after Jennifer, then Jackson would be lost. He couldn't be everywhere, and his frustration was knotting inside him. Young! The man ignored him. God damn it, Franks! He saw Casey run at the woman, and Alex then scrambled up the big soldier's body, once again ripping a knife free and hacking through the ropes holding him. They fell in a heap on the ground. He turned to see Casey jump in the air at Jennifer, spearing toward her, arm and hand stretching out. Her fingertips grazed the woman's boot as she slammed hard into the wall. But she was too late. In another second, Jennifer had been dragged into one of the windows and had vanished. Shit! Alex bared his teeth and lifted both men to their feet as if they weighed nothing. He yelled into their faces, Get them all back! He ran at Franks, who was now trying to scale one of the ropes. He was underneath her in a second and pulled her back down. The female hawk's face was creased with fury, and Alex pushed her back. Defensive position, that's an order. Her teeth were grit, and her eyes were defiant as they went from Alex to the landing Jennifer had just been hauled onto. Franks! Alex's hand came down hard on her shoulder. Casey nodded and headed back to the group, the hawks now hurting the others back. More ropes came down trying to snag them, and Alex didn't wait any more. He dived for one of the looping cords that flew down to try and encircle him. He gripped it and began to climb, rapidly ascending. When he got near the top, the beings must have suddenly decided that Alex, untethered, wasn't something they wanted to deal with, and the rope was let go. He fell backwards, plummeting the sixty feet to the ground. He spun in midair and landed hard but on his feet. He immediately stood straight the rope piling beside him. Holy shit! Awesome! said Jackson, his voice still painfully coarse. He coughed and looked back up. Did you see anything up there, Jennifer? I saw people, Alex said, I think. He backed up, keeping a watch on the windows. For now they looked empty. Pull in tight. The group gathered in. He turned to Amy and reached out to her. Are you okay? Amy nodded. Kate rubbed at the red mark around her neck, scowling. Hey, she croaked. I'm fine, too. Thank you for asking. Casey shined her light upwards, but the beam didn't reach the higher balconies. We need to get up there. They took Jennifer, and no two guesses as to where Blake and Yang's guys went. Rhino turned slowly. Down here were fish in a barrel. He turned to Alex. How many you figure, boss? Dozens. 
and probably a lot more we didn't see. Alex backed up a few more steps. We're going to have to climb, go after them. He turned. Everyone okay with that? Sung and Shen Jung looked dubious. Sung spoke quickly to her partner, who shook his head and then turned. We can stay here. That's not a good idea. Amy went and took the small Chinese woman's hand. We can haul you up. She turned to Alex. Can't we? Sure can, he said. And Amy's right. They'll be back. Ropes might not be the only thing they drop down. The pair looked at each other and then dropped their eyes. Alex took that as consent and went to the coils of rope still lying on the ground. He checked it quickly and then looped it over his shoulder and headed to the wall. He picked up speed and then leapt a dozen feet to the top of a stone column. It only took him a few minutes to scale to where the pale beings had disappeared. Easing over the edge, he saw he was in a long balcony or windowed corridor. As he had earlier suspected, it was another level. He crouched, waiting and listening. There was stillness and silence. He stood, quickly tying off the rope and tossing one end over. Franks, you're up. Casey didn't hesitate and scaled the rope quickly, arm over arm, as Rhino held it straight. In no time, she threw a leg in, through the window, and clambered in. Alex looked down. Rhino, rig a loop step. Amy, you're next. Rhino immediately set to creating a small loop in the end of the rope and showed Amy how to put her foot through and then hang on. Alex hauled her up in seconds, followed then by Kate, Sung, and then Shen Jung. Jackson was next, the big man climbing slowly as he struggled with his own weight. Rhino cupped hands around his mouth. Too many donuts, hey, brother? Jackson climbed in and then shot out his long arm, single finger flipping the bird. Up next was Yang, and then Rhino, the big hawk coming up with an ease and speed that told of someone who did this for a living. He stepped over the window edge, barely breathing hard. He held on to the rope. Leave this, boss? Take it. We need all the tools we can get our hands on. Alex called the group in close. We move fast and silent. I'll take point. Alex moved in near silence in the dark, slowing from time to time to listen and try and sense anything that might have indicated an ambush. When he came to bends or corners, he would stop and try and reach out, just using his senses. There was always the background hum of life, but for the most part it wasn't nearby. The ornate architecture became more decrepit. Whoever was residing in the old buried city hadn't been maintaining the tunnels for centuries. Perhaps the skills or the desire had been long lost. There was one change that seemed to be more gradual and evolutionary. The images carved into the walls became less articulate, as if the work wasn't undertaken by craftsmen, but instead now by simple cave artists. The pictoglyphs themselves stopped being about multiple deities, warriors, and kings, and morphed into being about one thing only, the coiled mass of the creature outside the cave, the kraken. Alex shook his head. It became their everything. At a T-shaped juncture, he slowed and then stopped. He could sense the crush of bodies ahead long before he saw them. Both sides of the hidden corridor end were jammed tight. Those beings were waiting for his group to round the corner, to catch them in some sort of crossfire. Alex eased back and then waited for the group to catch up. He held up a hand to Rhino, who then shot out an arm, stopping everyone. Around the bend, an ambush. We have a choice. Go back and find another way or crash through it. Punch it, said Franks. How did I know you were going to say that, said Rhino. He grinned at Alex. Do it. Jackson nodded. Let's get it over with. Alex turned to Yang. You get a vote, too. 
The Chinese captain didn't flinch. They have my people. We go forward. I'll go first, Alex said. We hit them hard and fast. Preserve ammunition, knives and knuckles. Wait, Kate said. The best weapon you have is your flashlight. They attacked us in the darkness, and I'm betting they see just fine. I think these guys have got to be dark adapted. Living in permanent twilight and darkness means they will have evolved masses of enlarged photoreceptor cells. Even weak light should hurt them. Alex nodded. Good, get your lights out. Franks, Rhino, left corridor. Jackson, Yang, the right one. On my word. The soldiers crept forward until they were just a few feet from the corner. Alex held a hand up and they waited. He closed his eyes momentarily and could hear the multiple breaths, feel the warmth of the crush of bodies emanating from the junction. There were many of them, staying silent, waiting. Alex counted down on his fingers. Three, two, one. Then dropped his fist. Lights came on, and the soldiers roared as they rushed forward. Chapter 53 Time, four hours, one minute, eight seconds, until fleet convergence. The Seawolf-class submarine, the USS Texas, had finally surfaced. There was no need anymore for the cat-and-mouse game of only a few hours ago. Commander Eric Carmack in the conning tower smiled ruefully and lowered his field glasses as he watched the wall of steel maneuver into place. The People's Liberation Army Naval Force had now assembled five more Luyang III-class destroyers to add to the Kunming's presence. Each of the sleek vessels bristled with weaponry. There were also two submarines just below the surface, and imposingly, an aircraft carrier called the Liaoning. This last one was a veritable mountain on the water. Carmack exhaled, knowing that way up on the deck of this floating monstrosity, they had a dozen Shenyang J-15 carrier-based fighter craft. The planes were fast and furious darts known as flying sharks. Bad news. Armed to the teeth and ready for war. He handed the glasses to his COB, Alan Henson. Henson took them, scanned the vessels, and then turned to look over his shoulder at the horizon. Our muscle is still hours away. Gonna get real crowded here soon. Carmack grunted, leaning forward on his forearms. This morning there'd been only two vessels of war on the water. Soon there'd be two mighty fleets, two horned bulls squaring off against each other, both pawing the ground and breathing fire. Think they'll try anything while they've got us outgunned and outnumbered? Henson asked. Commander Eric Carmack was the ranking naval officer and was given control of the approaching fleet. He knew that the naval war machinery arrayed for and against was formidable, and even deep diving would give little protection against the technology that could be brought to bear. He also knew that the modern Chinese ships had computer-assisted guidance systems in their depth charges. Good ones. Of course they were, because the tech plans were hacked straight from one of the U.S. secret military R&D databases. He smiled. Perhaps in the future there would be no need for armed head-to-head -head conflict, as everything would be fought in cyberspace. Maybe that'd be better, but who knew? He exhaled a breath that danced away from his lips like a small, frozen ghost. Carmack looked down into the iron-gray water. It was cold and deadly. His job was to make sure his men and women didn't end up in it, and if it came to it, to make damn well sure the other guys did. Unlikely, he said, clasping his fingers together. We can shoot over the horizon, they know that and already our satellites are probably staring right down the noses of their officers. Good, Henson said. 
Sanity prevails. Sanity? Carmack shrugged. In war, sanity is in short supply. Right about now, I'm betting there's a lot of nervous fingers on a lot of launch buttons over there. Someone gets excited or has a rush of blood, and a lot of people will die. Then, like a goddamn disease, the infection would spread to both our mainlands. He turned to Henson, leaning on one arm. Then onto their allies, and then... Fiery death on a global scale. Carmack turned back to look at the Chinese ships. They were so close he could see the individual officers on the bridge, glasses up, watching him. He waved. If it came to it, the Chinese were too close to miss. Unfortunately, so were they. General Chilton turned to the blinking phone. That phone. The red one that was a direct line through to the Oval Office. Jim Harker stood up and motioned towards the door. Chilton nodded. When President Paul Banning, the commander-in-chief, called, it was never just to ask how his golf swing was looking. And today, the potential for conflict in the Southern Ocean was a clear and present danger. He waited until the door was closed, sat down, and lifted the receiver. Encryptors and randomizers immediately went to work, ensuring that their communication would be invulnerable to all attempted intrusion. Mr. President, Chilton stared at the picture on his wall. It showed the USS Nimitz coming over the horizon at dawn. It always lifted his spirits. Marcus, the Secretary of Defense, has just informed me that I may need to prepare for some time in the mole hole. Yesterday I'm planning my holidays, and today I need to be secured beneath a million tons of concrete and steel because we could be going to war. You told me you had this under control. Just what the hell is happening down there? Chilton smiled. He knew the President had read the briefings. But it was ever the way that as soon as the rubber looked about to hit the road, then the questions, doubts, and nerves set in. Sir, the Chinese have assembled a small fleet in the Southern Ocean, just as we expected and planned for. I'm afraid things may get worse before they get better. That goddamn sub. In future, we should have a remote self-destruct on all prototypes. The President exhaled long and slow. How the hell do they think they're going to benefit from this, let alone be able to get it out and then get it past us? They're obviously going to claim international salvage rights, Chilton said. Oh, come on, Marcus, that's bullshit, and you know it. Even I know it doesn't apply to military vessels. You're right, sir. In fact, at the International Convention on Salvage in London of 1989... We all agreed that the uniform international rules regarding salvage operations, of which we and the Chinese attended and were signatory to, was that in no way would these rights apply to warships. So they haven't got a leg to stand on, the President sounded relieved. Correct, but they're relying on an earlier set of rules, Chilton said, and then quoted what he had just read. Those from the Brussels Agreement of 1910. They state that the law of salvage applies to anyone who recovers a ship or cargo after peril or loss at sea, and after a period of two years. They are entitled to a reward commensurate with the value of the property saved, or to the property itself. Jesus Christ, that's a joke. They know warships are a red line, the President said quickly. We know it and they know it. But all they want is time and a distraction. We'll need to take them to the international maritime courts. Of course we'll win, but by then they'll have pulled the sea shadow to bits. Bottom line, sir, is that the Chinese are poor initiators, but great imitators. In a decade they'll have reproduced enough sea shadow-type vessels to sneak in off the coast of most of our major cities. These are gifts we just cannot afford to give away. Chilton heard the president groan. Well, Marcus, what do we do here? I do not want to go down in history as the guy that started a war with China. 
For now, sir, we do nothing but wait. Our assets are en route, and will be there within a few hours. In the meantime, the Chinese will be making some aggressive displays to try and scare us off. But we don't back down. We don't even blink. We don't need to. We're the 300-pound gorilla here, sir. So we stare him down. The president clicked his tongue. I need more options, Marcus. You said it might get worse before it gets better. If that's the case, then you bring me those options ASAP. I want more choices than backing down or sinking ships, understood? Yes, sir. At this time, we have deployed two teams under the Antarctic ice, both under Jack Hammerson's oversight. Chilton leaned towards his computer screen to see if there were any updates from Hammerson. There were none. Well, that's good. Progress? the president asked. Some, but not all, what we want to hear. We've lost contact with both teams, but we believe at least one of them is down under the ice making progress towards the submarine. That's all I know for now, sir. Chilton knew Banning would want more, but he didn't have it. You believe? Can't exactly take that to the bank, can I, General? The president's voice sounded strained. Our teams just need time to secure or destroy the vessel. I trust Hammerson and his people. It's still the best option for a non-conflict outcome we have, Chilton responded calmly. Sounds more like the only option. The chair squeaked as if the president sat back. Okay, Marcus, we stay cool for now, but you keep me informed of anything else, priority one. We're all on the edge of the abyss here. Yes, sir. As the head of the U.S. Armed Forces, Chilton knew it better than anyone. At 1800 hours, I will authorize the raising of the security level from DEFCON 3 to DEFCON 2. I pray your team wins the day, Marcus. God help us all. The president disconnected. General Marcus Chilton swung back to the picture on his wall. He breathed easily, calmly. He always stayed cool. That's why they called him Chili. He also stayed cool because he prepared for anything and everything. He had his primary Chinese targets chosen, and they were following every ship, submarine, and aircraft they had via satellite. The first launch flare confirmation he got, he'd unleash hell. His eyes slid to a time banner on his computer screen. Four hours, one minute, eight seconds, until his war fleet arrived. God help us all, President Banning had said. He sat back. Amen to that. Joshua had the two superhero figures, one in each hand, Iron Man to his left and the Hulk in the other. He was sitting on the floor in Margie's office in the big building where Mommy had talked to the gray-haired man with all the lines on his face. Jack, he remembered. The man smiled a lot, but Joshua knew that he didn't tell the truth all the time. He had to see past his words and pull the truth directly from inside his head. Doing this gave both of them a headache, but the more he tried it, the easier it got, at least for him. The door opened again, and Jack came out. He handed something to Margie at her big desk, and then looked down and waved and saluted. Joshua grinned and returned the salute, Hulk and all. He held the man's eyes. When is Mommy coming back? Jack crouched and ruffled his hair. Soon, I hope. She just has to finish some important work for us. Joshua continued to stare reading the man. You don't know where they are, and you think they might be lost. Jack continued to smile, but inwardly he winced from the pain in his head that Joshua knew he was feeling. He could also sense that he was momentarily frightened. No, that wasn't right. The man didn't scare, but he sure didn't like it. Jack ruffled his hair again and stood. I promise you, Joshua, 
As soon as I hear something, I'll let you know. Mommy will be fine. He turned then to Margie, a brief look passing between them, and then he was back in his office. Joshua looked at Margie and sensed the waves of sympathy rising from her. She thought Mommy was lost too. He liked Margie. He smiled at her. She's fine. She was alive, he knew it, and so was his father. He couldn't wait to meet him, to talk to him. Peter was nice, but Peter wasn't like him, where Alex Hunter was just like him. He lifted the posable plastic figures in each hand. He turned to Hulk and made words for him. Don't worry, Mommy is happy and safe and coming home soon. He nodded and grinned and lifted Iron Man. His smile fell away and he stared, his brows coming together. The words came again, but they weren't his own this time. They won't make it out alive. The thing, the monster, knows they are there now. It wants them. To eat them both. Joshua continued to stare, his eyes shining wet for a moment more as his teeth ground together. Joshua? It might have been Margie's voice. He stared, unblinking, and his tiny fingers closed on the hard plastic figurine. Iron Man crushed into shards. Chapter 54 Alex was the first one around and was immediately confronted by a wall of pale, hairless bodies. The lights illuminated the horde in a frozen, glaring snapshot, and for a split second, even he was momentarily taken aback. The figures were powerfully built but smaller than normal, no more than four and a half feet at their tallest, and their bodies were chalk white. In their hands were all manner of stabbing and cutting weapons. But what had shocked Alex the most were their faces, or lack of faces. They were clay-like, near featureless, with tendrils dangling from the middle of their heads. No mouth could be seen, and though they must have been startled by the sudden appearance of the tall humans and their blinding lights, not a word or sound was made. Startled, they still came at Alex like a wave. Cutting and stabbing tools speared forth and chopped down. Alex felt numerous rents to his flesh, and despite his hawk suit repelling most, he knew he'd still be running blood. The muscular creatures displayed a sort of simian strength and agility, and at first Alex just pushed them back or brushed them aside, but they kept coming in greater and greater numbers. He then threw them back into the darkness, and finally the sheer numbers coupled with the ferocity meant he could not pull his punches any more, so he exploded into them. Alex grabbed an axe-like weapon from one creature, and his other hand clenched into a fist as he threw himself at the writhing, furious mass. He cleaved heads and limbs, smashed bones, and crushed all before him as they came. Behind him he heard the sound of his team, forcing back even more. The being's blood, warm and sticky, now coated the floor, ran from the walls, and also dripped from Alex and his soldiers. As quick as it started, the humanoids ceased their attack and sped back down their dark corridor, dragging away their dead and injured, but leaving weapons behind. Alex took off after them, diving and grabbing at one of the fleeing creatures. He disarmed it and held it up. Jesus Christ, what the hell are you? He came back into the group, holding the struggling thing up by the neck. What the fuck are they? Casey's mouth turned down in disgust. Rhino stooped to lift one of the weapons that looked like an axe, crafted from heavy-toothed jawbone, then stopped to stare at the being. Holy crap! That's not human, Jackson said, taking the jawbone axe from Rhino and hefting it. Take it easy, Kate said, peering around Rhino. It might have been once. Alex held the wriggling thing by the neck, 
its feet up off the ground. Maybe. He lowered it and then grabbed the dangling tentacles on the face. He lifted. Like I thought, a mask. He pulled it back. Frank scoffed. Oh yeah, like that's any better. Alex frowned, looking at the thing that now stood listless, as though resigned to its fate. Amy, Kate, I'd like your scientific expertise here. He turned it towards them. The being's face could barely be called human, even proto-human. It was so pale, the skin was near transparent, and the entire head was egg-smooth. The nose was non-existent, being just two slits in the center of the face. But it was the eyes that were truly alien. They were the size of chicken eggs and black as oil, shiny, and more like those of a spider. Ach, deformed, Yang said. You should kill it. Holy shit, said Jackson. Dark adapted. I bet it sees in an entire range of spectrums, Amy said. Wow. Kate ducked down to look into the eyes. She turned. Get that light away. Amy's right. Dark environment evolution. No wonder the light freaked them out. It's got almost total pupil to sclera ratio. Rhino also bent lower as the thing wriggled again in Alex's grip, now trying to reach around and bite his hand. He pointed and the thing's jaws snapped at his finger. He snatched his hand back. What's with that mouth? Hold him, her, whatever, Kate said. Alex gripped the thing tighter, and it calmed again in his hand, surrendering. Her by the look of that chest, Jackson said. Kate carefully reached forward, gripping the chin and holding it tight. With her other hand, she peeled the lips apart. Fuck me, said Rhino. What the hell are they for? The teeth in the small mouth looked to be just a single pair, one on the top jaw and one at the bottom. They were large, triangular wedges growing from both gums to scissor over one another. That's not normal, Kate said. No shit, said Casey. No, I mean it's not natural, even for this female. I can see that the tongue and larynx looked well formed. She should be able to talk. And by feeling the jawline and looking at the growth of the teeth at the gum line, I can tell it's a female only just out of her teens. But the teeth themselves have been altered, perhaps filed to be like this. If it can talk, make it talk. Yang leaned in close, his face twisted in disgust. It's like a beak, Alex said. Same association for the mask, the ultimate worship. Make yourself like your idol, or God. He turned to Rhino. Use the rope, bind her. It's like tattooing or scarification in primitive tribes, Rhino said, taking hold of her and looping the rope around her wrists and neck. Easy, Amy said. We humans do what we need to do to survive. The great Aztlan race collapsed and regressed. An ever-hungry god became their religion and their idol, and they in turn tried to become like it. So they reverted back to something primordial to survive in this primordial place. Yang continued to stare, but still looked like he had smelled something bad. The freak must talk! Well, it's freaky anyway, Rhino said, finishing his work and holding the rope like a leash. The small being looked down at her bound hands and then stood silently, her large black eyes unreadable. Yang pushed in close. Where are my men? Casey moved fast to intervene, grabbing Yang and spinning him so she could stare into his face. Back off, you're not in charge anymore. Yang glared at her and his fists bawled. Casey returned the cold stare her face twisted into its usual sneer. Just to be clear, I still want to kill you. 
Yang's lips momentarily twisted before he turned to briefly lunge again at the small creature. This time it bared its beak-like teeth at Yang and then opened its mouth wider. Alex felt the splitting scream deep in the core of his brain. He doubled over, his hands pressed to his ears. Amy rushed to him and knelt. What is it? Alex lifted his head, his eyes tightly closed from the pain. The sound! He opened his eyes to slits and looked across to the being, who then snapped its mouth shut with an audible clack of teeth. The sound was immediately shut off. Alex breathed deeply, feeling the white-hot needle of pain withdraw. It came from her. We heard nothing. Amy looked from Alex to the humanoid. Just like in the cave mouth. It's the subsonic wavelength again, a defensive mechanism. Alex got to his feet. Now we know where the sound came from but I don't think it was designed to cause pain, more like a call to its own kind, or to something else. He straightened. We need to be on guard. Alex looked off into the darkness and saw Yang watching them silently. The PLA captain turned to walk away a few paces into the dark. Shen Jung and Sung were talking quietly, standing away from the being. Alex ducked down, looking into the small, pale being's face. You're safe. She recoiled from him slightly. I'm sure we're as freaky to her as she is to us. He smiled. We mean you no harm if you mean us no harm. He repeated the words in his mind, trying to project them, the silence from the being making him think they might communicate by other means. She stood there as impenetrable as ever. It's unnatural. The silence freaks me out, Frank said. Like everything else down here, Jackson added. Guess they learned that being quiet is something that keeps you alive. Alex stood and pointed to himself, then the others. Then he pointed at her and made looping motions around her neck and then walked away. Where did you take them, our friends? He said slowly. Kate snorted. You can say it as slow as you like, Alex, but she isn't going to understand. The girl lifted her dark orbs to Alex, and he felt a sudden throbbing in his brain. She turned and started off down the dark tunnel, only stopping when she reached the end of her leash. You were saying? Casey asked with a grin. Give her some slack. Alex motioned forward, and she set off again. Keep the flashlights on and watch side corridors and also overhead. Don't want anyone having a noose dropped around their necks. Alex let the small being lead him. The tunnel narrowed with huge, age-patinated stone blocks having fallen from the ceiling or collapsed in from the walls. Alex stopped the girl at one of the fallen blocks, and looked up into the cavernous dark from where it had fallen. The rockfall was ancient, but the size of the boulders meant that if there were ever another cave-in, they would never be able to dig themselves out. Amy laid her hand on the wall. This building, this entire city, is carved from the surrounding cliff face. Like the ancient Jordanian city of Petra, the Rose City, Kate said, it's carved straight into the side of a mountain, but this, she slowly panned her light around, this far exceeds its complexity and size. It's a maze, said Rhino. Makes for good defensive fortifications, Casey said, against everything except earthquakes. Something sure hit it, Jackson said, but why is it a wreck on just this side? Good question. Alex turned back to the Stygian depths of the tunnel ahead. He noticed that the small female being was staring off into the darkness. He laid a hand gently on her shoulder. Hey, let's go. She turned to stare up at him with those glassy black orbs for a moment, 
before leading him again. Alex sensed the change in air density long before the tunnel ended. There's something up ahead. The small female being led Alex around more fallen blocks and then out onto a ledge, perhaps once a balcony. She stopped and pointed. Alex lifted a hand, keeping the group back, as he surveyed the new surroundings. After a moment, he stepped to the side and waved them on. They had passed through the cliff wall, or the wall itself was only a partition of one underground world to the next. There was another huge cavern, this one even hotter than the one they had left. It was also luminescently lit, but this world was dominated by a body of water, nothing like what they had encountered with the previous underground sea. It was more a lake, miles across. Steam like a low mist hung over its surface, and on some of the banks, mangrove-like plants stepped out into the water on stilt-like legs. At its center, bubbles popped, and small eddies swirled as submerged gas pockets were released from their muddy prisons. So much for the grand city, Jackson said. It ends here. Look down, Alex said, pointing to huge blocks half submerged. That rubble, I think this was part of the city, but somehow it collapsed into here. Maybe it's like a giant sinkhole, Sung said. These things happen in China a lot. There are big land drops that can swallow entire villages. Maybe this one opened under the city, swallowed it entirely. Long, long time ago, Rhino said. This collapse is damn old. Maybe it wasn't just the land falling in, but maybe something else trying to break its way in. I got a bad feeling this is something's backyard. Check out ten o'clock. Alex stared out at the far shoreline as a veil of mist lifted. Jackson squinted into the distance as the fog cleared slightly. His mouth hung open, and he adjusted the jawbone axe still stuck in his belt. No fucking way. This is why we're here, Rhino said softly. Lining one of the far shorelines were ships, dozens and dozens of huge vessels. Some were small skiffs and some were huge. There was even the skeleton of a World War II bomber plane, many of its panels missing, and one wing sagging onto the bank. Some of the boats had the three masts of centuries-old sailing clippers, ragged remnants hanging limply from the moss-covered wood. There were rusting iron hulks of cargo ships and even a fishing trawler. They were all lined up, side by side, like a child's collection. There's an old goddamn warship, side cannons, Rhino stepped forward. Remains of a Union Jack still hanging on the bow. He slowly read the name. S-A-P-P-H-O. The Sappho. It's almost dreamlike, Amy breathed the words. The mist, the ships. You know, this reminds me of something from childhood. Amy frowned as if searching her memory. That's it. The cove on Never Never Land, with all the ancient shipwrecks lost in time. Now crewed by ghosts, said Kate softly. No. Alex said, feeling a sense of elation. These guys weren't shipwrecked. They were brought here. He lifted an arm to point. Just like our sub. He couldn't stop the grin spreading across his face. They'd found it, the sea shadow. There among the decaying hulks was the submarine, smaller than normal, dented and crushed in the center, but still looking largely intact. The shadow, right damn there. Rhino turned briefly to high-five Jackson. But how the hell did these little freaks get them all down? No, no, they didn't do it. Look. Amy pointed to a different place on the lake's edge. There were two piles of round white objects. Alex ground his teeth. 
Skulls. Human skulls. They're fucking cannibals, Jackson said, looking down at the small female being standing ghostly quiet beside them. No wonder they file their teeth. Maybe, but I don't think they're the only suspect, said Kate. Cephalopods are smart, very smart. A sign of intelligence is constructive play, and it's been observed in modern octopus time and time again. Even in the wild, they will stack the remains of their prey into piles and then continue to rearrange them differently on different days. They play with them, like a child would play with its blocks. Oh, for fuck's sake, Frank spat. They're not blocks, they're freaking human heads. Bingo, good news, said Rhino. That little inlet on our three o'clock. I have Blake, Jennifer, and our PLA buddies. Tied to stakes at the water's edge were the four missing members of the group. They were in the lake to their knees, and Alex could see they'd been beaten. They had blood running from multiple wounds that could have been bite marks. The blood dripped into the water. Alex looked down at the small female humanoid, feeling a sudden rush of disgust and anger. She was already looking at him, as though seeing how he would react to the captives. She turned her unreadable eyes away from him. Casey was on the brink of the ledge. They're hurt, she spun. What did you little freaks do? She went to grab at the small female, and Alex pushed her back. Save it, Lieutenant. We're the intruders here. He knew exactly what Casey felt, but needed them focused for what came next. We got bigger things to worry about. I don't understand how. Rhino ran a hand up over his cropped hair. The ships, they came from outside. Are we saying this thing can get out? Yes, in and out, Amy said. Last time we were here, we found evidence of abyssal shrimp. They're crustaceans only found in cold and deep ocean water, not in these tropical temp underground seas. Somewhere, somehow, there's a vent between here and there. Best news I've heard all day. If it can get out, maybe we can too, Casey said. First things first, we get our people. Alex looked up and around at the cave walls. The cliffside was like a bombed building. There were far too many smaller caves, and ancient room cavities opened to the air. Damn, these little guys could be anywhere, and I'm betting our people aren't tied there just for fun. You're right. Got to be a sacrifice, Kate said evenly. We wondered how these people learned to live in harmony with the creature. I think now we know how. Doubt it. Didn't save the Aslantians above. They tried human sacrifice, but the cephalopod just ate its way through most of their virgins and then their slaves. Then it decided it wanted to come and get the rest itself, Amy said. This thing is smart, dexterous, and has senses well beyond our own. The only reason it doesn't compete with mankind for top spot is that it usually doesn't live that long. She snorted softly. But down here, that rule doesn't apply. This thing could be centuries old, maybe more. And it could be as smart as we are, Kate added. Could we try and communicate with it? Sung asked, reaching to hold Shen Jung's hand. Yang scoffed. Would the butcher listen to the sheep? We are food and toys and nothing more. It is in there, the lake, waiting for us now. The group turned back to the ancient black body of water, looking over its mist-covered surface, wondering what lay beneath that dark, liquid veneer, knowing there could be huge eyes on them even now. I can't sense it's in there, Alex said, leaning out, but I'm betting it was or will be soon. We only have two rifles, a pistol, and a few grenades. Rhino, Casey, you're the best shots. You stay at high ground and give us cover. Jackson, Yang, you come too. Rescue your own people. Alex straightened. 
The rest of you stay down and watch your six. Don't want more of these guys sneaking up on you. Alex looked back down at the people tied to the stakes at the water's edge. They were about twenty feet apart. First Blake, then Jennifer, followed by the two Chinese soldiers. They had all been stripped to the waist, and blood ran down their torsos. All were slumped forward, either from fatigue or pain. Alex pulled Jackson and Yang in closer. This is our staging point. We move fast, cut them loose, and come straight back here. Hopefully they'll be able to walk, but if not, we carry or drag them. Yang, do your men. Jackson, you get Jennifer, and I'll get Blake. He looked each man in the eye. Set? They nodded. Alex looked quickly back at his destination. The mist had started to thicken again. The ships now hidden behind the drifting curtain, and the far end of the lake was beginning to vanish. Alex went to turn away, but paused. And watch the water. He thought through his next few minutes and held up a hand. Three, two, one. Chapter 55 they ran, staying low and jumping over tumbled blocks larger than cars, maneuvering in and out of pathways between even bigger boulders. Alex went past one of the piles of jawless skulls, noticing that there were larger ones, human, some brown with age and looking perhaps thousands of years old. There were also smaller skulls, with filed teeth, like the humanoid they had captured. It seemed the sacrificial candidates were also drawn from the local population. They stopped behind a mound of rubble. A low, sprawling cover of green polyps hugged its surface, making it look like a giant dead animal with matted fur. Alex counted down again, and then they charged. As he ran with the others, he watched the water, but couldn't sense anything lurking below its surface. Also above them, the cliff sides were empty. Still, there was a sensation of life all around them, but for now it remained hidden. Alex was first to Blake and lifted his head. Hey there, buddy. The man had multiple wounds that could have been spear piercings or bites from the beak-like dentistry of the small beings. Am I glad to, to see you? Blake said groggily. We're getting you out of here. Be ready, soldier. Blake nodded slowly, and Alex quickly sliced through the binding around his hands, and then the straps holding him to the rusting iron rings on the ancient post. Alex noticed that the rings Blake was bound to still had remnants of dried flesh hanging from them. Well used, he thought. Blake fell forward into the water, and the liquid quickly revived him. He got up, staggered, and then Alex grabbed his arm. Can you walk? Alex held on. I'll damn well try. Blake shook his head once, trying to throw off both water and his stupor. He began to stagger beside Alex, picking up speed. Alex turned to see Jackson half-carrying Jennifer towards them, Yang and one of his already freed soldiers were cutting the bonds of the third. Once back at the staging point, Alex pulled Blake down with him and gave him a sip from his canteen. Do you remember what happened? Alex asked. Blake nodded. Yeah, they beat the shit out of us. And the little fuckers bit me, bit all of us. It was as if they were tasting us. He felt the shredded skin on his neck. Too many of them tied us up and left us. Jackson came in with Jennifer, who looked shaken but alert. She gratefully took Jackson's offered water. Thank God you came. I think they were waiting for the tide to come in or something. Jackson looked at Alex. Yeah, something like that. Alex lifted his head to look back to the water. What the hell is keeping... He bared his teeth, the words hissing from between them. That son of a... Yang had untied both his men now, but instead of them making their way back to their staging place, they were moving along the bank, 
towards the ships. Mother f Is he doing what I think he's doing? Jackson said, his mouth open in a disbelieving grin. He's going for the submarine. Alex's eyes narrowed, a hate welling up inside him that he could only barely contain. And then what? Jackson asked. Alex continued to stare. Then he holds his ground and waits to die, or for us to die. Alex's brows came together. Or maybe he doesn't have to do anything. I'm no engineer, but that powerful distress signal could possibly be adapted. He can tell anyone who's listening that he has found the submarine and is in control of it. At a minimum, it would be a propaganda coup for the Chinese government. What do you need us to do? Blake asked. Alex got to his feet. Yang's orders were to take the sub, and mine were to stop him. Let's get back, quickly. Alex and Jackson quickly dragged their injured team members back up through the tumbled boulders to where their group waited on the ledge. Fucking Yang. Casey Franks had the gun to her shoulder. Save it, Alex said. He turned to look up at the cliffs behind them and then overhead. There were no small bodies dropping nooses, but the sensation of life was growing with every passing second. The small being still lashed to Rhino, edged to the end of her leash to reach out to him. Her small, pale fingers curled on Alex's forearm. She pointed to her mask, which Amy still held. Alex looked deep into her black eyes and then nodded. Amy, give it to her. Amy handed it over, and the pale creature immediately pulled it over her head and face. That's an improvement, Casey said. She knows something, Alex said. The group fell silent and hunkered down, watching and waiting. Alex pulled out the walkie-talkie and turned to the three men sprinting across the rocks, now becoming indistinct in the shrouds of mist. Yang dashed across the moss-slick boulders, his two men trailing just behind. He always knew he would succeed in his mission. He knew his intellect was vastly superior and more formidable than the engineered American soldier Alex Hunter. The two small pings at his belt confused him momentarily, until he remembered his walkie-talkie. He smiled as he reached for it looking forward to the dialogue. You'll never make it, Hunter said. Yang grinned. But I'm nearly there. His grin widened. I think it is you who will not make it. Maybe I will watch from within the sea shadow as your skull is added to the pile. There was silence for a few seconds until the American's voice returned, now low and lethal. Don't make me come and get you. Yang scoffed. There was no way the threat could ever be exercised, so he decided to have some fun. Be patient, Hunter. When I find a way out, I'll be sure to tie up all loose ends, one being the collection of your son. He waited, but heard nothing but empty air. He could imagine the confusion from the man. Yang threw out a hand to keep his balance as he negotiated a particularly slimy group of boulders. The stink was near overwhelming the closer he got to the water. Decay, slick mosses, and something tangy that stung his eyes. Yang enjoyed the distraction and decided to continue goading the American. Your son was lucky last time, but even now we know where he is. Joshua, that is his name, yes? He is on the American base, alone, while you and his mother are down here. He couldn't contain his laughter or the jubilation he felt. The submarine was so close now, his success was assured. He sneered. Your American military can't protect its secrets, its technology, its people— and it certainly won't be able to protect one small boy. 
There came a sound like a growl over the walkie-talkie, and Yang gripped it harder. Imagine how much more valuable he will be if his father, the original Arcadian, is now dead. Yang concentrated on running for a moment and wished he could see Hunter's face, even just a glimpse. His breathing was becoming ragged, and he coughed, not just from exertion, but from the stink in the air around him that hurt the lining of his nose and throat. The submarine was no more than fifty feet away, half rolled towards him, and he could make out the hatch on top. He'd be inside in another few minutes. The gunshots were loud in the cavern, and just as the twinkling blue pinpricks of light went out, he felt the hard punch to the back of his thigh. The pain was excruciating, and he stumbled forward. He cursed, holding his leg to stem the blood flow from the bullet wound and climbing quickly to his feet. The lights began to come back on, and he lifted the walkie-talkie once again. That was the best they could do? He shook his head. One more taunt before he was inside. He turned to look back over his shoulder. Huh? He blinked in confusion. Only one of his men was following him now. His last soldier, who had been lagging from his injuries, had vanished. There was the rocky shoreline, the dark water, and further back, the twisted, mangrove-like plants. But there was no sign of his soldier, and nowhere else he could have gone. Yang, still limping from his bullet wound, turned back towards the sub, hobbling in a restricted sort of jog as he tried to lift his pace. The stink got worse as he got closer, and though his breath rasped loudly, he thought he heard the sound like someone had something stuck in their throat, and then came the soft splash of water. He turned briefly to his lone soldier, but saw he was now alone. The mist wasn't so thick that they could be hidden. No, they were both gone. There were no pursuing hawks, no ropes dropping down from above, and no bodies lying on the shoreline, shot by his enemies. They had just vanished into thin air or water. Suddenly the stink became more recognizable, and for the first time a surge of fear ran up the PLA captain's spine. Ignoring the pain and his bleeding leg, Yang began to run for his life. Yang's vision blurred, as the acrid odor was now so strong it became a stinging gas all around him. He didn't want to turn as he could sense something behind him, cold, huge, and indomitable. Water dripped onto his head and shoulders. He heard a small whine that could have only escaped from his own throat. As if it had a will of its own, his head began to turn. He couldn't stop the scream escaping his lips, and he lost concentration and coordination as his fear began to short-circuit his muscle movement. He raised an arm over his head and fired his revolver several times. The loud report of the revolver made the lights go out. In the pitch darkness, he felt the first touch of the thing, cold like slimy rubber and immensely strong. His mind conjured up an image of an elephant's trunk, and then the lights came back on. He screamed again, sanity slipping from him. The tentacle had him, circling his waist. He followed the limb to where it snaked from the water, and could see the behemoth just beneath the surface. Young's scream was long and loud as the thing lifted him, and then began to tighten. Chapter 56 Amy let Casey take the gun from her hands. Luck more than skill had guided the shot that had struck the PLA captain. She continued to watch, a grim smile on her lips. Young's body was held aloft, and then the green and black tentacle around his waist began to tighten. Young's screams became a moan as the squeezing continued until the coil met in the middle, just stopping at his spine. His body was crushed like a tube of toothpaste, all the contents forced to either end. He flopped in half, just the skin holding the two separated portions of his body. 
Only then was the carcass drawn silently down below the water's surface. Straight back to hell, Amy whispered. The group stood in silence for several moments more, and Amy could feel Alex's eyes on her. She wondered whether he was shocked by her callousness. She faced him and raised an eyebrow. After a moment, he nodded and turned back to the water. Shen Jung felt Sung burrow into him, pressing her face hard into his shoulder. He didn't want to watch either, and though he detested Yang, no man deserved the fate that had been inflicted upon him and his men. Oh, God, Jennifer said. We'll never make it past that. She looked around, almost panicked. We'll never make it. We need to go back, find another way. There is no other way, Alex said. Then we're dead, dead. Jennifer turned away, and Franks went to her, talking softly. It's a suicide run, Jackson said softly. It'd be suicide to sit here and wait for rescue, Amy said. We've got to check that sub. It's the only chance we've got. If it works, Kate said, her face pale. We overheard Yang and his men talking, Sung said, with a glance towards Shen Jung. The Sea Shadow's power source is nuclear, and everything internally was designed to deal with a highly damp and extremely caustic and corrosive environment. If the hull wasn't breached, then it could still be operational, Alex said. Rhino joined Jackson's side. Good enough for me. And one more thing to think about. If the hull wasn't breached, then there could be survivors. Shen Jung grimaced and looked back to the pile of skulls. Though some looked ancient, there were a few still a glistening bone white. This is wishful thoughts, he said to Sung. Blake was nearby and nodded, his face still pale. Your submarine disappeared in 2008, she said. If there was anyone inside that made it here alive, we doubt they survived for long. If it works, then it's got to be our way out, Amy said. No, it is our way out, Kate added. What are you thinking? Alex tilted his head. When you and I first dropped into the water, the sea, Kate started, we passed through a column of freezing water, a vortex. This corresponds to algal blooms in the Antarctic's coastal zones. We think it's due to an upwelling of warm water and unexplained phenomena in the freezing waters of the Southern Ocean. The water obviously came from here, she pointed. That sub. We need that sub. If it can still do what it was made to do, then that vortex might be a way out for us, an open sea tunnel. Alex exhaled and turned back to the far shoreline. Well, I got nothing else. But it's beached, Jackson said. How the hell do we get it back in the water? The props are still in the water. Reverse thrust and that thing will pull itself back in, Alex said. Then we need to get to it, Rhino said and smiled. This is going to be a rush. We need to think about this. There must be another way, Jennifer grimaced. Please. Every option now is probably a bad option, Amy said, her eyes on the group. They lingered on Alex. We just need to choose the one that gives us the greater return on our risk. Jennifer put a hand over her eyes and rubbed. By risk, you mean our lives. Casey cradled her gun. Well, I ain't staying here to become a member of the clan of the cave squid. She pointed a thumb at the small being that was still standing docilely behind them. And I like my teeth as they are. Alex turned to the small being and drew his knife. Best if she's not here when we're about to go to war with her god. Wait, Shen Jung said. Sung turned to him, and he tried to continue in English. 
You said the ultrasonic sound they made scared it off. Jennifer crowded in. Make her do it. She grasped the small being by the shoulders. Make her do it to protect us. How? Alex asked. I don't think I can make her understand. I'm not sure she'd want to help anyway. He went to cut her bonds, and Jennifer pushed his hand up. Then we keep her with us as a shield. That might work, Shen Zhong said. Alex looked over at the Chinese engineer, and Shen Zhong immediately knew that the American leader didn't trust him. He sighed. Perhaps not then. Alex cut the bonds and placed a hand on the being's shoulder. She lifted her mask, and the huge dark orbs stared into Alex's eyes for a moment before she looked down at her cut bonds, her long, deathly white fingers picking away the remnants of the cords and dropping them to the ground. She turned to Alex again, staring for a few more seconds before lowering her mask, and then, in an instant, she scampered away, dancing over the rocks like a goat. As soon as she was within a few feet of one of the openings, dozens of the small, pale folk appeared, to grab at her and take her in. They all held spears, knives, and loops of rope. They stared down at Alex and the group for a few moments before backing silently into their caves. Looks like we've got an audience, Rhino said. I think we always had one, said Jackson. Mighty Astlan, center of the world, and possibly the seed of all human wisdom, now reduced to cave dwellers, Amy said. All civilizations fall. It's not a matter of if, but when, Alex said. One thing these guys learn to do is survive, and anyone that can do that down here is pretty clever. He turned back to the group. We can't take this thing head on with the weapons we have. Options? Diversion, Casey said. I take one group over to the other side with a rifle and attract its attention, draw it to us. Keep it off you guys as you make it to the sub. Oh, please, can I be in that group? said Jackson, grinning. Because that sounds like a real long-term career option. He turned to the wounded hawk. What do you say, Blake? Casey grinned back. I accept your volunteering, especially since you'll make the bigger target. Forget it. Jackson is right, said Amy. She folded her arms, turning to Casey. You'd last about two minutes. It'd finish you off and be all over us again. Your death would be wasted. And then what do we do once we're in the sub? That thing is obviously big enough to move it around. It dragged it in here, for God's sake. And as for outrunning it, it probably overtook the sub when it first grabbed it all those years ago. We could just piss it off. She shrugged. Sorry, Casey. Jackson exhaled. Thank God for that. Jennifer looked pale, her eyes red-rimmed. Then we just get to the sub and seal ourselves in, wait it out. Fish in a bottle, Kate said, shaking her head sadly. Ever heard the story of the biologist who gave an octopus a puzzle once? He placed a small fish in a jar and screwed the lid tight. Now the octopus had never seen a jar before and didn't know how it operated, but it wanted the fish real bad. She sighed. It took the octopus ten minutes to work out how to undo the jar, and then it ate the fish. Oh, God, we'd be the fish, Jennifer giggled, We'd be the tuna in a can. I don't think it'd even need to wait. It could rip the sub in half if it wanted to, Alex said. Amy looked back towards the vessel. We use what we learned. This thing flees from heat, and we know it vanishes at the first hint of a cave-in. How can we use that? We create a cave-in by pushing some of those boulders down on top of it, Casey pointed. Up there, that overhang should do fine. Hanging above the ships was a shelf of stone, hundreds of tons of dark rock jutting out over the lake. 
No, too risky. We could crush the sea shadow, Alex said. But I like the idea of creating a cave-in and panicking it. We can simulate a collapse with an explosion. He held up the grenades he took from the PLA soldiers. At least we can give it an upset stomach. Kate raised her head to peer over the rock barrier at the lake. The mist was rising again. All quiet. Maybe it's sated for now and gone back to its midden. That's where it... As if in response, the water broke as a tentacle lifted from the water just in front of them. They hunkered down, but it wasn't seeking the group. Instead, it gently unfurled at the mound of skulls, dropping another onto the top of the pile. This one was fresh and with streaks of flesh still clinging to it. Another tentacle snaked from the water, and a similar skull was carefully placed beside it and then rearranged until the creature decided it was in its right place. Alex could see the gigantic mass spreading below the water. The monstrous bulk just beneath the surface looked like a mottled green and black stain. Two car-sized, unblinking discs watched its own handiwork as it arranged and rearranged its toys. Satisfied at last, its tentacles eased back below the surface without a ripple, and then the rubbery mass dove into deeper water to digest its last meal or wait for more to come. I feel sick, Jennifer said, sitting back down by Blake. Alex held out one of the grenades. Casey, you get one and I'll keep the other. On my word, you launch yours. Hopefully we won't need two, but we don't know what it's going to take to scare this thing off. Scare it off? Jennifer giggled dementedly. Did you see that fucking thing? It's as big as a jumbo jet. And you think throwing a firecracker will scare it off? Jackson put a hand on her shoulder. It's okay, Jen. I'm scared, too. And you know, if you get a firecracker in the eye, you're going to have one hell of a bad day. He smiled and shook her shoulder. So good a plan as any, and if it leads to us getting out of here. Jennifer hugged herself tighter, lowering her head and moaning. With the plans rapidly forming, Shen Jung suddenly felt nervous about his place in the group. Will you take us, too? He had an arm around a shivering Sung. Alex turned, frowning. Huh, what? Will you take us on the submarine? Shen Jung asked again. We can help once on board. No one gets left behind, Alex said. But you need to keep up. This is a one-shot deal. If anyone falls behind or deviates, then no one is going back for anyone. Understand? Alex held his eyes, and Shen Jung was sure he meant it when he said that if they fell behind, he would leave them without blinking. Alex turned away and sucked in a deep breath. We go two by twos, Rhino with me at lead, followed by Amy and Kate, then Jackson and Jennifer, and then Sung and Shen Jung. You are each responsible for your partner. Blake and Casey, you're my bookend at the rear. You've got to have eyes in the back of your head. You ready? Casey grinned, holding the grenade in her fist. Muscles and veins bulged in her neck. Let's fucking do this. Jackson drew forth the jawbone axe he had tucked into his belt, hefting it. Ready. Not much of an arsenal, Kate observed. It'll have to do. We don't need much, said Amy. This thing sees humans as little more than food or something to play with. It hasn't regarded us as a threat for perhaps centuries. And I'm betting it underestimates us. We will have the element of surprise. We teach it a lesson, or at least give it a damn good bellyache, Rhino said, hitting Jackson on the shoulder. Ready? Alex asked. There were nods, and Shen Jung felt his pulse start to race. He squeezed Sung's hand, who looked up at him with an ashen face and round eyes. She nodded. Three, two... Alex looked at each of them as he counted down. 
Go! He turned and leapt over the boulder and began to pick up speed. They were about halfway to their destination and to where the cliffs intruded close to the lake, forcing them all nearer to the oil-dark water. Tactically, Alex realized, if he was planning a sea-based ambush on his group, this is where it would come from. Sure enough, he began to sense the creature and looked to the lake's misted surface. He knew down below it was gliding closer, its excellent vision seeing the small bodies running along the water's edge. Heads up, he yelled, watching the water as he ran. He saw the mottled stain spreading beneath the surface. Luminous circles began to flare, and the creature's body changed from green-black to a brick-red, and then to a muddy brown, as he guessed the massive cephalopods' chromatophores were firing, matching its excitement level. Why not? It was enjoying the game, Alex knew, especially as it got to eat its toys at the end. The monstrous creature surged forward, and Alex pulled the pin on the fragmentation grenade and threw it. Fire in the hole! The group crouched as the explosion thumped below the water, sending a geyser into the air. The lake erupted for hundreds of feet as the creature shot away from the bank so fast it left a huge whirlpool eddy on the surface. It's working, Amy said, and the group began to increase their pace. A bow wave raced around the farthest side of the lake, five feet high. It was like the wave given off by the bow of an ocean liner, except the huge moving object wasn't above the water but below. The wave turned when it was about half a mile away, coming back towards them for a few hundred feet before slowing over the deeper water. Gone deep, Kate yelled. I think we did it. Nope, it's coming back. Faster, Alex shouted. Franks, you're up. Casey fingered the pin on her grenade but held it. I got nothing back here. Shit. Jackson started to run harder, dragging Jennifer with him. When they were only 200 feet from the sub, the wave rose again in the middle of the lake. And then between them and the first of the ships, the thing exploded from the water, beaching itself and dwarfing the ships behind it. The creature continued to boil from the water, coiling and tangling like a handful of monstrous worms knotting and crawling over each other. The acrid smell was overpowering. Suddenly the idea that a single remaining grenade would send it packing seemed a hideous joke. Franks! Alex yelled. The female hawk sprinted forward, her arm raised. A tentacle shot towards the group, and Alex lifted his pitiful K-bar blade but the club moved past him, choosing a different target. Jackson saw the coming appendage and pushed Jennifer to the ground. Shut your eyes. He moved to the side, drawing its attention and lifting his makeshift axe, swinging with all his might, striking the rubbery mass and opening a foot-long gash in its flesh. Purple blood splashed the rocks. Fuck you, he yelled. He readied himself for the next swing while the thing lifted higher, as though wary now. Get moving! Blake yelled. Jackson stood, legs planted, holding the jawbone axe ready. The tentacle hovered about fifty feet above him and then came down with blinding speed, swatting down upon his body, flattening him as if he were an annoying bug. When the thing rolled back up, there was a large red smear across the plate-sized suckers, and only a pulpy mass where the huge man had been seconds before. Jennifer's scream was like a siren that stretched across the water. Casey was finally close enough and pulled the pin on her grenade, throwing it like a pitcher. It flew fast and straight, tucking in under the creature's bulk. She kept running to dive across Jennifer, who was getting up from her knees and looking like she was preparing to run somewhere, anywhere. The fragmentation grenade detonated in an ear-shattering blast. Gobbets of meat showered the group, and there came a hideous alien screaming like something from the very depths of hell. Rocks were pushed aside as the thing coiled in on itself, 
wrapping tentacles around the train tunnel-sized wound in its side and drawing back into the water. It fled, moving impossibly fast for a creature that big, and soon sank without a trace. Now, now, now! Alex yelled, running hard. Chapter 57 Sink the USS Texas! Minister Chung Wan Lin stood immobile at the head of the group in the large meeting room, his expression implacable. Around the polished table, General Bang Guo sat in the center, and fanned out to his left and right were eight other generals of the Chinese armed forces. This was a war council, and Bang Guo knew that cautious words mattered now. Bang Guo felt his comrade peers waiting on him, as he was the ranking officer in the room. Though Minister Chung Wan Lin was the senior party official, when it came to military matters, it was not up to him to drive armed forces' strategy. Then what? Bang Guo asked. Wan Lin narrowed his eyes. Then, General, we will have educated them. We will have shown them what happens when they disable our ships, blow up our bases, take our soldiers captive, and kill our personnel. He smiled coldly. Should I go on? Bang Guo observed that the man looked agitated, energized, and there was a fire of zeal behind his eyes. He needed to be careful with him. Honorable Minister, Bang Guo remained ice calm as he leaned forward. The moment I order that strike, China and America, the entire world as we know it will change forever, and perhaps not for the better for us. Wan Lin's lips compressed. Dear Minister, do you know how many nuclear warheads China has? Bang Guo asked. Wan Lin stayed motionless, and Bang Guo responded for him. About 280. He tilted his head. Do you know how many nuclear warheads, including tactical, strategic, and non-deployed weapons, the Americans have? Bang Guo waited for a moment and then smiled with little humor. Approximately 4,800. The general held out his hands. I am not afraid to die for my country, but I will not consign millions of my citizens to the same fate over some minor friction which history might contend we initiated. We should be careful about poking a bear, minister. A bear? Wan Lin harumphed. A dragon eats bears. He stared unblinking at Bang Guo. I did not know that courage was something in such short supply. Wan Lin craned his neck towards the general, his face going red. I have already discussed first strike option with the president. He smiled. We can contain them and minimize our own losses if we strike first, hard and at multiple targets. He scoffed and leaned back. Do not fear bears in the age of the dragon, General Bang Guo. He lowered his brow. You will initiate a strike against the American submarine. That is the order, General. Launch the strike or resign your post. Bang Guo didn't move didn't even blink. He feigned indifference, even though he had a burning urge to leap from his seat and pound this upstart into the ground. Neither of the minister's options were acceptable to him. But he needed more time. Wan Lin was a politician, not a soldier, and that meant he dealt in persuasion, subterfuge, and outright deception. Wan Lin was moving too fast. Bang Guo needed to slow him down. Show me the order. Wan Lin bristled. I just gave it to you. Bang Guo smiled, his eyes calm. Not from you. An order of this magnitude needs to be cited by all the generals and myself. Please show me the directive from the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. 
At the use of the president's full title, Wan Lin's face looked about to explode. But after a moment, the angry color leaked away, and he seemed to ease. Then he smiled. This worried Bang Guo more than anything else. Then you shall have your presidential order. Wan Lin's phone beeped, and he took it from his pocket. He looked at it briefly before putting it to his ear. He grunted and turned away for a moment. Put it up on screen, he said quickly, and immediately the wall behind him came to life. He stood to the side with his back to it, facing Bang Guo and the other generals at the table. You think the threat is over? While you hesitate, they murder us, and then insult us by picking over our corpses. The satellite screen image drilled down from the heavens to focus on the blackened stain on the snow and ice. The wreckage of the Chinese base could barely be made out among the still smoldering debris. A figure in a white snowsuit with an American military snow ski parked to the side walked in among the debris, stopping now and then, lifting items and dropping them. Wan Lin's eyes slid to Bang Guo. A further insult. Deal with it forcefully. Show them your metal. He turned and left the room, the door banging shut behind him. Bang Guo sat staring at the screen. He sighed. Dragons eat bears, he whispered, shaking his head. He turned to the man next to him. I have no choice. Get me the Kunming, priority one. Launch, launch, launch! Klaxon horns blared within the USS Texas. Bulkhead doors were sealed, and the interior lights switched to red. Men moved to their posts, fast but calm. Commander Carmack ran to the bridge, yelling orders as he went. Who fired? What and where? In the bridge room, Henson was beside him in an instant, and the pair quickly took to their stations. Here, too, the lighting was now a hellish red, with multiple screens making the attending officers' faces glow an alien green. The Kunming, sir, fired one ship-to-shore missile, possibly a silkworm or dragon claw. The officers stared hard at his screen, reading lists of data as it rapidly scrolled. Reaching Mach 1 now, determining course and target. Henson went and stood behind the man, reading the data along with him, his face green with the light and his eyes fixed. God damn it! Carmack gritted his teeth and prayed it wasn't on its way to McMurdo. If it was, he would have no choice but to retaliate. Prepare to dive. He licked suddenly dry lips. Henson looked up, frowning. Target is the Shui Long base, their base. What? Carmack rubbed a hand up through his hair. Maybe they're sanitizing the site, Henson said. He turned back to the screen. Forty seconds to impact. Sanitization? I hope that's all it is. Carmack folded his arms. Sergeant Monroe's guts ached. His people were out of range, missing or even dead for all he knew. He cursed Jack Hammerson for involving his team. They were regular soldiers, not special forces. He kicked a smoldering beam from his path and cursed some more. Monroe bent to pull up another smoking piece of debris. There was nothing that remained of the Chinese base. No survivors, no clues and he had no idea what he was looking for or actually doing on the foreign nation's site. Rendering assistance, he might have said, if someone asked him. He lifted something that might have been the sole of a boot. In reality, he just wanted some sign, anything, any clue, that might tell him his team had all gotten into the tunnels, and even better, that there was a way he could get them out. Sergeant Wild Bill Monroe paused and tilted his head, listening. He could swear he heard a bird whistling. He turned. 
The missile impact and detonation carved a crater 50 feet deep and a hundred wide. It melted snow and blasted ice and rock far out over the landscape. Nothing remained of the already decimated base, or the last human being to ever set foot there. Sam leaned over Sully, watching the wonders and monstrosities that passed in and out of Orca's tunnel of light, which was thrown forward into the black water. A while back, a fish, if that's what it could be called, had glided into the light. It was big, its head armor-plated, and its eye was like something set in a mechanical swivel. Sully had halted the submersible, lest the living battering ram decided to turn and make a run at them. It circled for a minute or two, and then glided off into the darkness. Earlier they had been traveling on the surface, using the blue twilight to navigate, instead of the energy-hungry lights. But that, too, had proved a mistake. They had been forced to dive again, as something the size of a glider swooped down from the huge cavern's ceiling. It was all leathery wings and needle-toothed snout, and it had snatched at Orca, but probably been surprised to find there wasn't flesh to sink its talons into, but hard shell. Orca had dropped back into the water, and they had immediately dived again. Sam straightened, wondering what it would have been like to be in that warm water, free-floating, exposed to all that. Or maybe worse, in that land, with just your wits and a truckload of courage. This was the job they did, he knew. But this was one hell of a tough gig. He grimaced, remembering that Amy Weir was also down there somewhere. Sam's comm unit pinged, and he walked a few paces away from the scientists. It was Hammerson on the line. Boss? Sam, please tell me Bill Monroe is with you. Sam frowned. No, sir. Haven't seen him for several hours. Ah, goddammit. He must have gone over to the Chinese base. Hammerson exhaled. The Chinese just put a ship-to-shore missile on their base. There's nothing left. Fuck it. Sam had liked the McMurdo sergeant. Did they know he was there? Hammerson snorted softly. What do you think? Yeah, no accident. They wanted to send us a message, Sam said. Time's just about up. Tell me what you've got. Nothing more than what we know. We think Alex survived, and we're following the shoreline. The Brits here have calibrated their submersible to pick up the Sea Shadow's distress beacon. We're following it along a type of coast where we believe Alex has entered. All we can do is watch and wait. Time is the enemy now, Sam. The Chinese fleet has assembled in the Southern Ocean, and we'll be there within the hour. The President has moved us up to DEFCON 2, so a lot of fingers are on buttons across the globe. Pray Hunter gets to that submarine first. Pray for sanity, Sam said. And if that doesn't prevail, then pray for a quick and overwhelming war, Hammerson responded evenly. Keep me updated. He clicked off, and Sam turned back to the screen, feeling a knot of impatience coil inside him as he watched and waited. Chapter 58 Time, 0 hours, 30 minutes, 18 seconds, until fleet convergence. In another few minutes they were at the hull of the submarine. Up close, Alex could see the damage. The entire vessel looked compressed, as if by a huge hand. It was lying half in the water, with one side tilted towards them. Alex clambered up first, seeing the hatch swung wide, as if the submarine crew had climbed out and left it open in the event they needed to scramble back in fast. He doubted any who left ever made it. He looked around at the cave of the Kraken one last time, if the Sea Shadow crew did survive, he imagined they must have thought they'd arrived in hell. He looked back at Amy, and then nodded before jumping into the hatch. 
He was first to drop down into the vessel and crouched, staying motionless and trying to sense anything or anyone moving inside the metal tunnels of the submarine's interior. He inhaled dampness. At his feet there was some water, but not enough to indicate a tear in the sub's skin. Further in, he saw there were a few small lights on. He knew that without a breach, the nuclear-powered electric generator would have kept on humming for fifty years. One after the other, his team dropped down behind him. Alex stood slowly and sniffed again. There was something missing, the odor of decay and corruption. There were no bodies here. Even ancient corruption could paint the walls with fats and oil that lingered for decades. Rhino was last in, thumping down heavily and then turning to pull the hatch shut behind him and screwing it tight. He stood leaning forward, breathing heavily, and with his forehead pressed against the metal ladder bars. After another few seconds, he pushed back hard. God damn, Jackson! He rammed one huge fist into the sub's wall, making a dull thud run through the hull. He lowered his head again, crushing his eyes shut. Casey held on to Jennifer. The McMurdo woman looked to be in shock. She lifted her head to look at Alex. Her mouth worked, but no words came. Rhino punched the sub hull again. Brinovsky! Alex's voice brought Rhino's head up. Brave men die young. Alex then turned to Jennifer. He was a good man, but the time for mourning is later. Let's go home, Sung whispered. Works for me, Casey said. Rhino stood straighter and nodded once, and then Alex spun away from him. You heard the lady, let's go home. Blake, get to the bridge. Frank, see what's working. Rhino, down to the torpedo room. I want to know what we're still packing. Everyone else, a quick reconnoiter of stores. What have we still got? Five minutes, double time, and then we meet on the bridge. Alex went quickly along the steel corridor to the bridge room. It was small, and there was a central column with a periscope. Casey immediately pushed at it, but nothing happened. Dead, she said looking around in the confined space. She whistled. No wonder we want it back. Even though the submarine was nearly a decade old, it looked more like the inside of a spaceship than that of an undersea vessel. Gleaming panels with banks of now darkened lights and small screens set into bench tops and walls. A single steering column with a U-shaped wheel had a swivel seat that Blake immediately slipped into and began fiddling with buttons. Alex saw that blood ran from Blake's multiple wounds, down his arms and onto his fingers. Fix that bleeding, mister. On it. Blake wiped his hands on his pants, turning about, searching for something he could use, as Alex went to the main console, the only one that still glowed softly. There was a single square light blinking at its center and one word printed there, Reboot. He placed his fingertips over it and exhaled slowly. Come on, baby, you can do it. He pressed down and waited. Images of Joshua flashed through his mind, and his hand pressed even harder onto the glowing button. You damn well better do it, he urged. There was nothing. Alex imagined the electric drives reaching out to ask the question of the high-energy reactor plants and receiving empty silence in response. He waited and felt a chill creep up his spine. There was no plan B. The blinking reboot sign had vanished, and the screen remained dark. Alex could feel eyes on him. If the engines wouldn't start, they would expect him to come up with something else. He knew there was nothing else. Please, baby, please. He placed his fingertips against the screen, praying now to everything and everyone he could think of. 
There was a tingle at his fingertips, static. And then a tiny hum and a sensation of a draft, as if the sub was drawing its first breath in years. The nuclear onboard computers and reactors would have been sent into hibernation mode, awaiting a call to arms. But receiving the call, they fired up, and then bank after bank of light panels came on. Overhead, lights began to cast a soft glow down on them as the machine came to life. We got juice! Casey yelled as she was able to launch the periscope. It slid up silently and smoothly, and she leaned in to the eye cups. She began to pan. When she finished her rotation, she pulled her head back a fraction. Yo! Clear on all quadrants! The speaker pinged, and Rhino's voice came over the comms. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard the USS Sea Shadow. For your pleasure and protection, we have four torpedoes, conventional fish, and all looking like they just came out of their wrappers. Alex smiled. Good work, and that'll do. It has to. Amy was one of the first back, trailed by Kate, and then the rest of the team crowded into the small bridge room. They shared information. There were no rations, and the quarters were in disarray. It suggested that the men and women who had survived lived for some time on board, perhaps finally venturing out to their deaths. Amy shuddered at the thought of these brave men and women who were destined to have their heads end up as mere playthings, stacked neatly at the water's edge. She watched as Alex moved fast to the side of the room, and she stepped out of the way, knocking something from a panel top to the floor. It looked like a folder. Alex turned to Blake. Jennifer was now fussing over his wounds, tying strips of her shirt over the deepest of them. Here we go, people. Pumping. Now. He engaged the pumps, and a steady vibration could be felt through the vessel. He straightened, looking relieved. Good. Let's give it a few minutes to do its job. At least then we won't tear the shadow's belly out on the bottom. Amy bent to pick up the folder, surrounded by a hard plastic cover. She opened and began to read. What have you got? Kate looked over her shoulder. It's a log of the sea shadow. She frowned as she skimmed the pages. Log of Commander Clint O'Kane, USS Sea Shadow, dated 13 Oct, 2008. She looked up. That's a day after it went missing, isn't it? Yes, read it. Read that day, Alex yelled, as he and his team rushed from console to console. Might give us an idea of what the hell happened. Amy started to flip more pages through to the last few entries. Here we are, she said, and started reading aloud. Log entry 112, date 13 Oct, 2008, 1300 hours. Most of the crew rendered partially deaf from rapid depth compression. Hull has held, and the reason why we are still alive. Somehow we've run aground, and it is impossible to reconcile what we are seeing with the instrument readings. It says we are at a depth of over 6,000 feet, well below crush range. But we are on dry land, or partial dry land. Whatever attacked us seems to have vanished. Did it bring us here? Why? Periscope and view screens show semi-dark atmosphere, like twilight, but chronologically it's all wrong. Sending a crew out to investigate. We will attempt to refloat when they return. End log entry 112. Amy's hands gripped the log tighter. It proves they made it and were alive when they got here. She licked dry lips and turned the page, reading aloud again. Log entry 113, date 14 Oct 2008, 0200 hours. Last night the thing returned, shaking the submarine, rolling it and lifting it up, 
like a child with a rattle. It's gone now, but our sanity is being tested. Worse is, there is still no sign of crew. Party gone for over twelve hours. This exceeds orders for exploratory time frame. Sergeant Anderson was leading party, not a man to deviate from orders. We'll not attempt to refloat until all crew accounted for. Communications are not working. No signals picked up. We're transmitting and hope to God someone can hear us. We know now we are in some sort of cave below the ground. There are other ships, all sizes, some from ages long past. What is happening here? Insane. Some sort of Bermuda Triangle. Or perhaps we all died and are really all in hell. I must look for my crew members and will personally lead a second team to find missing men. End log entry 113. She looked up, feeling a wave of nausea run through her. She could feel the man's fear and confusion in every word. The other ships might have given the creature nothing but drowned bodies to pick over. But the Sea Shadow and its doomed crew was the first vessel the massive cephalopod had brought to its lair that contained something alive and something to torment. Amy wanted to help. She wanted to save them, or at least yell out to O'Kane and his crew to stay inside the submarine. But it was all too late, years too late. She pushed the images of the piled skulls from her mind once again. She swallowed a lump in her throat and felt the eyes of the group on her now. Even Alex had slowed in his workings to listen. She looked up at him. Go on, he said softly. She turned the page. Log entry 114, date 14 Oct 2008, 0600 hours. It was in the water, waiting for us. It took the men, snatched them up like they were nothing. It must be the thing that dragged us here and has been stalking us ever since. Amy paused her reading. In her mind she saw the huge Ben Jackson swatted like a fly, and the Chinese soldiers snatched up like they weighed nothing. It would have been a nightmare to tear at these poor submariners' sanity. She continued, wishing for the log entries to just end now. It's been waiting for us to come out the whole time. Sidearms distributed, and we've sealed the hatch, but we know it is out there. We can feel it pressing against the hull. I think it could come in if it wants to. Down to three men, Morrison, Drake, and myself. Just enough to run the submarine, but not even sure what we'd do then. Go where? We're trapped. End log entry 114. Oh, God. Amy could feel the men's fear. She had felt it herself. When she had escaped from the caves before, she had then spent time researching the giant creatures. Something that had caught her eye was an ancient Hawaiian tale. The tropical waters of the islands sometimes played host to the giant creatures. Though nothing like the monster down here, the threat to their fishermen was well understood. The Hawaiian ancestors had thought that these many-legged creatures were actually aliens who came to Earth long before humans existed. Perhaps this is what O'Kane and the fragmenting minds of his crew would have imagined, that their submarine had somehow been transported to a distant world and the horrifying, unearthly being attacking them was a denizen of that world. She drew in a deep breath. This next is the last entry. Log entry 115. Date 25 Oct 2008. 1800 hours. Ten days sealed in now. Morale low, but first sign of hope has presented itself. There are people out there. Can see them moving in the shadows. The creature is gone for now. Maybe they have scared it off. We're going out to try and talk to them. We'll leave the hatch open in case we need to run for it. Maybe the people can help us. Our distress beacon is still active. Can anyone hear us? 
God help us all. Commander Clint O'Kane, USS Sea Shadow. End log entry 115. Amy flipped a few more pages, shaking her head. Her eyes were blurred, wet. That's it. They went outside, and then that's it. The room fell silent. O'Kane had been given a devil's choice. Stay inside and starve slowly, or leave the metal coffin they were in, and die quickly. Amy knew it was the same coffin they were all in now. She shut the log. So going out to meet the people probably wasn't a great idea, Casey said at last. And if we stay, that'll eventually happen to us, Kate said. Then we get out, Amy said. This lake in here must join up with the outside sea somewhere, somehow. That's what I was thinking. Alex looked up from the instruments. Maybe during king tides or during quakes, it opens and shuts, makes another vortex like the one we encountered in the sea. This thing slips out, grabs some more toys, and then comes home where it's nice and warm so it can play and eat in peace. This is its home. We are the intruders, Sung added. It has all the time on its side, and we have limited food, water, and breathable air. She licked dry lips. We cannot wait for an earthquake, or for the monster to return and pry us out of here. The group was silent, but most nodded, agreeing with the Chinese scientist's bleak assessment. Alex rubbed his stubbled chin. Sung's right. He stopped in front of Amy. Amy, anything we can use. Kate, come on, what can we use? Amy frowned, her eyes on the floor, remembering her experiences and research. Cephalopods are learning creatures, she said. Every encounter with mankind it has had, it has learned more about us, what we are more or less likely to do, how we will react. She looked up into Alex's eyes. Those boats out there, some are hundreds of years old. That means it or its ancestors has been doing this for centuries. It knows us, but all we know is that it's voracious, aggressive, and smart. In the wild, this thing's smaller cousins have all those characteristics and are very territorial. This is its turf. Maybe if we can move it off its turf. She shrugged, knowing it wasn't much. That's right, Kate said. Orthocones were the alpha predator for millions of years. When most life in the oceans was tiny, these things were already thirty feet long. It can outrun us, outweigh us, and certainly outlive us. We're only alive because it doesn't want us just yet. That fucker has got us right where it wants us, Casey said, fists bold. Then let's get the hell out of here or die trying. Alex turned, opening the comm to the torpedo room. Rhino, load tubes one and two. Blake, it's crash or crash through time. This lake is separated from the main sea by some sort of sea wall and the creature has got to be using an opening in it. We need to find it. Excuse me. Shen Jung's voice was almost apologetic. But we could bring this entire place down on top of us. We have already seen that this type of rock is subject to fracturing. Alex gave the Chinese scientist a flat smile. And if we stay, we get eaten alive, which is better. No, no, I agree, we must leave but we may be able to use the fracturing to our advantage. Selective collapse of the geologic substructure, Amy said. Alex nodded. Okay, good. Franks, anything outside? All clear on the scope. Casey pulled her face back an inch. What's the plan, boss? Once we're out, we find that sea vortex and ride it out. If it's within the depth capability of this submarine... We may just pop up outside. If not, we're a crushed can on the bottom of a cold ocean. Maybe not, Sung said. 
If there is a vortex causing the water column to be in agitation, then the pressure might be bearable. She turned to Shen Jung. I think this might work. Shen Jung nodded. Yes, I see. We have observed that the properties of water molecules remain disparate the more the water is moving. Also, warm water will be much less dense than the outside deeper cold water. As long as we stay within the vortex column, Kate said, then pressure could be more benign, at least until it dissipates as the water slows. We stay in the vortex, we can make it. Best news I heard all day. Casey grinned. Nobody, but nobody back home is going to be able to top this. She put her face back to the periscope visor once again, and her eyes went wide. Oh, fuck! Incoming! Alex pushed her aside and looked through the periscope. His expression became grim. It's on us! The submarine groaned and then rocked. The slight angle the vessel was resting at suddenly was righted. The group stared straight ahead, arms out for balance, faces pale, waiting and listening. Alex grabbed a railing, looking up, sensing the monstrous weight bearing down on them. There came a horrendous scraping sound as the hull was drawn along rock. They were being moved sideways. Hang on! Alex shouted. Someone screamed as metal popped and groaned around them. The submarine was designed to withstand enormous pressure, but pressure evenly distributed along its hull and not pressing down in any one spot. It could buckle, or worse, split open. The torpedo room comm came to life. Standing by, boss, just say the word, Rhino yelled. Water's too shallow, we'll just blow ourselves up, Alex yelled back. The submarine scraped again a painful, metallic, nails-on-chalkboard sound magnified a thousand times. Fuck it! Frank stepped back from the scope, the thing only half up. It's jammed! Alex bared his teeth as more scraping sounded along the hull. Can't let it damage the props! He held out his hand to Casey Frank's. Rifle! What? Amy looked momentarily horrified, but then she slumped, seeming to understand what he had to do. She nodded to him. Save us. Frank shook her head. Boss, let me, sir. I'm dispensable. That's an order! Alex's voice boomed in the small room. Frank's looked like she was about to say more, but Amy pulled on her brawny arm. Let him go. Only he can do it. You know that. Casey looked torn but after another second ripped the rifle from her shoulder, her face furious. Three rounds left. Alex took it. Seal the hatch after I'm gone and be ready. He half smiled. If I get separated, then do your best to get the hell out. Yeah, Frank said. Count on it. I'll help you up. Alex quickly headed down the steel corridor towards the hatch, and put one hand on the ladder railing. Franks waited silently beside him. He stared up the ladder, his sensitive hearing picking up the soft sliding weight moving above him. He felt the light touch of a hand on his shoulder, and Amy turned him around. Programmed for destruction, she smiled softly. I have to, Alex said, not sure what else he could tell her. I know. Jack Hammerson's monster, Hammerson's weapon of mass destruction, take your pick. But it's what you were created for. You can't escape it. She dropped her hand. You have to get out for Joshua, and if I can give you even a small chance. He sighed, feeling the pang in his chest at all the wasted years without her. Make it back. I'll be here. She went to turn, but stopped and then just stared hard at him. Was it real? Did we ever truly make it out of here before? Or have we been trapped down here for the last five years, like O'Kane, in our own version of hell? He smiled. If you were here with me, how could that be hell? He leaned forward to kiss her on the lips, 
But Amy threw an arm around his neck and pulled him close, kissing him back hard. Alex smelled her, tasted her, and felt a moment of dizziness as if he was intoxicated, and perhaps he was. At that second there was nowhere else he wanted to be, and no one else in the world he wanted with him. He had found her again, and that was all that mattered. Amy then pushed him away, her eyes shining, the pupils heavily dilated. God damn you! Why do you have to be... you? She turned and walked away. He watched her disappear down the dark corridor. Alex didn't want to go up that ladder. Instead, he wanted just one more moment, even just a few more seconds with her. But the submarine rocked again. And he knew what pursued them now would kill her in the most horrible way. She was worth living for, worth killing for, and if it came to it, worth dying for. Alex knew she was right. It was what he was made for. He turned, seeing Casey smile awkwardly. She shrugged. He pointed a finger at her. Not a word. Didn't see a thing. She saluted. Good luck. Fool. Alex sucked in a deep breath and then went up the ladder. He spun the hatch wheel. Chapter 59 The first thing that assailed his senses when Alex made it to the deck was the acrid smell. The biological ammonia was so thick in the air it was like a poisonous gas. He had to move quickly and hope for a lucky shot. If he could target one of the huge eyes, he may be able to get a bullet into its brain. He had no idea whether that would kill it or even slow it down, but his goal was simple. Make it back off just long enough for them to get the hell off the shoreline. Franks slammed the hatch shut, and immediately the huge creature surged over the submarine. Alex fought back the urge to move quickly as the massed tentacles rose around him. He saw they were whip-thin at the tip, but at their base they were as thick around as a freight train. There they coiled and wrestled with each other, like grotesque pythons fighting to be first to consume him. The submarine was now in among the kraken's nest of flesh, with most of its monstrous bulk still in the water. The huge sack of its head lifted, pulsating, and eyes the size of cars rose up to fix upon him. He thought he saw it shiver, not from fear, but perhaps with eager anticipation of a new game. Alex could sense its intelligence, not quite that of a human, but certainly a cold intellect that was almost alien. Colors flared in bands as excitement rippled through its body. Alex carefully raised the rifle. One of the eyes was turned towards him, rising ever higher. At this range, it was impossible to miss. He fired twice, dead center. The huge, lidless eye quivered and pulled back, but there was no explosion of optic jelly or even blood seepage. It was impossible to tell if there had been any damage at all. Not a thing, he thought. One left. He raised the rifle again, once more sighting on the huge disc of an eye. What Alex couldn't have known was that behind the massive eye, the brain was protected by flexible cartilage, and on the monster before him, that shield was a dozen feet thick. Alex's neck prickled, and then came a soft, wet noise behind him, followed by a sensation of growing coldness. Alex turned to see the watery figure drifting up and over the railing, to then alight on the deck. Captain Wu Yang, looking expressionless, wet, and staring, his arms by his sides. Alex froze, knowing the figure wasn't a figure at all, but another tentacle stalking him. So real, Alex thought. Yang's face carried a tortured expression, like the man's very soul had been trapped inside the animal that had consumed him. Alex felt hopelessness settling over him. As real as Yang looked, he, it, was just a huge pad, dotted with softball-sized suckers, 
each with a cruel hooked talon at its center. It seemed the creature had decided to play with its food before it struck. Alex carefully eased the gun around, but knew that as much as he wanted to fire point-blank between Yang's eyes, it would be like trying to stop an elephant by jabbing its toe with a toothpick. Beside him, he saw the periscope lens swivel towards Yang. He imagined Casey cursing her usual curses, and he hoped his orders held or she'd be beside him fighting to assure death in another few seconds. Indecision racked him. He could think of only one insane option, to dive over the side. But that would be into about six or more feet of water, where the huge cephalopod was king. He'd last about six seconds. He waited as Yang glided a little closer, the thing's face slack, urging him to make a move. It was so lifelike that Alex almost felt compelled to talk to him. He turned his head at a glacial speed. To do so any faster would invite attack. He could see the massive bulk of the kraken still in the water. Now both its white, goat-slit eyes watched him intently. He bet it'd be smiling if it could. Its colossal size and strength meant they never really stood a chance. It dwarfed the submarine, and he didn't doubt for a second that if it wanted to, it could rip the steel hull apart to get at the tender morsels inside. Yang glided so close, Alex could see the cold aura of death surrounding the thing, and the stink made his eyes stream. Alex stood absolutely still, waiting. Another tentacle tip edged over the railing towards him, and the tip alighted on one of his arms. The cold sliminess was immediately replaced by fire as he felt the suckers engage, penetrating even his toughened suit. The tooth-rimmed discs felt like they were searing down into his flesh. He remembered Amy telling him years ago that the cephalopods could taste their food this way. I don't want to end up like Yang, he thought, his mind whirling but with zero options. He worked to ignore the fire on his arm that now snaked up to his shoulder and tried to separate his mind from his body, preparing for the bloody annihilation he knew would surely come. From the corner of his eye he saw movement, and easing his head around, saw that there were hundreds of tiny pale figures standing on the jutting ledges and broken balconies of the fallen city. Like stadium crowds at a football game, the barrackers were all there, and he'd bet his side was not the local team. Alex felt his armored suit being slowly stripped away and knew his flesh would soon follow. He calmed himself and then saw her. She was out at front, smaller than the rest, and she lifted her mask free, the glossy, oil-black eyes watching him. Help us, he mouthed. The tiny woman's head tilted, and he had no idea whether she heard, understood, or even cared about his fate. There was a metallic squeal from behind him as the hatch wheel started to spin. God damn you, Franks, Alex thought, his teeth grinding. He half turned. Keep that hatch closed! Yang shot forward, passing right by Alex and hitting the hatch door. The door, now unlocked, was pulled upward, dragging the huge form of Rhino with it. The expression of surprise on his face would have been humorous if his appearance probably didn't spell a horrible death. Alex spun, fired at the eye again, and then dropped the gun. In one swift movement, he drew his pitiful blade and stabbed and slashed at the huge muscular limb. His razor-sharp knife cut into the flesh but it was like trying to sever something that was a combination of leather and rubber. More tentacles inched upward over the hull as the exposed rhino was trying to keep the impossible figure of Yang from its sticky embrace with the hatch lid. Alex felt the limb freeze beneath his hands, and he thought his mind was playing tricks as a haunting whistle sounded from ahead of him, behind him, all around him. 
A fist gripped tight inside his head, and he grimaced from the agony as the sound stabbed deep into his brain. The tentacles stopped their movement and hung in the air around the submarine like a huge flower with mottled green and black tentacles blooming all around them. Alex looked over the side, only just able to stop his eyes crushing shut from the unbearable pain. He knew a hungry mouth the size of a truck was there, beneath the mantle of the creature and just below the waterline. Gradually, the kraken pulled back and then silently slipped beneath the surface. The whistling stopped, and with it went the pain. Alex turned to the small figure on the far shoreline. She pointed at herself, then at Alex, and made a breaking motion. Alex could feel the thought slide easily into his tortured mind. You once freed me, and now I freed you. We are even. The ghostly pale figure with the mask of tentacles turned and danced back over the huge tumbled boulders, skipping away and disappearing into one of the broken holes of the last refuge of the mighty city of Aztlan. Rhino was lying on the deck, panting, his hands covered in slime. I came up to lend a hand, boss. Alex growled and lifted the big man with one hand and shoved him towards the hatch. If we live, remind me to kick your ass all the way back home. They slid down the ladder, and Rhino sealed them in. Alex sped straight for the bridge. This is the only chance we might get. Fire up those engines and give me maximum reverse thrust. The sound of running boots on steel grating echoed in the steel corridors. Blake and Casey followed Alex to the bridge room and headed to different consoles while Rhino sprinted back down to the torpedo room. Amy tilted her head as Alex appeared in the bridge room. Their eyes locked. He could guess what she was thinking. Another life used up. And he also knew then that they would need to have a long conversation about what the future may hold for them and for Joshua, if they survived. She smiled and nodded to him, looking away and releasing him. When they survived, he thought. Hey, check this out. Casey turned away from one of the screens that showed a camera view of the outside. Got it working. This would be an underwater view, if we were underwater. Engines at full power, boss, Blake said, his fingers dancing over the consoles. Okay, here goes. Alex sucked in a breath, saying a silent prayer. Full reverse, and let's hope the prop still turns. And we don't just spin it to shit on the rocks, Casey said. Think positive thoughts, Kate replied. Casey snorted. You do the chanting, lady, we'll do the driving. Alex turned to the group, trying to see over the hawks. Everyone else, sit down, strap in, or just wrap something around yourselves. This is going to be real rough. A throb went through the sea shadow, then a vibration they could all feel right down to the bones. Alex gripped the console edge, willing the vessel to move. Sixty percent turbine, Blake said, pushing the small handle a little further forward. Bands of light on a panel illuminated another few bars up a scale. He pushed a little more, and the bars lit up towards the top. His voice was calm. Seventy percent, seventy-five, eighty. The submarine lurched violently. Sung got down low and wrapped both arms around a steel pole. Shen Jung crouched beside her, hugging his arms around her and the pole together. Kate slipped and screamed, and Amy reached out to grab her while keeping one arm looped around a strut. Move, you son of a bitch! Casey screamed as the entire submarine juddered again but stayed in place. Ninety percent! Red lining, boss! Blake yelled. He spun. She cannot take any more, Captain, he said in his best Scottish accent, then grinned. Alex laughed grimly and held up a fist. Then punch it, Scotty. We got nothing to stay here for. 
Blake pushed the lever all the way up, and the bars of light, once green, now changed to full red. There was a steady thrum, and then a smell of burning. Finally, there came another sound, and it was the sweetest they had heard in days, the sound of the metal hull grating on rock. The submarine slid a few feet, juddered and bucked, and then slid a few more feet. As soon as the curved propeller hit the deeper water, it could create more drag. Waves flowed up the bank as the props grabbed, and then threw water in great geysers over the submarine and onto the shoreline. Suddenly there was a grinding rush as they slid backwards. Amy gripped the railing, bracing her legs as the sea shadows slid into deeper water. Ease down, Blake. Bring her about, Alex said, moving from console to console. Amy continued to watch him. Pride, love, desire, and joy near overwhelming her. But there was also something else underlying it all, a darker emotion. Fear. Fear of the unknown. She knew he still harbored personal demons like no other man. Could she ever trust him? Inside him lurked a stranger. The other, Alex called him, and she'd witnessed this being's callous brutality in the past. He was a force that answered every question with violence, and his volatility was a threat to her safety, and perhaps even to Joshua's. Amy sighed. Thinking of Joshua was a shot in the arm to her spirits. Joshua, too, was different, stronger, faster, and smarter than normal. But she knew now he was constantly in danger. She vividly remembered the attack on her house, and Peter shot and unable to protect them. She realized that to defend against violence, maybe someone of strength and violence was what they needed. And who better to guide her son and be a father to him than someone exactly like him? She was torn. Okay? Kate's voice made her start. Huh? Amy smiled. Yeah, or I will be when I see the sun again. I heard that. Let's just hope it happens soon. Kate turned to watch Alex as well. Okay, people, Alex said. This is what we've got. We're currently in a small pond with a very large marine predator. It got the vessel in here, so we need to get it out. We will find a way out, or we will make one. It had to have used the vortex, Kate said. My guess is it's the far wall of this cavern that separates its lake from the greater underground ocean. We need to be out there. Alex nodded. Makes sense to me. He moved behind Blake. Ping the wall, find me that hole. If not, find me a weak spot. And Franks, keep your eyes and ears open. That thing was enough trouble above the water. Got it, said Casey, hunched over a sonar monitor. Amy crossed to where Shen Jung and Sung stood quietly. Do you think we can navigate the vortex if we can find it? Shen Jung shook his head. This is unknown. The opening in the cave could be smaller than we anticipate. This creature can compress itself down very small. Maybe it can fit into tight spaces, but we cannot. Sung wrung her hands, and Shen Jung took one of them in his. She smiled up at him, but then turned to Amy. If there is a constricting of the geology, there could be a funnel effect that will make the water extremely turbulent, very difficult. Great, Amy said. Then we need something else. Luck. Chapter 60 the submarine turned fast, the steel fish incredibly maneuverable. Alex felt a glimmer of hope as they moved along the eastern shoreline, on the edge of an underwater shelf and about twenty feet down. Casey Franks frowned and leaned in towards her screen. Gross! What the hell is this? She turned. Hey, Doc! Uh, Docs! Kate and Amy joined her both leaning over the female hawk. Kate's brows shot up as she straightened. 
Unbelievable. But I think that's eggs. The group crowded around Casey's screen. The underwater shelf created an overhang, and suspended from the rock roof, there looked to be gigantic bunches of grapes, each egg pod about six feet in length. They swayed slightly in an invisible current. So this is where Mama raises the kids, Casey said. Kate leaned back. Also answers the question on whether there is only one of them. Got to be at least two, huh? And going to be a hell of a lot more soon. Casey looked like she had just smelled something bad. She panned the external camera around. Looks like a pretty strong current coming from somewhere. Oh, God, yes and no, Kate said, spinning back. We need to get away from here. She leaned over Casey, staring hard at the screen. A current, yes, but not a natural one. The female stays close to the eggs, protecting them and blowing water over them to keep them oxygenated. She pointed. There. At the end of her finger on the screen, they could just make out the tips of tentacles flattened on the bottom. The rest of the creature was so perfectly camouflaged, it could have been part of the rock shelf itself. Casey pulled back on the camera's magnification, taking more of the gigantic cephalopod in, but like a submerged mountain, much of the animal extended beyond their scope. Alex leaned forward, studying the image. He felt a surge of adrenaline at seeing the size of the thing, and so close to them in the water. Down here they were vulnerable. Inside the submarine they had nowhere else to go. He straightened. Okay, if this is where the thing is, then we want to be somewhere else. Blake, get us out of here. Blake swung the submarine away towards the far wall, and the lake bottom suddenly fell away beneath them. Getting deeper here, we've not got fifty fathoms beneath us. He checked his instruments. No sign of any breaks in the wall. Take her down another twenty, said Alex. You got it. Blake eased the U-shaped wheel forward, and the sub gently inclined as it dropped. Hold the phone, ladies and gentlemen, we might have an opening. Sonar just missed a few pings along the western wall. Means the sonar pulses passed right through and didn't bounce back off anything solid. There, a blue glow up ahead. Casey clapped her hands once as she watched the screen. A big, beautiful hole in the wall. She grinned. And plenty of room. Got to be eighty feet up and across. Easy. Take us through, said Alex. Incoming, Blake yelled, making Jennifer cringe as though she'd been struck. What? Alex spun to the man, crossing the bridge in two strides. Big bogey coming right at us. Blake's neck jutted forward, his round eyes fixed on the sonar. Hold it, hold it. He half turned, a relieved smile on his face. Going to miss us. It's going right past, and it's in a hell of a hurry. Blake's smile evaporated. Ah, oh, God damn it! it's headed for the hole in the wall. No, you don't. Casey pounded a fist on the bench top. It's going to shut the door. Oh, stop, Alex yelled, crossing to Casey and leaning closer to her screen as the engines powered down. At this depth, the water was darker, but the blue glow of the hole they had just glimpsed was now obscured. Try this. Casey flicked a few switches, and external lights came on. Oh, my God, Amy said, grimacing. The huge cephalopod hung in the water, with many of its tentacles extended. This was no random action. It had moved to fully block the hole. It hung suspended mid-water, looking like a large mottled web, waiting to ensnare them, its mantle fully spread, blotting out the weak light from outside. Alex stared at the monstrous creature and cleared his mind. He pushed his senses out and felt the thing in the water, its bulk and its cold consciousness. It knew they were inside the submarine, and it even knew how many of them there were. Alex felt a stab of pain in his skull. It wanted all of them. 
It wanted them for food, and it wanted to use them to break the boredom it felt in its eternal twilight. A monster. A real monster, Kate said. It's just sitting there, staring at us. Casey's fingers flexed on the console. Look at its eyes. Blake seemed mesmerized. Who was that? Said that when you look into an abyss, the abyss also looks into you. Nietzsche, Amy said quietly. Alex folded his arms. Looks like it doesn't want its new playthings getting away. Let's put a torpedo up its ass, Casey said with her jaw set. Alex slowly shook his head. Don't know if just one will work, and don't want to exhaust them just yet. And if we miss and hit the wall, we might collapse our only way out, said Amy, coming and standing by Alex. He turned to Kate. You said it was protecting its eggs. Yes, they have a strong maternal instinct. If we can outrun it, it might turn back, she said, nodding. Can't outrun it in here, Alex said. It leaves us no choice. Blake, bring her around. Blake engaged the engines and turned the sea shadow away from the monster in the deep. Alex waited for a few moments. Is it following? Blake shook his head. No, staying right where it can act like the biggest cork in history. Time to take it up a level. Alex reached towards the comm. Rhino, stand by. He looked back to Blake. Hold course, but on my word, swing away hard and make a looping course back for the hole. Alex watched Casey's screen. Coming up on the shoreline, boss, Blake said. He gritted his teeth occasionally looking across at the depth readings. Getting real close, he half turned. Stand by. Alex had the comm line open. He kept watching Casey's screen until he could see them, the huge dangling bunches of eggs. Fire one. There was a small kick, and on the view screen there appeared a trail of bubbles racing away from the nose of the sea shadow. Alex spun. Blake, bank hard, now! Blake turned the U-shaped wheel like a racing car driver, and the steel fish yawed in the water. They all held on as the submarine tilted. Alex urged more speed, and in another second came the detonation, and then a judder ran through the skin of the vessel. That got its attention. Creature is on the move, Blake said. Coming fast, real fast, brace! They waited but there was nothing. As Alex had hoped, the creature had raced right by them to save its eggs. Now give it all you've got. Let's get through that hole. Alex paced as Blake pushed the lever forward to maximum, pushing every ounce of energy into the rear propulsion and willing his own strength into the turbines for good measure. The submarine kicked forward, speeding away under the dark water. Alex saw the blue glow of the hole approaching, and counted down the seconds. Come on, give us some luck, he prayed, urging the machine on. From deep within his head, he could feel a sense of anguish and pain emanating from the cold mind of the creature. He tried to shut it out, but the distress came at him in waves. Alex put his head down, concentrating on the blue glow ahead. As the echoes of the creature's misery dimmed, he finally felt it morphing into something much more hard-edged, hate. No one spoke. Everyone was focused on Blake and Casey's screens and panels. Sung and Shen Jung just stayed seated, waiting and listening for the sound of something huge settling on the skin of the vessel. Gonna be tight. Casey's teeth were clamped together. Exit coming up, Blake said. Five hundred feet. Four fifty. Four hundred. Three fifty. Say a prayer, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to thread the needle. Two hundred feet. One fifty. One hundred. Nothing else existed but Blake's voice. Time slowed and then stretched. Alex looked to Amy, and her eyes locked with his. In the ice-blue gaze and the tiny uptilt of her lips, he saw resignation, perhaps to fate, but also trust. He hoped it was not misplaced. 
Hold on to your asses, Blake yelled through gritted teeth as scraping and grinding sounded against the hull. They bounced hard to the left, something popped, and metal squealed from somewhere back in the bowels of the vessel. The makeshift crew held on as they passed through the hole in the wall. Yeah! Casey leapt from her chair, high-fiving herself in an overhead clap. There were sighs of relief and cheers as the submarine sailed out into more open waters. Alex leaned forward onto his knuckles and exhaled, realizing he had been holding his breath. Amy grabbed his arm, holding on. You know it will follow us, she said softly. He half turned, feeling a sense of resignation. I wish I could say it won't, he straightened. But I can't. He pressed the comm button, connecting to Ranofsky. Rhino, stand by on all tubes. Project Ellsworth, English Antarctic Research Base. Whoa. Sam Reed turned at the sound of the scientist's voice. That's weird, Sully said. What's up, sunshine? Schmidt pushed his chair back. Got something? Sam wandered over and stood behind Sully's chair. Yeah, but something that shouldn't be there. A big object, but really weird. It's giving back a metallic signature. Sully's fingers flew over the console. Metallic signature, Sam's hopes skyrocketed. You've been putting too much sugar in your tea again. Schmidt leaned over the young scientist. Could be some sort of high concentration of ore in one of the cliff walls. Anything from platinum, nickel, copper to gold down here. Let me see that. He straightened, frowning. That is weird. Sam put one large hand on Sully's shoulder. Please tell me yours is the only probe down there. From behind, Bentley scoffed. Of course we damn well are, Reed. We must be picking up some sort of manganese node amalgamation or the like. Well, that's what I thought. But it's moving and damned fast. And that background signal is getting stronger, Sully responded. Sam folded his arms, grinning. Follow it. Chapter 61 Kate paced in the small bridge room, having to maneuver around the huge Rynofsky who had just joined them. She strained to draw the most minute details from her memory. I don't know where it was exactly. I was kind of focused on staying alive. She stopped and turned. The best I can guess is that it was close to where we came up on the beach. There was a column of cool among the tropical water mass, a cold water vortex. It might not even show up above the water. No idea if we can pick up temperature variations. Might be able to, but haven't really read the manual. Blake shrugged. Doing the best we can. Alex nodded. We'll find it. We have to. He looked at Amy and Kate, and also motioned Sung and Shen Jung closer. We haven't got a lot of time. You guys are the brain's trust. If we can't detect the temperature variation and can't really see it, then how else can we detect it? Alex looked along their faces. Water movement, like a current? Color, would it be full of debris or less debris? Alex paced. What about density? Could it... Wait, density, Sung said. This might be a way. Ocean water has different densities. The colder the water, the heavier it is. The hotter the water, the lighter it is. She turned to Kate. When you passed through the column, did you rise or fall? Kate nodded. We dropped, dropped down about fifty feet in a few seconds, and it got real cold. Good, Sung nodded. Cold water is heavy water. It sinks. Shen Jung put his arm around her and beamed. Density. We might be able to pick up, Blake said. We can ping it, maybe listen for some sort of soft echo or at least a distortion. Do it, Alex said. Where? Blake half turned. 
Kate cast her mind back to the dark water. I think we were around half a mile offshore. Then let's take a trip along the coast, Amy said. Blake nodded and just slightly turned the U-shaped wheel. Franks, give me external acoustics. Let's see if we can hear anything out there. Alex paced. Casey flicked some switches, and suddenly the room was filled with the sound of surging water and the pips and squeaks of a large ocean, a large living ocean. Kate listened intently, frowning as she concentrated. The sounds danced at the edge of her memory, things that could have been whale song but weren't. That could have been triggerfish, dolphin squeak, or even the click of crustaceans, but were all slightly different from what she had heard in the past. These creatures she was hearing were things that no one in her lifetime, or perhaps a million lifetimes, had ever heard. Or maybe nothing had heard them ever, if evolution had taken them in a myriad different directions. Boss, got something up ahead. Just registering a change in density. Not solid, but just on the scope. Blake raised his eyebrows. It feels right. He switched the sound to the console, and small pings, just audible, came from his panel. Let's take a look, Alex said, continuing to pace. There came a louder ping from the console that brought everyone's heads around. Ah, shit. Blake leaned in closer. Got another bogey, big signature this time, coming at us fast, he turned, grimacing. And from where we just came from. Put the pedal down, Alex said. They felt the surge as the vessel picked up speed. Jennifer looked like she was praying. Still gaining on us, doing fifty knots now, impossible speed. Not for this thing, Amy said softly. We can't outrun that. Casey's teeth were gritted as she turned. Boss, we need to surface, fight it up there. Rhino scoffed. With what, our bare hands? Casey rounded on the big hawk. She was carrying multiple facial wounds and was still streaked with dried blood from her battle with Mungoy, giving her a fearsome painted warrior look. Jennifer had wrapped a cloth bandage around her battered forehead that was now also bloody and it dragged down one of her brows into a permanent scowl. Sung and Shen Jung shrank from her when she passed in front of them. Casey's eyes blazed as she glared at Rhino. We fight it with tooth and claw if need be. Rhino held up a huge pair of hands. Okay, take it easy, huh? Alex half turned from the screen. Everyone just cool it. We're trapped in this tin can together for now, so we might as well conserve our energy. If we need to surface, we will, but that's not yet. If things go to plan, we'll find a way out. If not, well, we might all find ourselves swimming back to shore. Sung blanched, and Amy put a hand on her shoulder. We'll be fine. Captain Hunter was only joking. Rhino, get down to the torpedo room. Alex turned back to Blake at the consoles. Keep heading to the vortex. If need be, we'll bring her around for a torpedo launch, but as a last resort. Not convinced we'll even hit something that fast and smart underwater. He looked up. And we know it learns, so now it knows what those torpedoes can do. Yeah, and I'm betting it remembers exactly where those torpedoes came from and wants to tear us a new asshole. Casey growled. Floor it, soldier. From the acoustic speakers, there was an increasing sound like the clacking of a giant castanet. What in hell's name is that? Casey asked. Amy hugged herself. That, I think, is the sound of a kraken's mouth, the beak opening and closing. Oh, fuck. It sounds to me like someone really pissed off, grinding their teeth. Casey flexed her hands on the panel top, and Kate and Amy looked over her shoulder. Her view monitors showed nothing but a soft blue above and a pitiless black below them. Vortex coming up in 500 feet, boss. Blake read more numbers. Plenty of water. 
deep but within our crush tolerance. Come on, come on, Casey urged more speed from the submarine, her neck straining. Bogey about to overtake us. Vortex now in two hundred feet. Perspiration ran down Blake's face, and his forearms bulged from the strain as he squeezed the wheel. It's running us down, boss. We ain't gonna make it. Vertical dive straight into the vortex, Alex yelled. If that column of cold water has some drag, we can ride its wake. Into what? Kate asked. We don't know what's down there. Well, we know what's up here, lady. Casey's jaws bulged as she bared her teeth. Hold your ass, say your prayers, and enjoy the ride. No choice, Alex said as the deck tilted. Bogey coming at us. Going to hit! Blake yelled the words. Hold on! The laboratory was silent as the four English Ellsworth-based scientists stared hard at the camera feed. Their mouths hung open. Orca hung motionless in the dark water, its sensitive lenses trained on the submarine as it came out of the dark and then shot past. It was immediately pursued by what looked like a huge mottled shroud, an enormous eye with a slitted pupil momentarily swiveled towards them, but immediately went back to focus on the fleeing vessel. The thing obviously wanted that craft and nothing else. Sam Reed's huge hands curled into fists. He felt a wave of frustration and rage wash over him and had to swallow it down hard, knowing he could do nothing but watch. The screen image wobbled as the small probe was buffeted by the pressure swell as the creature surged past and then was gone. Oh, my good Queen Lizzie. Sully leaned back into his chair, his hands to his head. That was a fucking submarine, being chased by... I don't even know what it was, but it was as big as an office block. Follow, follow, Schmidt screamed. Huh? But... Sully looked confused and simply pointed at the screen. Sam leaned in. Get after them, now! He paced like a huge lion behind the men, his weight making the floor creak beneath him. Sully swiveled the submersible and accelerated, and then bounced in his seat, looking like he couldn't decide whether he wanted to sit or stand or something in between. He pointed at the screen again, grinning. That was a submarine! His brows were so high on his forehead, they nearly touched his hairline. That was a fucking submarine! He put his hands to his head, getting chased by what looks like a giant squid octopus thingy. Sam felt lightheaded. He'd read the reports from the Antarctic mission and of the creature that had once pursued Alex and Amy through the ancient tunnels, but nothing, nothing could have prepared him for the reality of the thing. He straightened, trying to calm himself, and remembered a few lines from a favorite thriller writer he read. When I looked down into the abyss, down into the merciless blackness, colder and deeper than Hades itself, there I see the kraken rising. And so it was, he thought, and now Alex was right in its path. Sam suddenly jolted and then turned to stare hard at the mini-submersible screen. What if it wasn't Alex? What if the Chinese had won the race? Shit! He turned back to Sully. We need to contact them. Sully shook his head. How? Orca has no conventional communication hardware. I'm afraid no can do, Bill Bunyan. Sam was pushed aside as the other scientists jostled for a closer look at the spectacle. How? Who? Bentley asked. Who? Schmidt grinned. Does anyone else think Kate might not be on board? There was silence for a few seconds, until Bentley finally spoke. Of course, if anyone could find a submarine in a warm primordial sea, start it up, and then get into a fight with a Kraken-esque sea monster, it'd be her. Could only be her. Not just her. Sam felt a knot tightening in his stomach. That thing was twice the size of the submarine. Tim's was now on his feet. They're going to be crushed. 
Sam stood out in the cold corridor and tried to shut out the whooping of the British scientists in the control room as he made the call. Confirmation, Sea Shadow is on the move, but still below the ice. Colonel Jack Hammerson grunted. That's only half the answer I want. Who exactly is in control of that vessel? Sam exhaled. I don't know, sir. Until there is contact, it could be Alex, and it could be someone else entirely. God damn it, that's not going to stop a war, Reed. There was a sound like grating teeth, and then Hammerson came back on the line. Seconds count now. Make contact, somehow, some way. If it's Alex, move heaven and earth to assist. If not, I don't want that submarine ever seeing the light of day. Tell me the second you know for sure. Out! Sam turned back to the crowded control room. In front of the excited scientists, the screen showed nothing but endless blackness, as Orca was on the trail of two leviathans of the subterranean depths. Chapter 62 Time, zero hours, eight minutes, two seconds until fleet convergence. Amy felt the beat of her heart in her throat, racing faster and faster. She willed every ounce of her strength to the engines so they could stay in front of the pursuing monster. They were so close now, almost free. She just wanted to see Joshua, the sunlight, the surface, just one more time. Oh, for Christ's sake! Blake's brow furrowed, and he looked about to leap out of his chair. He spun. Now we got another signature, coming right at us. What, you sure that isn't some sort of sonar echo? Alex yelled. Blake shook his head. Nope, Big Mama is still right on our tail, but something else coming in at twelve degrees starboard, fast. Amy cursed and hung on to a railing, her legs braced as the deck tilted downwards. She grabbed Kate, who began to slide past. Kate nodded her thanks. Might be another cephalopod. After all, the creature didn't fertilize those eggs by itself. Jesus Christ, we can't even fight one of them down here. Alex rubbed a hand up through sweat-slicked hair. Blake, how long till bottom? Blake read numbers from the screen. Four hundred feet until we hit the deck, and whatever is down there better be big enough for us to pass through, or we're a paint smudge on the rocks. He looked at another screen and grimaced. We're not going to win the race. Over the external speakers there rose a noise above the background clicks and squeaks of the underground sea. This one a deep rumbling that sounded more like a low moaning. What the hell? Casey sat back, staring into space. That doesn't sound like it did before. The sound came again, louder, as whatever it was drew nearer. No. Kate's face had drained of color. I've heard that before, when Alex and I were first in the water. She looked across to Alex. Just before the Pleosaur attacked. Well, Doc, if that's what it is, there's two of them this time. Blake stared at the screen, eyes wide. The new bogey coming in from starboard has now broken into two distinct signatures, one about seventy feet long and the other about fifty. Kate nodded. Makes sense, probably male and female. I'm betting they're territorial, and we just wandered into the front yard. Two more of them. Ha! Casey rocked in her seat. Well, if they want to eat us, they're going to have to wait their turn. The sea shadow momentarily shuddered, and then totally stopped. Everyone was either thrown forward or swung on the struts and handholds they had gripped. Amy flew forward. Alex shot out a single arm to catch her as she went to fly past. Oh no, was all she could think to say. Frustration welled up inside her. So close. Perhaps they were never meant to escape. The next noise made even Alex's face pale. It was the sound of the submarine's metal skin groaning around them. It's got us, Blake said. The sea shadow was twisted one way, then the next, 
Blake was whipped forward, smashing the bridge of his nose on the wheel, and Casey's forearms bulged from the effort of keeping herself in her chair. Alex felt the cold hatred enveloping them, just as surely as the train tunnel thick tentacles of the giant cephalopod. He looked up, hearing the steel complain at the tightening of the rubbery, striated muscle. Blake, get us the hell out of here! Alex knew they couldn't just wait for it to rip them open, but also knew there was little they could realistically do. The Kraken was far larger and far stronger than they were, and at home in this environment. They were just sardines in a can, waiting to be peeled open. The strengthened steel hull groaned once again as monstrous pressure was applied to its surface. The control panels popped, lights began to go out, and one of their screens went dark. We're fucked! Not going anywhere! Casey yelled. Behind them, one of the walls started to compress, and then one of the reinforcing elliptical frames began to lower from above them. Alex was underneath it faster than anyone could follow, and he reached up to hold the curved beam. He felt it then, so close. He and the creature were separated by a thin skin of strengthened steel. He glimpsed its alien mind. It wanted them, not just as food or as playthings, but it wanted them for revenge. It wanted to torture them, rip them to pieces slowly, and then devour the bits. It knew human beings, and knew what made them scream the loudest. Alex gritted his teeth as the steel started to come down hard. He focused all of his strength and locked his arms. The steel bending stopped momentarily, but he knew he wouldn't be able to hold it for long. He turned slowly and could only let the words hiss from between his teeth. Blake, get us out of here now! Trying. Blake wiped blood from his nose as his hands flew over the console. Already at full power, trying something. His hands flew again, reversing. After a few seconds, he swore, smacking his fist down hard on the console. Nothing. We're stuck. There came an abrupt boom of steel from somewhere back in the metal corridors. Sung screamed, and Shen Jung covered her head with his arms, and then together they sank down in a corner. Alex turned to where Amy stood. She was silent and ghost-like, clutching a wall strut. She just stared at him. There was resignation in her expression. He heard her. Joshua, her mind repeated, over and over. Alex turned back to the hull, screaming his defiance, releasing every demon from his id, and throwing them into war with the thing on the ship. He felt his bones start to bend, and tendons popped. But with all his great strength, inexorably, the steel beam still came down. He turned back to Amy. Sorry, he whispered. Fuck it. Casey was on her feet and punched one hand down on the torpedo room comlink. Rhino, fire all! Belay that order! Alex screamed through his pain. You'll blow us wide open! We're opening up now! Casey yelled back. Her fists were bold. We're dead if we don't. Alex was torn. The roof continued its slow drop. He was a flea holding back an elephant. Not here, not now, he prayed. Blake hunched forward, one hand to his earphone. Something out there, mechanical. He switched it to external. Over the speakers there was a tiny rotational whine. What is that? Suddenly there was an impact explosion. He spun. Was that us? No. Alex immediately felt the weight on the sea shadow's surface vanish. They lurched free. Blake clapped once, grabbing the controls. Hey, we're free! We're free! It let us go! Something just happened out there, Kate said. Don't care. We've been given a chance. Blake, take her down, soldier. Alex dropped his arms and immediately felt the pain of torn muscles and cracked bones. He nodded to Casey. Now you can get Rhino. Casey grinned and pressed the calm. Hey, big fella, still there? Yo, shaken but not stirred, 
came the reply. Alex smiled. Ready on all tubes, the deep voice came back immediately. Standing by, just say the word. The orthocone squid was an old female, the largest in its territory, and it had known more centuries than it could remember. It knew joy, boredom, curiosity, excitement. It knew love for its offspring, and it knew rage and hate. When it battled its own kind for territory or for food, or when the rocks fell from above to try and crush its limbs or its home, it had raged. But these times were nothing compared to the hate it felt now for the destroyers of its brood. The small playthings that were warm and sweet to eat had managed to attack it from within the hard-shelled sea swimmer. Excitement surged through it as it planned to drag them to the surface, tear the hard shell open, and take its time, stripping the tiny things of their limbs, watching their small faces twist in agony before it finally consumed them. As it pressed down on the shell of the hard thing, it sensed the humans inside. It could feel them scurrying about and also feel their fear. Bands of color pulsed along its limbs and it flexed its muscles. But frustration surged as it sensed the two massive leviathan creatures closing in on it. It immediately knew them, had fought them before. It would attack them if it ever found a small one alone, or weak or old, but always avoided the strong ones, especially when they hunted in groups. The huge marine reptiles were fearsome predators, not as smart as it was, but they were fast and had a fearsome arsenal of teeth that could severely damage it, perhaps even kill it. It held on to its hard prize and hung in the water, indecision now tearing at it. Should it flee or stay and fight? The two huge creatures circled it, wary of its size and danger. The decision was made. The giant swimmers attacked. The first impact was hard, and one of its limbs was grabbed and shredded. Then another, as the second reptilian predator came in from another angle, grasping and tearing at a second limb. Again it lost flesh. It grasped one then, coiling around its flanks and holding it tight. It squeezed, applying colossal pressure, until it began to feel the reptile's mighty bones break beneath its skin. After another few seconds, it released the body and briefly watched it sink into the dark void. The other leviathan's huge mouth closed on it. The tusk-like teeth, each more than a foot long, were sharp blades that sunk in deep and then ripped away a car-sized mound of flesh. It wrapped massive limbs around this one, too. It had it now, and the sea reptile's teeth were of no use if it couldn't bring them to bear. It squeezed harder feeling the satisfying sensation of crushing flesh and bones. Just then, there came a tiny, metallic whine. Do it! Sam's voice boomed. Hey, but... Bentley went to object, but then blanched as the huge form of Sam leaned over him. The bearded scientist waved a hand and just shook his head. Okay, okay, do it! Sam knew he was taking a chance, if it was Alex in the submarine, he might, just might, give them a fighting chance. If it was the Chinese in control, then... He knew he should probably be ramming Orca into the sub, or leaving it to its fate. Rigging to detonate his fuel core on impact, Sully said mechanically. So long, fella. Thanks for everything. The mottled hide of the cephalopod filled the screen and then a large slitted eye became Orca's entire world. Schmidt's arms dropped to his side. Good luck and Godspeed, Kate. Sam turned away. There was no way he could determine who was piloting the submarine, so there was no more he could do here. He walked heavily to the door and opened it onto a freezing landscape. If things went bad, he needed to prepare for war. He pressed his collar stud, and the full head shield telescoped up over his face as he walked out into the snow. The kraken swiveled one giant eye and saw something tiny coming at it. 
The small, whining creature had a single luminous eye at one end, and it increased speed to fly fast at the cephalopod's bulbous head. The tiny thing struck, and then suddenly erupted in an explosion of red-hot pain. The cephalopod freed the fleeing hard shell and the last reptile and squirted its camouflage ink into the water, rolled, knotted, and coiled on itself, and then jetted away. The kraken propelled itself towards the dark sea bottom to spread out flat, changing color and blending in perfectly with the rocky depths. It was hurt, in agony, but it was alive, and it still had one thing left, its boiling hate. Chapter 63 We got a vent dead ahead. Blake hit keys and pulled back on a small joystick as he read numbers scrolling up multiple screens. Another big cavern in there, but we have strong water movement. That's the good news. He eased back on the stick. The bad news is that opening isn't wide enough for us. We're going to tear ourselves apart on its edges. He turned. Or get wedged. The proximity alarm sounded. Alex leaned forward. Full speed ahead. This is going to be close. He hit the comm button. Rhino fire tubes two and three. They all felt a slight judder as the torpedoes sped away from the submarine. Two and three away, Rhino replied. On the view screen, they saw the trails of bubbles zooming away from them, heading down into an impenetrable blackness. Okay, everyone, hang on, Alex yelled, as the submarine careened towards the sea bottom, caught now in the whirlpool that accelerated its descent. He looked quickly to Amy. Her eyes were round, watching him. A nervous smile just flickered across her lips. The two torpedoes struck the cavern edges, detonating and sending shockwaves ballooning outwards into the water. The submarine bucked and shuddered as it passed through the blast compression wave, but still surged on. Viewing screen visibility was obliterated, and they relied on the sea shadow's electronic eyes and ears. We're alive, Casey said. Blake, I could kiss you if you weren't so ugly. Blake grinned. We passed through and we're in the pipe. He navigated the tunnel that led them many miles from the warm underground sea towards the freezing world waiting for them. The temperature began to drop against the hull so quickly that the sound of the metal contracting drowned out conversation. It's a natural barrier, Kate said. No sea creature can pass between tropical water and crushing icy water. It'd kill them. Except one, said Amy. One that has been doing it for perhaps too many centuries to count. I hope it's fucking dead, Casey said. We should blow the hole closed when we get out. Seal that motherfucker in forever. Not a bad idea, said Alex. We're moving fast, real fast, riding a strong current, Blake said. Still on a slight incline, but getting heavy down here now. 450 PSI water pressure. Much more, and we're going to be in a world of pain. Jennifer snorted. And where we just came from wasn't? Boss, got a wall coming up, Blake yelled. Alex leaned over him. Is the current still moving? If it is, then we got another vent, hopefully going up. Follow it. Blake started to pull up on the U-shaped wheel. Shen Jung and Sung stepped closer to look at his screen and then braced themselves on his chair. Slow it down. Don't want to end up a skid mark against the wall, said Alex, hanging on now. You got it, Blake said. The deck started to tilt as they lifted and headed up the huge natural tunnel. The sea shadow bucked and then slowed down to just a few knots. Not that much, Alex said. Blake shook his head. It's not me. The current just changed direction. It's rushing back at us now. We have got one mother of a headwind. Going to punch it. He pushed the lever forward again. The submarine only slightly increased its speed. Sonar says we've got another small opening coming up. Gonna need to blow it to fit through. 
Rhino, fire tube four. Alex gripped the table edge. Lucky last, people. Let's hope it also shuts the door behind us. Last fish away, Rhino said over the speaker. Cupboard's now empty. This time the explosion was felt and heard through the skin of the vessel, followed by rocks bouncing against the hull. The screens whited out. Time, zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. Convergence. Eric Carmack, commander of the Seawolf-class submarine, USS Texas, and leading the American fleet in the Southern Ocean, was in the conning tower, watching his rivals jockey into place. He paused and turned as his officer handed him the microphone. Carmack, go ahead. Commander, we have a sea shelf detonation, medium-sized torpex impact at 210 fathoms. The blast signature was consistent with a heavy seaborne torpedo strike. The seaman paused, and Carmack knew he was reading new data as it came in. Got something coming up, sir. Depth now, 810 feet, and speed at 25 knots. Metallic signature. His voice took on a sense of urgency. Computer can't identify it from our libraries, but it's got to be a medium-sized submarine. What the hell are they playing at now? Carmack swung to his chief of boat, Alan Henson. Signal of fleet and sound battle stations. He was handed a life jacket, which he waved away. Not yet, but I want batteries ready to engage and old torpedo tubes locked and loaded. Henson relayed orders and then held the microphone away from his mouth. We dive, sir? No, but full astern. Let's give him some room. He lifted his glasses and scanned the semicircle of Chinese ships. Combined with his own vessels, the ring of steel over the clear patch of ocean water was like an iron coliseum. The ships were the seating stands, and the half-mile-wide patch of water, the battle arena. Too many on both sides. He lowered his glasses. They're too close and so are we, he thought. At this proximity there would be no winners. Okay, let's see what we've got. He turned. Soundings. He waited. Henson relayed the information as it came in. Two hundred fathoms and still coming fast. One fifty, one hundred, eighty, forty-five. Breach imminent. Relative bearing 310 degrees port bow, he pointed. The entire crew watched and waited. Then, like a salmon jumping from a pond, two-thirds of the submarine's steel body lifted from the water. It fell back, creating a massive wave, and was carried back beneath the surface for a moment, before then powering up to sit silently at all stop. Jesus Christ, the sea shadow! Carmack grinned through his whispered words. Put it on hailing frequency. He lifted his field glasses again, training them on the hatch. Come on. He knew what the stakes were now. If the first voice that came from the speakers was Chinese, then they would know they had lost control of the submarine. Alan, get the Admiralty on the line, ASAP. Carmack blew air through puffed cheeks. The stakes had just gone up. In seconds, they would know which way the chips had fallen. And as his missiles, heavy guns, torpedoes, and circling planes all had their targeting systems locked in on Chinese strategic targets, everything would hinge on the call from HQ and the one from inside that damned vessel. He looked at his floating opponents. He had no doubt the Chinese had their weapons primed and pointed right down his throat as well. Carmack could feel the heart beating in his chest. He was once again handed a life jacket, which this time he donned over his uniform and then put on a helmet. He knew that the waters in this part of the world were down around zero degrees, five minutes in the drink, and you didn't need to worry about going home any more. He lifted the glasses again, watching, waiting, and praying. Jack Hammerson sat in the darkened office of James Carter, the Secretary of Defense. 
Spread around Carter's desk were five-star General Marcus Chilton, Jim Harker, his staff sergeant, and various assembled generals and other senior military brass. They all stared hard at a huge screen and watched the events unfold real-time from one of their Southern Hemisphere satellites. On Carter's desk, there were two speakers arranged. One was a direct line through to the Commander-in-Chief, President Paul Banning. On the other was Fleet Commander Eric Carmack. Chilton's eyes went from Carter back to the screen, where circling planes, multiple boats, and submarines formed a one-mile halo of clear water. At its center was a single vessel, the Sea Shadow. Damn crowded down there, Eric. Chilton looked relaxed, but Hammerson bet inside the big man was as on edge as the rest of them. That it is, Marcus, like a goldfish bowl. Problem is, we're all in the same bowl. Carmack still sounded good-humored. Chilton half-smiled, but then sat forward. Eric, could you share with us your assessment of first round, send and receive? Hammerson knew what Chilton was asking. If the firing started in the first few seconds, how many would he sink and how many would he lose? Marcus, we're all too close. At this proximity, it will not be a tactical fight, more a metal storm. We estimate a 100% sinkage on their side, and perhaps 75% on ours. Of the 25% still afloat, there will be significant structural damage to all. Remaining aerial assets would have to land at McMurdo, if that base somehow avoided being caught up in the firefight. Personnel losses and injuries in the high hundreds. A lot of sick people in the water. Chilton's lips momentarily compressed, but then he slowly nodded. Expected. He glanced at Carter. Acceptable. Carter swiveled in his chair, turning side on to the room. He steepled his fingers. Other option progress, gentlemen? Chilton's eyes slid to Hammerson. His brows went up, but Hammerson knew he had nothing concrete to give his superior. He shook his head. Chilton tilted his head back slightly and then faced the Secretary of Defense. No known progress, sir. He turned back to the screen and the lonely-looking submarine ringed by the wall of aggressive steel. He then leaned in toward the President's comlink. Mr. President... If that hatch opens and our people do not emerge, then we need to be ready for what that means. John Carter turned back to face the room and the President's speaker. Further instructions, sir? The President's voice sounded tired. Nothing has changed. Bottom line is that vessel cannot fall into foreign power hands. Are we in agreement? Chilton nodded. I agree, sir. The room all voiced their agreement. The President softly grunted his acknowledgement. Then do what you have to, General Chilton. Chilton drew in a deep breath, his jaw set. Commander Carmack, that vessel is the sovereign property of the United States of America. We take it home or we blow it to atoms. Anyone or anything that interferes with your order or fires upon an American vessel or individual will be taken to be committing a hostile act against our country. Full use of force is therefore authorized. He sat back, but his gaze was now hawk-like. Yes, sir. Understood, sir. God bless America. Carmack's voice was clipped. Good luck. And God's strength to you and your forces, Eric. Hammerson gritted his teeth. This was what was called the sharp edge. Everyone in the room knew just what they had committed their country to. In fact, what they had just committed the entire world to. For some reason, the only thing Hammerson could think of was how he was going to tell Joshua his mother wasn't coming home. He straightened his jacket. Maybe that wouldn't matter. Maybe nothing would matter in the next few minutes. Chapter 64 
Whoops and high fives filled the bridge room. Alex grinned and turned in time to be grabbed by Kate, who hugged him hard. A pair of hands levered them apart, and Amy pulled Kate out of the way to hug Alex and then kiss him even harder. He smiled down at her. Mission accomplished. Sunlight, and guess what? The world still seems to be here. He kept one arm around her and leaned into the console, hitting the comm button. Renovsky, get up here before the champagne gets warm. I heard that, came the response. Alex turned to Blake. Open a line, see if we can raise Commander Carmack on the USS Texas. He's an old buddy. Behind him, Casey and Rhino were doing a waltz in the small space. Casey put a hand up into the big hawk's face and pushed when he tried to kiss her. When you two lovebirds are finished, perhaps someone could pop the lid. Aye, aye, Skipper. Casey saluted and ran down the steel corridor. Let's go up. I'm dying to breathe in cold, clean air. Amy grabbed Alex's hand. And see some sunshine. She led him away. Casey climbed the railing ladder and spun the wheel, pushing the lid up. Fresh, freezing air burst inside, and nothing felt or smelled sweeter. Alex helped Amy up behind Casey. Alex and the small crew were now all jammed on the conning tower. They turned their faces to the sun, luxuriating in the fresh air. Smells like heaven. Rhino opened his huge arms wide, turning his face to the sky. Smells like someone needs a bath, Casey said. Rhino looked mock hurt, but Casey waved him away. Forget it, you smelled like that when we went down. She squinted in the glare after so many days in near twilight. Holy shit, we got half the world's navy down here. And I'm betting they're not all here on holiday. Looks like things escalated after all. We need to fix that. Get the USS Texas on the... Alex paused and turned. Belay that last order. Shen Zhong, you need to speak to your people first, pronto. Shen Zhong took the comm device. 5,727 kilohertz, please. Blake adjusted the signal frequency and then nodded to the Chinese engineer. Shen Zhong spoke rapidly in Chinese, listened for a moment, grunted an acknowledgement, and then waited. He lifted the receiver from his ear. They are routing me through to the commander of the fleet, Admiral Zhang Do. Alex watched and waited. He saw the man suddenly snap to attention as a deeper voice came on the line. Once again, Shen Zhong spoke fast, but this time deferentially. There was a smile on his face, but the more the Chinese scientist listened, it rapidly changed to one of concern and then of frustration. Shen Zhong looked to Sung and slowly shook his head. He licked his lips and his focus turned inwards as he spoke softly once again. Alex could see now that he wasn't being allowed to finish his sentences. In the end, he lowered his head and handed the earphone back to Blake. He turned to Alex. The Admiral refused to countenance that an entire squad of PLA soldiers were wiped out by anything other than you. He thinks that the concept of there being a world beneath the dark ice is fanciful and the product of dehydration or my delusion. He smiled sadly. Also, my suggestion of a creature being responsible for Yang's death was seen as more brainwashing. His smile fell away. He called me an American spy. Sung sighed. We cannot go home. I'm sorry. Alex took the calm from Shen Jung. My turn after all. Alex changed frequencies and called the USS Texas. Codename Arcadian. Urgent communication for Commander Eric Carmack aboard the USS Texas. Alex didn't have to wait long before a booming voice blared out from his earphone. Thank the Lord and are we ever glad to hear you. Alan Henson sounded like he had a grin from ear to ear. 
Here's the commander. The line is secure. Go ahead, Arcadian. Hallelujah, son, Carmack almost shouted. You just saved me having to deploy a lot of expensive armaments, and I and the U.S. Navy thank you for that. He laughed heartily and then breathed a sigh of relief. Please tell me you have control of the Sea Shadow. That we do, sir. We're all looking forward to a hot meal and then going home. Alex turned and nodded to Amy. You can tell us all about your adventure when you bring that submarine alongside. As you can see, things are still a little tense here. Carmack lowered his voice. Best we take our toys and head home before someone does something they regret. Works for me, sir. Alex could feel warm sun on his neck, and for the first time in days felt at ease. He turned to grin at Rhino and Casey. Just as a blaring alarm screamed out from Carmack's line that jolted him upright. Amy grabbed at his arm. What the hell is going on? Commander, Alex began. Sonar warning. Were you the only guys down there? Carmack asked quickly. Yes. Alex overheard Alan Henson talking rapidly to his sonar and communications officers before relaying information. Another reading, sir. This one coming up from the deep, fast and big, really big. Attack sub? Carmack asked. Henson listened some more. Too big for that. Non-metallic signature and silent as a ghost. It's weird. Going to come up at the sea shadow in a few minutes. Collision course. Jesus Christ, Hunter. What in God's name did you just drag with you? We got something coming up underneath us and traveling at about 80 knots. Signature is all wrong. Non-metallic and silent as death. Looks like it's coming from where you just came from. What the hell is it? Alex shook his head, confused, but then tilted his head back and closed his eyes. That, sir, is the Kraken rising and our worst nightmare. It'll sink us if it gets to us. Alex heard shouted orders before Carmack came back. Not on my watch, son. Get below decks. We'll take it from here. General Banguo rose to his feet, listening carefully as Admiral Zhang Do gave his urgent report. General, deep sonar contact. Single heavy mass signature rising from over 300 fathoms. Breach zone is estimated to be directly below the fleet, sir. Unknown object has accelerated to 80 knots. Banguo's eyebrows rose. 80 knots? Seems the game of bluff has ended. A new stealth submarine, perhaps, Admiral. Or the Americans have initiated their first strike protocol, Admiral Zhang responded quickly. Banguo heard the frantic orders being yelled aboard the Admiral's ship. Battle stations, tracking target, ready all batteries. It was the familiar language of war. His free hand curled into a fist. The Americans are foolish to think the Chinese Navy would be caught off guard so easily. Banguo decided. First they would destroy the submarine coming up at them, and then they would engage. Authorization to launch, Admiral. Fire at will. Jue Zhan Jing Wai! the Admiral roared. Banguo grunted. It was an armed forces battle cry and meant decisive battle. He gripped the phone so tight his knuckles went white. He closed his eyes, and in his mind he saw the bubble trails as the heavy U-4 homing torpedoes were launched and would already be speeding down to meet their doomed target. Perhaps Minister Wan Lin was right, he thought. It was inevitable. The age of the dragon was here, whether he liked it or not. Commander Carmack stared hard through the dielectric, reflective-coated binoculars. Before him, the iron-gray ocean was being whipped by a freezing wind, sending horsetails of stinging spray along its surface. There was one oasis of calm, and that lay at the center of the flotilla. The few square miles of ocean were ringed by two of the most powerful naval fleets in the world, and nothing else mattered but that large circle of freezing water with the small, sleek submarine at its center. 
Carmack and every other captain and commander on the water and back at their home bases watched the sea shadow. Everyone else watched consoles, stood by weaponry, or waited impatiently for orders to either fight or stand down. Until then, it was up to someone else to make a first move. Fingers were on hundreds of multi-ballistic triggers. The closest vessel was a Chinese Chiang Kai-1 Type 054 Manshan-class destroyer. It was a big warship at 450 feet and displacing 4,300 tons. The floating Death Dealer was armed with an octuple rocket launcher, anti-ship missiles, AK-630 CIWS turrets, ASW torpedoes, and a variety of mines. Carmack's communication officers had detected the launch of several of these moments before, undoubtedly convinced there was an attack coming from below. They were only partially right. The explosions that occurred deep below the Manshan-class destroyer were too deep to register on the surface, and Carmack and Henson were just lowering their glasses when there came a flurry of activity on board the ship. Whooping alarms rolled across the water, and more mines were flung over the sides, these rigged for shallow detonation, and their plumes of spray showered the deck. Men started running wildly about, and there came the pop of automatic rifle fire as the sailors leaned over the rails to shoot down into the water. There was something there only they could see, but as yet Carmack and his fleet could not. What the hell is going on? Henson said, frowning and moving between using his field glasses and trusting his own eyes. I think we now have a new player, Carmack said slowly. A mottled green and black tree grew from the water beside the destroyer, higher and higher, lifting above the ship's bridge to then topple across the metal superstructure, bending the steel like it was made of matchsticks and paper. More of the giant things rose up, and then the cold mountain began to follow its limbs. Oh, my God! Henson backed up a step. The kraken was revealed in all its monstrous glory, clinging to the side of the battleship, tilting it as its bulk came out of the water. It bloomed open, a gigantic flower whose petals coiled and thrashed. What the fuck is that thing? Henson whispered. Carmack lowered his glasses, his face drained of color. The thing that all sailors dread, the sinker of ships, the monster from the abyss, the kraken. The thing rose once more and then seemed to swell, flowing like liquid up and over the Manshan superstructure. Tentacles wrapped the ship from stern to bow, their tips thin as a wrist, but where they joined the bulbous body, they were as thick as redwood trees. From across the water, Carmack heard the sound of metal complaining, and the 450-foot ship tilted even more, its nearest deck now close to the icy ocean's waterline. The muscular strength of the tentacles radiated inevitability, and the coils started to compress. Order, sir, Henson waited. Carmack exhaled. Hold fire. We can't do anything. We might hit the destroyer. Shenyang J-15 fighter craft swarmed and fired GSH-30-1 cannons and armor-piercing rockets. Mottled flesh was blasted away, but they were pinpricks to the monster. An acrid smell wafted across the expanse of iron-gray water, and Carmack watched as men were encircled in tentacles and then crushed like flies. The Kraken seemed to be acting in a furious desire to do nothing but kill the ship and everything on it. Admiral Zhang Do, aboard the aircraft carrier Liaoning, maneuvered the huge ship closer. It was the only thing larger than the monster, but with hundreds of tons of slimy flesh almost fully engulfing his destroyer, he obviously hesitated to fire, knowing a missile passing through the rubbery hide would strike the vessel. Fire at it, God damn you! just fucking fire, Carmack hissed. The hesitation lasted another few seconds, and then there came the sound of an enormous cracking as the huge destroyer bent in the center. Both the bow and stern rose up sharply 
as the combined weight of the creature and its crushing tentacles had weakened the hull structure to a point of collapse. Only then was Zhang Do shocked into action. Hundreds of missiles, cannon rounds, and heavy machine gun fire lanced out at the huge creature. They were fiery harpoons, striking the flesh and embedding deep. Some blew car-sized chunks of flesh into the air, and dark blood stained the sea around the stricken destroyer. Send it back to hell, Carmack whispered. He half turned to Henson. Back the fleet up. The creature slid back to the sea, but it didn't relinquish its grip as it dragged the broken ship down with it, ensuring its kill was complete. On the surface, there was a spinning whirlpool of debris and dead bodies where the monster had once been. Dead, Henson said. Dead? They hit it, sure. Did they kill it? I have no idea. Carmack stepped back. He nodded towards the Chinese boats, trying to pull surviving sailors from the water. See if they want any help, he sighed, but I doubt they'd take it even if they needed it. Well, Henson said, I'm betting that episode might go a long way to adding some credibility to our story. But a terrible price for finding out the truth. Carmack turned away. Bring the sea shadow in close and get Hunter and his crew on board. Time to go home. Chapter 65 Show him in, Margie. Colonel Jack Hammerson got to his feet and came around from behind his desk. Alex Hunter pushed open the door, grinned, and held his arms wide. The world still stands. Hammerson smiled and held out his hand. Only just, and no small thanks to you. They shook hands, and Hammerson led Alex to a couple of leather armchairs, with coffee waiting. He'd read the flash report Alex had put together. He and his team had been through hell. That they managed to succeed in their mission, let alone survive for more than an hour down under the ice— was a miracle and a testament to their skill and fortitude. He patted his soldier on the shoulder. Great work, great work. General Chilton read your report and wants to meet you personally. Alex raised his eyebrows. And the president? I'm sure he would as well if he knew about you. Hammerson poured Alex a coffee. Plausible deniability, you know how it works. Alex shrugged. I wouldn't know what to say anyway. He eased down into the chair, and Hammerson saw that he let his body relax. We got the sea shadow back, so now what happens? Hammerson bobbed his head as he poured himself a coffee. We scrap it. The design was superseded years back. It's just that the vessel is decades more advanced than anything anyone else has, so if they want top tech they can damn well work for it themselves. Alex snorted softly. Of course. He turned to Hammerson. The Chinese were really going to go to the mat on this one. The PLA Special Forces went there to fight for it and kill for it. There was never going to be a negotiated outcome. Had to try. Hammerson put his mug down. At least now they know why that area of the Antarctic is off-limits. He smiled and raised his eyebrows. Sometimes trust has to be proven. Alex didn't return the smile. That PLA captain, Wu Yang, it was him that tried to abduct Joshua. Did you know? Hammerson steeled himself. We suspected it was Chinese operatives, didn't know Yang was involved. You have my word on that. But Jack, they knew about Joshua. Knew that he was different. That's why they wanted him. He turned his laser-like eyes on Hammerson. The mirth of just moments ago was gone. Alex sat forward. They have their own advanced soldier program. Their soldier Mungoy was a giant. But he was flawed. That's why they wanted Joshua to perfect their program. 
He sprang to his feet and crossed to the large windows overlooking the grounds. The Arcadian program's secret is out, and so is his. He laughed softly. The Israelis, the Chinese, the Russians. It's not a matter of who knows now, but who doesn't know. He continued to stare down at the grounds. Hammerson rose to his feet and joined him at the window. He could see what had Alex's attention. Below, Amy Weir and Joshua chased each other on grass so green it looked like stadium turf. Without me, he is vulnerable. Alex sighed and watched his son run faster and faster, leaving Amy long behind. He turned to Hammerson. Only I can protect him. Jack Hammerson watched Alex for a moment. Have you spoken to him yet? No. I wanted to give Amy some time alone with him first. But soon. He smiled as he watched the pair. For the first time in years, I feel nervous. Hammerson sipped his coffee. I can't order you to do anything here. I can advise, but that's all. And I want you to know that any advice I give is from a friend, not as your superior officer. Alex turned to scrutinize him for a moment, and Hammerson felt the gaze reach deeply inside him and knew Alex was reading him. He nodded and turned away. Hammerson sipped and then lowered his mug. And for what it's worth, my initial advice would be to keep his abilities secret. Not everyone knows about him. Sure, they may know of him, but not who he really is. He placed an arm on Alex's shoulder. This is a big decision. You need to take some time out, spend it with them, see what happens. Hammerson crossed back to his desk. I won't lie to you. I hope you decide to stay with us. I'm selfish like that. He watched as Alex stared down onto the field, a smile still on his brutally handsome features. See if family life suits you for a while. Hammerson continued to watch him. Just one thing. You said they're vulnerable without you. Remember, they will be getting more than just Alex Hunter. Alex turned, his face stony. The other one. Hammerson nodded. Alex continued to stare at Hammerson, his eyes unblinking. I can control him. It. Can you really? Hammerson returned the gaze for a moment longer. Only you can really know the answer to that. But my view, I think these missions let some pressure out. A good thing for everyone. Alex turned back to the window. I can control it, he repeated. Alex came around the corner of the building and paused, watching Amy and Joshua. They played for a moment longer, but then his son stopped running and turned to face him. Alex could feel the force of the boy's gaze. Joshua studied him, his face relaxed, but the familiar eyes penetrated him to the core. The boy held up a hand and waved. Amy turned then and, seeing Alex, stiffened. Alex felt a sudden jolt of disillusionment as she stepped forward to pull Joshua in close to herself. There came a soft voice into Alex's head. This is your reward. She doesn't trust you. Not me. You, Alex thought. A soft laugh. You are me, and I am you. Joshua lifted Amy's hand from him and continued his scrutiny. Alex tried to relax and waved. He smiled and first went to Amy. Ah, uh, I saw you two playing and I wanted to say hello. It's good to see you, Amy said. It's... it's about time, Joshua cut in, reaching up to take his hand. You were always there, but not there, and now you're finally here. He cocked his head. I know who you are. You're my father, not Peter. Alex went down on one knee, and Amy stood behind Joshua, 
resting her hands lightly on his shoulders. Yes, Joshua, I'm your father. I've been away, but I've been wanting to see you for many years. He held out his hand. I'm back now. Joshua took it and smiled. Good. You'll hurt him. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but you will. The voice didn't carry its usual sneering tone, but instead was simply matter of fact. Joshua gripped Alex's hand a little harder, a frown creasing his small brow. I don't believe that, he said. Huh? Alex froze. Don't believe what, Joshua? I don't believe you'll hurt me. Joshua lifted his head, confident. What? Amy leaned forward. No, I would never, Alex began. But the other one might. The boy tilted his head, eyes narrowed slightly. Amy frowned and knelt beside her son. You okay, honey? Joshua looked briefly at her and nodded. Alex felt a stab of pain deep in his head. And you'll hurt her, too. You have before, and next time you'll kill her. Alex's jaws worked as his teeth ground into his cheeks. He tried to push the disturbing thoughts away. Suddenly he felt another pain, this one from his hand. He looked down to see Joshua's hand on his, the fingers now closing hard, harder than was possible for a normal five-year-old. Don't worry, you won't hurt me or Mommy. He smiled. I'll make sure. He leaned in close to Alex's ear. I can help. Alex felt the pain in the center of his head relax, and after another moment, it felt like a door was slamming shut in his mind, the tormenting presence locked behind it and silenced. Alex exhaled. Yes, I think we'll be fine, Joshua. Let's see how things go. As a family, Joshua held Alex's eyes. Yes, as a family. Alex smiled. Hey, can I call you Josh? The boy's face lit up. Yes, I like that. You can call me Josh. Josh Hunter. He let go of Alex's hand. And one more thing. I want a dog. A big one. Epilogue. The massive creature sunk to the sea shelf, tried to hang on, but the damage to its body was too great. It gave up and let itself slide off the edge of the underwater cliff and sink into the cold, dark pressure of the abyss. It took an hour for it to hit bottom and spread over the rocky surface of the abyssal plain like a gigantic mottled carpet. Beside it, the broken ship floated down to lay like the broken skeleton of some long-dead beast. Many miles away from the Kraken's graveyard, in a cavern hidden away beneath the dark ice and rocky shell of an underground world, several bulbous six-foot eggs bounced along warm shallows of the shoreline. Their coiled contents wriggled, shook, and the rubbery shells burst open in an explosion of writhing, tentacled horror. The creatures immediately changed color and blended to their environment. Their large disc eyes with slitted pupils examined their new world, and they tasted the warm water, which was thick with the signals of life, movement, and food. They propelled themselves into deeper water, already hungry. Author's Notes Many readers ask me about the underlying details in my novels. Is the science real or fiction? Where do the situations, equipment, characters, or their expertise come from? And just how much of any legend has a basis in fact? 
As in my previous novels, there is always the germ of a story or legend or something. And in the case of the Kraken, there are numerous seafaring tales dating back many centuries. The Kraken is a legendary sea creature that was first said to dwell off the coasts of Norway and Greenland. The legend dates back as far as the late 13th century. An old Icelandic saga, Urvar Odur, tells of a journey to Heluland, Baffin Island, where a sailor sees the massive sea beast called Hafgufa. This is believed to be the first ever reference to the Kraken. It wasn't until 1735 that the Swedish botanist Carolus Linnaeus first classified the Kraken as a cephalopod in the first edition of his Systema Naturae, a taxonomic classification of all living things. From then on, its sightings continue to this day. Was it, is it, real? Perhaps. After all, the deepest trenches in the ocean are thousands of miles long and seven crushing miles deep. Sunless, pitiless voids where impossible pressures make it an unexplored and alien place. Who knows what treasures and horrors they really contain? Was the Kraken real? Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the Kraken sleepeth. Alfred Lord Tennyson, The Kraken Wherever there is deep or dark, the unknown and unexplored, then also come the legends. Tales of a monstrous, many-armed sea creature exists from ancient times. Like the Greek legend of the Scylla, a monster with six long necks, each with its own frightening head and a body with twelve tentacle-like legs. And later, in 1555, Oleos Magnus wrote of a giant sea creature that was like a mighty tree up by the roots. The term kraken appeared in 1735 in the Systema Naturae, where stories about this monster dated back to 12th century Norway. These tales often refer to a creature so big that it is mistaken for an island. Even as late as 1752, when the Bishop of Bergen, Erik Ludvigsen Pontopidan, wrote his The Natural History of Norway, he described the kraken as incontestably the largest sea monster in the world with a width of one and a half miles. Disappearing islands, fanciful, well, as recently as 2012, scientists found that an island, Sandy Island, that had been on ocean charts and even shown on Google Earth since the year 2000, wasn't there anymore. In fact, navigation charts showed a water depth of over 4,000 feet, nothing there but deep black ocean depths. Was it something from the fathomless void simply basking on the surface temporarily? The myth of the Kraken has been colored by reality over the years, like in 1896, when the rotting carcass of a great-sized creature beached itself on the coast of St. Augustine, Florida. It was first seen by Mr. Herbert Coles and Dunham Corridor on a bicycle trip. When the young men saw the carcass, it had sunk into the sand because of its immense weight. The next day, Dr. DeWitt Webb founder of the St. Augustine Historical Society and Institute of Science, arrived on the scene. The creature's skin was of an extremely light pink color with a silvery tint to it. They concluded it weighed roughly five tons, and the visible portions were 23 feet in length, four feet high, and 18 feet across the widest part of the back. Webb decided that it was not a whale, but instead some kind of cephalopod. Myth and reality collide again and again. For example, in Japan, there is a legend of an enormous sea creature called the Akoro Kamui. Its home is Volcano Bay, which is located in the southwestern island of Hokkaido. The Akoro Kamui is said to be a giant squid-like creature, 300 feet long, a brilliant red color with giant staring eyes and a noxious odor. 
It was greatly feared by the local fishermen, as it was said to swamp boats, taking any fallen fisherman down to the depths, never to be seen again. Just recently, for the first time, a giant squid was photographed live in the Sea of Japan. Brought to the surface, the smallish creature, around 20 feet, gave off a smell of ammonia, a substance in great quantity in their flesh that allows them to manage the huge pressure of the depths and also attain negative buoyancy required to float and hunt in midwater. An ancient Japanese legend tells of a creature with massive trunk-like tentacles, noxious smell, giant eyes, and striking red color. And then, one brought to the surface exactly like that, described all those centuries ago. How could the legend have been so accurate when this describes the giant squid, Architeuthis, so clearly? We know that these giants live down there. Perhaps they aren't miles long and can't be mistaken for islands that can be mapped, but did they once exist? Well, the kraken is said to be the monstrous cousin to this giant Architeuthis squid. And though scientists have come across many strange things in the world's seas, they have yet to find trace of the legendary kraken. Or maybe until now. In a presentation made at a meeting of the Geological Society of America in Minneapolis, Mark McMenamin, a study researcher and paleontologist at Mount Holyoke College, presented evidence for the Kraken. His theory derived from some deep scoring found on the bones and remains of nine 45-foot ichthyosaurs from the Triassic period, 248 million to 206 million years ago. Perhaps the fingerprints of the legendary Kraken? How these particular huge ichthyosaurs died has long been a mystery. In the 1950s, Charles Lewis Camp hypothesized that the ichthyosaurs had fallen victim to a toxic plankton bloom or became stranded in shallow water. But recent work on the rocks surrounding the fossils seemed to suggest that many of the creatures died in deep water, very deep water. Obsessed with solving the puzzle of how these beasts were killed, McMenamin looked hard at the fossil evidence. By arranging the vertebrae of some ichthyosaur remains, he noticed something odd in the patterning. Something that resembled the gigantic sucker marks like those from a giant cephalopod's tentacle. According to McMenamin, this kraken would have been nearly a hundred feet long and most likely caught the ichthyosaurs and dragged their massive corpses back to its underwater lair. Comparing this hypothesized behavior to that of the modern octopus, McMenamin said, It is known that the modern octopus will pile the remains of its prey in a midden and play with and manipulate those pieces. So the kraken may have been monstrously large prehistoric cephalopods that fed on some of the Triassic Ocean's largest predators, and stored their bodies in a larder for later consumption. We know more every day. We already know that the giant squid can grow to enormous sizes, making it one of the largest animals on the planet, that they are intelligent and fantastically strong. But what we don't really know is just how big they can get, or how long they can live, or how often and why they come to the surface. Taken from my blog post in Thriller Central, Fingerprints of the Kraken. The Southern Sea's Devil's Triangle Bass Strait is a channel connecting the Tasman Sea on the east with the Indian Ocean on the west and separating Tasmania on the south from the Australian mainland on the north. The first recorded disappearances in the area go back to 1797, when the ship Sydney Cove was wrecked. One of the vessels engaged in the salvage operations, Eliza, mysteriously vanished on her way back to Sydney. From 1838 to 1840, seven vessels were lost in the area, but only wreckage from three has ever been found. The remaining four remain a mystery to this day. Over the following century, dozens of other ships have mysteriously vanished 
after entering the Southern Sea's triangle, never to be seen again. In 1858, a British warship, Sappho, vanished into thin air, along with over a hundred crew. The Sappho had been seen by the crew of the schooner Yarrow off Cape Bridgewater, Victoria, at the western entrance to Bass Strait on 18 February. But she never reached her destination of Sydney. Numerous ships took part in a search, but all failed to find any trace of the missing ship. With the introduction of aircraft in the beginning of the 20th century, the Southern Sea's triangle continued to make headlines with mysterious vanishings. The first aircraft to vanish was a military Airco DH-9A. It was being used to search for a missing ship, the Amelia J, in 1920. No trace of the plane has ever been found. Ocean Submarine Mysteries USS Scorpion, SSN-589, was a skipjack-class nuclear submarine of the United States Navy and the sixth vessel of the U.S. Navy to carry that name. Scorpion was lost on 22 May 1968, with 99 crewmen dying in the incident. The USS Scorpion is one of two nuclear submarines the U.S. Navy has lost, along with the USS Thresher. It was one of four mysterious submarine disappearances in 1968, the others being the Israeli submarine INS Dakar, the French submarine Minerve, S-647, and the Soviet submarine K-129. Massive Antarctic Algae Bloom Seen from Space The bloom, estimated to be around 500 miles wide and 200 miles long, was captured by Australian scientists monitoring a satellite 1,850 miles above the Earth. Scientists from the Australian Antarctic Division say they are still not sure exactly what caused the bloom, but they predict it may affect the local wildlife. ABC News, March 5th, 2012. Belinda hopes you enjoyed the reading of Kraken Rising, written by Greg Beck and read by Sean Mangan. Our audiobooks are becoming increasingly popular among travelers, families, and people who are on the go. If you really enjoyed this audiobook, please introduce your friends and family to the experience. We're sure they'll love you for it. If you want to hear more about our fabulous range of titles, please visit us online at belinda.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to always take a Belinda audiobook with you. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.